were most instrumental in making sure we didn't think of any other place to go. As again, um, I've known them very closely. I, I think it's 94 when I first met them in the college chapel. And um, sir was speaking that day and I just heard him and went back. About 10 days later, uh, he was walking down the steps in Carmen Block. Sorry, I, w I was walking up, he was walking down and we met on the steps. I'm not sure what happened, but uh, you know, when a student walks by, you just ignore them. But he didn't. And we started a conversation on, the st on that landing in Carmen Block. And I'm still not sure what happened after that, but uh, I became a fixture at their home. You wanted something to eat, you went to their home. You wanted to talk, you went to their home. You had a classmate you were very worried about who might commit suicide. You took him, ho took him to their home hoping that, he would, that they would give words of wisdom which might change, their, change them. And um, remember those days were no mobile phones. You know, you didn't WhatsApp and say, can I come to your home and things like that. The men's hostel phone, phone in the evening was always busy. You just landed up at their home. And uh, thank you for all those, all those evenings in R.I. quarters, in Georgetown, and all those places which, uh, which I spent. Um, I mean, no, when you went home, no special attention. You were just, just part of the home. They went about their work. You went about their work. They went about their work. You talked to you. They say, okay, why didn't you teach my son a little bit of, uh, I don't know, math, or was it, I didn't, what, forget what it was. Uh, my dad just had an operation. Why, why didn't you spend some time with him, talking to him? Uh, so I mean, they were the you remember those were the days when all staff were getting operated, having heart operations elsewhere, and they chose to have have the operation here. And uh, I remember uh, coming back once uh, in the train with with ma'am and uh, either Gina or Ashish, I forget. Sleeper class, no. Pro I mean, we were in the same cabin. Again, a student. But again, uh, long hours talking with them. So thank you. Um, one last, one last memory. Um, so this may be about five or seven years. Of, I don't know when it was. So I've, I see a lot of missed calls on my phone. So once in the morning, once in the afternoon, once in the evening from ma'am. You know, after a long day of operating, you don't want to call the, call people back. So maybe I said, maybe I'll talk to them tomorrow. But no, 10 o'clock at home, you get a phone call. We sorry to disturb you, but I have a patient. And uh, and so, you know, we discuss a patient and say, okay, ma'am, I'll, um, I'll, I'll see the patient. And you expect, you know, when someone has been so persistent, must be some one of those highly connected people who come from a particular state. But no, <laughs> it is some poor North Indian patient, but ma'am has been chasing. I've been chasing me to make sure that I see the person and uh, and make sure that something good happens to that person. Uh, similarly, about I think it was two, the last phone call was about two weeks ago, and uh, I said, "Sure, ma'am, I can uh, I can see. Uh, I know if I I offered to see the same day, even though we're on different campuses." But ma'am said, "No." Then I said, "Okay, send on a Monday." But Monday, I know I'm in theatre, so I make sure I tell all my colleagues. Ma'am is going to send a person. This is what she thinks it is, but this is what I think it is. So <laughs> at least they know because if I make sure if I don't, that take it, patient is not taken care of, she'll come back to me again. So ma'am, thank you. It's been it's been a privilege. It has been an honor to know you, and all our three decades of association have been a have been heartwarming, have been uplifting for us, and I wish you all the best. Next, representing from the principal's office, we have Dr. Anila to say a few words of felicitation. On behalf of the principal, I welcome all of you and especially uh, a special uh, welcome to ma'am and sir and all the rest of the family who is here to attend the CME. And um, I think Ravish and I are lucky today <laughs> to be representatives of two different offices. It has, I don't know whether any other couple has managed this in CMC so far, <laughs> but I thank God for this opportunity. 
now i feel very humbled to stand here um, and um, i uh, especially want to thank dr rachel chandi for her contribution to cmc as a woman okay so as a woman when you look at it you've had different roles wife supporting sir mother then family so and then institution and then the rest of us also come along with the institution so i just want to thank you and today being founders day today is december 9th uh, this is ida scudder's birthday so um, ida scudder was around 30 years old when she started cmc okay and um, her vision was to serve the women and children of india that is why she started it but through all this i think uh, her focus her vision was actually on god okay because her song is be thou my vision o lord of my heart be thou my best thought by day or by night um every moment i think she depended on god and that's why she could uh, reach from one bed to 3844 beds today um even with you ma'am god has used you so much you're really lucky to have the cme on this day okay uh, founders day and uh, with the nice uh, topic of uh, you know lighting the way uh, it is just the start of a journey i think there's a lot more you will offer and lot more things we have to thank you for and um, we wish you all the best and i'm sure all our teachers in the audience uh, we are all very grateful to all of you for what you have done for this institution for what you have done for us and um, welcome again to cmc and uh, thank you for all what you have mean and i know you know what cmc stands for excellence cmc stands to serve in the spirit of to to be a witness to the healing ministry of christ okay that's what we are all here for with excellence in education service and research and i'm sure each one of you in this audience has strived to be that and that is why we have reached where we have reached today thank you so much ma'am for everything okay. thank you ma'am next we have a uh, representing from the nursing services sister dorothy to say a few words of felicitation uh good morning to all of you gathered here and uh, to ma'am and sir as well and it's my pleasant privilege uh, to be speaking a few words of felicitation uh, for ma'am um, i knew her um, from uh, 99 when i uh, joined og and um, since then uh, we worked together i i was working in g4 west so uh, i knew ma'am uh, like when she comes for rounds and uh, then it's it was not just to the patient but it was actually a personal touch to each one of the staff and uh, uh, like you know even on the way uh, today also like um, she is like she knows that like no I, when i cross i know like ma'am if she sees me she knows be my by my name like that so it was really uh, very touching uh, personally as well as for patient care i have seen her i used to admire her the way she used to speak in bengali we had lot of bengali patients and uh, uh, she used to be very fluent in speaking so sometimes i used to be wondering like no i i would like to speak like that but few words i learned um then but it's not as much as i could speak so uh, actually the the peer, people actually they felt that uh, you know they, they were uh, in in with her like um so they were very personal and very close to ma'am in whatever care she gave and uh, uh, even in nursing care she had lot of uh, she played a lot of role even very minute details so uh, from that aspect also i still remember incidences where um, very little little things that she would uh, look at 
and make sure that uh, everything is done properly for the patient. And uh, that was very, she was very particular in the, those aspects. And um, on this day, I would like to wish ma'am uh, all the best for the future. And uh, I also pray that God will be with her and continue to bless her and uh, uh, in her family as well as in her personal and uh, other work she would continue to do with uh, all the best, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, we will be uh, starting our day with the morning sessions. Thank you so much for uh, felicitation. She's not brought in. Um, we would uh, like to uh, felicitate Dr. Rachel, we thank you for Okay. Thank you. We'll be starting the morning session. So the first session we have is patient advocacy. The chairpersons will be Dr. Swati Rathor and Dr. Rita Vijay Salvi, senior consultant of OG4 unit. Patient advocacy is one of the vital aspects of our healthcare system. And uh, it is actually a part of the meaning of our CMC motto also. So we'll be starting the session with the two Eminent people of OG department, we hand over the mic to you. Good morning, everyone. So we we'll, would like to move to the academic sessions of uh, today. Uh, so everyone want to be heard, whether at home or at hospital, uh, so we always want to be heard. Uh, so uh, here we have our uh, loving and favorite teacher, Dr. Uh, Lakshmi Sheshatri, to share about uh, the art of patient listening. So uh, we all know Dr. Lakshmi Sheshatri, uh, but a few of the PGs who have joined uh, recently, I just want to introduce ma'am. Uh, ma'am is a... <coughs> Uh, former HOD of uh, our uh, CMC Valor, and after retirement she has worked in Thirumalai Mission Hospital for some time and uh, ma'am has a credit of having uh, more than 50 publications in all the index journal and uh, the loud book is the essentials of obstetrics and gynecology which most of our undergraduate and postgraduate are using right now Thank you, ma'am, for uh, giving this privilege of uh, being introduced you in this big forum. Uh, I hand over the mic to ma'am for uh, the session on art of patient listening. Thank you, Rita. Good morning, everyone. I am really very happy and uh, privileged to be here um, for um, 
celebrating Rachel's work and life here in CMC. I have known her from the year 1985 when I think she had just gotten married to George and moved to Shanti Ilam and I returned from my study leave and we were neighbors there. Subsequently, of course, she joined the department of OGE, went through her uh, diploma and MD courses and then um, she joined OG Unit 2 and I think till retirement we worked together and we I think worked together as a great team. Thank you for the time. Subsequently, I should say that much later she um, moved on to do gynae oncology and then uh, joined the um, Department of Gynae Oncology. And uh, you've all heard about the um, great work, the compassion that she she's al always no known for. And she's always the last one to finish the uh, private patient uh, uh, clinic. And uh, she would be going on and on talking to the uh, patients, especially in Hindi and Bengali. And, um, uh, and the patients were extremely happy with her. Um, thank you, Rachel, for all your contribution. Wish you the very best in whatever you take on in the future. God bless you. The topic that I have been given is the I have been given is the uh, uh, art of patient listening. Now, when um, Anit, Dr. Anita called me and said, "Ma'am, will you speak about the art of patient listening?" My husband was hovering around there. I don't know what he was doing. And then he asked me, what is it about? So I told him, I've been asked to talk about the art of patient listening. And he was in splits. <laughs> you can imagine. He said, you? You're going to talk about, the, about patient listening? I would like that. So I told him, just talk to my patients and they will tell you how good I am at listening. Well, I'm not very sure any of my patients will vouch for that, but I just had to say something in my defense. So here I am talking about patient listening to a whole lot of retired people who've been listening, like Sunil said, all their lives and a few youngsters. So let me see what I can come up with. So the question is, is it patient listening or listening to patients? Or is it listening to patients with patients? All semantics. Whatever it is, I will be talking about this and not about this. Because this is the listening that the present generation and some of our generation is all very happy uh, to do this kind of listening. So that brings us to the basic question. Is hearing the same as listening? Because we've heard many people at the end of the lecture tell you, thank you very much for your uh, patient hearing. And I always wonder, I mean, uh, what does that mean? Everybody here. So you need to hear to listen. But you do not always listen uh, when you hear. And this is most often seen during conversation with the spouse, especially the husband. Now, you could be telling him all about, I mean, uh, the wedding that you attended two days ago, your friend's daughter, the sari that the bride was wearing, the jewelry, the food, the bridegroom, and a whole lot of things. And then you look, turn and look at him for the response, and then he will tell you, yeah, your friend's daughter is getting married next Wednesday. I mean, that is hearing and not listening. So you hear with your ears, and you listen with your mind. Here is, hearing is passive and listening is active. Hearing is involuntary process where noise is picked up by the ear. I'm sure many of you are hearing me now. But listening is voluntary where a conscious effort to understand the sound is necessary. It's something that you feel when you experience it, internalize it, and you're a part of it. It's an art requiring practice, skill, spirit, and inspiration. But remember, the art of listening is not easily mastered. During our lifetime, we need to listen to a lot of people. We start by listening to our parents, our friends, our relatives, our teachers, as once you enter school, our peers, when you start working, spouse sometimes. Um, of course, when you reach my age, 
you have to basically listen to your children and grandchildren who may turn around and tell you, Party, you don't know this, I will teach you. So, but as healthcare workers, caregivers, I think we have the unique opportunity and need to listen to patients. And I think this is something that only we understand and we keep doing all. So listening is a process wherein you receive the sound waves, you understand it by processing it in the brain, and you also evaluate it. So what are the types of listening? There is a passive listening where you say, well, I kept on talking, and he only listened with one ear. You say, I kept saying this to my son, and he just fell on deaf ears. Or you talk to your registrars, and it goes in through one ear and out through the other. So it is the same as hearing. Whereas, as opposed to this, there is active listening, where you listen to the words, the body language, uh, with full attention. I'll speak more about this later. There is also something called a critical listening, where you focus on the main points, look for flawed logic, missing information, think about what you hear and how it relates to other information, ask questions that will help clarify the speaker's thoughts. And this is listening to a presentation, for instance, by a registrar or a paper reading by an intern in your office. There is informational listening wherein you got to be patient and let the speaker finish before asking questions. Make sure your questions are relevant to the topic. Take notes if it helps and paraphrase the key points. And this is like listening to a lecture to acquire new information and maybe data. There is appreciative listening where you establish a positive connection, be friendly and supportive, look at the issues from the other person's perspective, look for good in what the speaker is saying, even if there is none. Ask <coughs> the speaker questions that show you you are interested, reassure the others if they express negative thoughts, etc. And this is like a, when a, a, one of your colleagues present a research paper. You want to appreciate, you want to give positive feedback, etc. There is empathetic listening wherein you listen and understand others' feelings, focus on their thoughts and emotion, and get insight into their problems. Listen carefully without interrupting. Reflect on what you have heard in your own words to make sure you understand correctly. And avoid giving advice or telling the other person what they should do till they finish. And let the other person know you understand how they feel and be non-judgmental, which is very crucial. So this is what you do when you listen to the experience of a loss of a loved one, uh, one or a traumatic experience that somebody is narrating to you, listening to a patient narrating suffering from an illness. Now coming to active listening. In the world of healthcare, active listening is more than essential. It's crucial, it's critical. Active listening requires the listener to make a conscious decision and a commitment to be fully present Pay close attention to what is being said, the body language, facial expressions, and tone. Listen carefully to the words being used and try not to interrupt. Paraphrase what the other person has said. Respond with the questions or comments which will help you understand better and give the speaker full attention. And this is the where you what you do when you listen to your patient's history of illness. So active listening is hearing the content. Okay, hearing the content, you need to certainly know what the person is saying. Listening for feeling, observing body language, it's more important. You need to know, just hearing them doesn't really help. You need to look at their emotion, what are their facial expression, how are they sitting, are they upset, are they, are they angry, whatever. 
and you need to paraphrase the patients are in distress they're not going to tell you in the in the order in which you want i mean you have might have been told that presbyopia presenting illness must be starting with the, you know the one the problem that uh, was started way back has to be first and then the next one etc but they're not going to tell you in order and subsequently you will have to put it together oh, you started abdominal pain and six months later you started heavy bleeding and then you found that you also have this problem and you put it together summarize it and sometimes it helps you and the patient actually put things in proper perspective you need to question if you do not understand and you need to summarize and all this put together is what is active listening so now that brings us to the question what is patient listening it is obviously all types of this listening rolled into one it must be empathetic active to some extent critical and appreciative now when i say appreciative i'm not saying that when the patient says i have lot of pain you don't say very good very good i mean that is not the kind of appreciation i am talking about but obviously you appreciate what they feel and you express it in so many words it's the patient listening that sets the doctor or the healthcare worker apart so now the patient listening certainly eases fear and anxiety we need to understand that as doctors we do feel that we are a superior breed and it is all most of the time conveyed to the patient and the patient has scared of us even whether it is kupama muniyamma or whether it is an educated patient they are scared of us they are also scared about what they are going to hear when they meet you there's a lot of anxiety and fear and you have to allay those you have to earn their trust and confidence this patient listening reduces the incidence of misunderstandings in the sense that uh, you know you, unless you re really listen to it patiently you act, so you might miss out some of the stuff and you might miss out on what treatment has been given earlier etc it enables better health care and provides for improved clinical outcomes most importantly this is what the patient is looking for i need to give you uh, an experience that i had um, as a retired um, first professor from cmc i went to another senior professor in cmc for a problem that i had which was really bothering me obviously i'm not going to run to somebody for a minor issue and this person listened to me and said oh when did the pain start etc okay has it always been there and then he said okay do this and then the whole time this person was talking to my husband about his work the research paper that he or she wanted to publish how to go about it etc and here i was 65 year old retired professor doing this like a moron when the person <laughs> was actually talking to my husband about his uh, his sorry uh, uh, research project i mean you can you imagine how upset unhappy and angry i was at the end of it i mean subsequently i mean i had a procedure done and uh, uh, i became all right is a, i mean is a different matter altogether but having come as a patient and been at the receiving end of this um uh, not getting this patient listening i actually realized what some of our patients must be feeling and this is a, one of the reasons for doctor shopping please remember and this is why they go from one doctor to another the que the next question is why should we listen health and illnesses are related to life outside of the hospital P people don't become ill after coming here and unless you actually know what is happening around in their life you are never going to understand what brings them to you now does she live alone bad marriage financial problems alcoholism i think all these i understood when i moved to this um, uh, peripheral hospital in ranipet alcoholism is is really rampant when you find that in and around ranipet it's a major problem and the patients will come to come to the gynec clinic and tell you they have abdominal pain they have back pain they have pain here they have dyspepsia all this and with no physical findings and you need to actually pay attention to their body language to realize that they this is a cry for help and then you will have to send the the other people outside and then ask them very gently i understand all this but then you please tell me what is your husband doing is there a problem is there alcoholism 
is there a problem there are a lot of children with learning disabilities various other issues and unless you get to the bottom of it you don't realize that they have come with depression or they have come with a husband with alcoholism and a lot of domestic violence and fortunately we actually had alcohol de addiction program as a major thrust area of work and we could help them and uh, then you realize it's so important and this person would have gone from pillar to post getting analgesics anti inflammatory uh, brufen doxycycline all for her with a diagnosis of chronic pelvic inflammatory disease when what she has is a, is a depressive illness patients are more than an illness they have their preferences and needs values and priorities and you need to pay attention they also have insights into their healthcare experience remember they are all not absolutely you know blank about it they know and uh, it is important to listen to them like somebody is going to speak now now what are the barriers to listening why don't we listen and i think the basic problem is lack of time and the necessity to multitask which everybody will agree if you are working in a place like cmc you have somebody in labor room with meconium stained amniotic fluid at 6 cm dilatation and here is somebody telling you about her heavy menstrual bleeding and you are thinking about your daughter having a maths examination and oh i have not taught her uh, least common multiple or whatever it is i need to go home and teach her this and then you are listening to the patient telling you there is also a lack of will there is a lack of training and therefore a lack of awareness because your books tell you about etiopathology your disease symptomatology and management there is no place in the curriculum to actually teach you how to listen to patient and we have a a way of categorizing all your patients as they walk in oh okay she has got diabetes kidney uh, she is going to complain of this this and this and you you kind of got a list already which some they call it already always listening meaning you know it all and therefore you're not paying any attention to what she's saying and not able to come down to their level and understand their problem so a doctor's medical toolbox and supply of best practice guidelines ample as they are do not address a patient's fears grief over diagnosis practical issues of access to care or reliability of their social support system so now how do we listen patiently i mean i will tell you listen with empathy attention open mindedness compassion reflection etc ask the right questions be non judgmental and be aware of their verbal and non verbal messages so how do we listen with empathy you have to put yourself in their shoes understand their social cultural financial situation pay attention do not get distracted switch off your mobile phones don't be you know every time it beeps you want to see what that whatsapp message maybe a stupid forward from some but you still want to see it and uh, and control your own thoughts and and be present be open minded remember opinions and beliefs vary she may think uh, that eating brinjal is what caused her abdomen i mean her fibroid or whatever it is but yes i mean you may know it is not true but be kind in in uh, correcting her listen with compassion and paraphrase all over whatever this as i said put it in order and be non judgmental because they have a right to their opinion do not criticize us ask the right questions awareness of verbal and non verbal message here i certainly have to narrate an experience that i had this is again uh, we used to have gynae camps i had an old um, party no somebody my age because i <laughs> i still refer to them as party because i like to think that i am what uh, aishwarya no not uh, the current day whoever you know but anyway this uh, this party came and sat there and then she said i have pain here or here somewhere and then i looked at her palm and i looked at her forearm and then she was sitting like this and then she was sitting like this and she was wriggling in her seat this is why don't you sit quietly i am examining you again she went on then i said why are you sitting like this what is your problem are you not able to sit illa ukara mudiyala then i said okay come and lie down let me have a look and she won't believe me she had a prolapse which was this size the size of an you know an unpeeled coconut 
and she was sitting on it literally and figuratively you know and uh, she did not know how to say talk about this to people she was going from doctor to doctor saying pain here and pain there and hoping that somebody will ask her if she had any other problem uh, but finally what she had was this huge prolapse with the uh, stone inside it that's a different matter altogether okay so what i'm trying to say is but looking at the body language just looking at the patient would have told you that she is not comfortable sitting initially i thought some abscess some you know some boil but i was not prepared for this at all so listening just the, the body language is extremely important so for patient listening we need to have the desire to improve and willingness to listen the biggest problem is that we do not listen to understand we listen to reply the minute she tells you that oh i have come with abnormal pain oh, i'll give you don't eat this i will give you this medication you go and take this uh, but you need to understand the problem a good physician treats the disease a great physician treats the patients uh, who has the disease so there are some ground rules eliminate distractions <clears throat> keep your gadgets away put the or mobile in mute do not look at the whatsapp messages or answer phone calls especially when the patient has come to you with a serious problem please switch it off and do not answer phone calls do not allow people to walk in and out of your room asking for doubt about nick's patient that they have seen very very issues do not look at your laptop or a desktop look look into their eyes not in a romantic way but make eye contact don't jump in with the solutions you are not rajnikanth or uh, sharu khan you don't have to attend to or kill all the villains immediately you can always take time listen to what they have to say and come up with a plan of action your facial expressions are important slow down and spend time speak less listen more and ask questions when required so to conclude patient listening is a skill that enhances personal relationships and is invaluable in the practice of medicine it's a crucial element in conflict resolution even among the peers i think as administrators heads of units heads of department i think it is it is required it's not only when you're talking to patients it helps to understand issues better it's an essential component of providing high quality health care and much more than a diagnosis or treatment and creates a supportive compassionate and positive health care experience so sir william osler said listen to your patient he is telling you the diagnosis but i would add listen patiently and he will tell you the diagnosis and management thank you for your patient and appreciative listening thank you ma'am it was a very nice session on patient listening uh, we have learnt about different aspect of patient listening so we hope that we take all this information into our clinical area we move on to the next uh, session it's my privilege to invite dr jennifer jeva she is going to talk about how to give patients voice not only to listen to voice also for the patients dr jennifer jeva she is a professor and head head of department of palliative medicine and she has multiple boards and she is a member of multiple boards out of this uh, academy of palliative medicine also and also she is associate editor of bmj supportive and palliative care stage is yours dr jennifer Thank you for this privilege 
to speak on a very important topic, uh, something that is very close to Dr. Rachel. And uh, I really echo many of the statements the previous people have spoken about you, ma'am, your patient care and the way you would go that extra, extra mile to get something done for them. Um, so, I will speak on how to give patients a voice and why patients need a voice to introduce maybe some of, uh, to some of you on the platinum rule, giving patients a voice throughout the illness trajectory and intensive caring. So let me start with uh, Mrs. Rama, who is in her late 70s with metastatic lung cancer and spinal cord compression leading to paraplegia. She's unable to hear, both her ears are deaf. She lives with a son and she's a widow. Does Mrs. Rama have a voice? How can we give Mrs. Rama a voice? She's a widow, elderly, living with her son. She already feels she's a burden, bed bound, has an incurable disease, unable to hear, and her world is limited to her bed and limited by her senses. We'll come back to Mrs. Rama at the end. How do we actually see our patients? Do we see them as someone coming to you with a need and a problem and suffering and you have to sort it out? Are you seeing them as clients, customers, recipients of the high-tech care that you have? Do you refer them to us to that, pay, that bed number four? or that endometrial cancer patient? Or do we see them as unique human beings? This is Mrs. Kupama, this is Mr. Kumar. Do you see them as active participants and partners in planning their care? Most importantly, do you see them as the most important person in the team to receive the care and be part of the planning and management? I'm sure the top bit on the rights of patients is displayed across CMC in your offices, in the, um, in the offices and in the OPD, listing to us the rights of patients. So what it says is we need to listen, we need to hear their concerns, fears, we need to empower them to make decisions, clarify doubts. They need to feel actively listened to and supported. So all this patient's right is actually to affirm to them the intrinsic worth they have, irrespective of their diagnosis, irrespective of the physical state they are in, or irrespective of their suffering, suffering we are here to affirm the intrinsic worth that is placed within them. Of course, it comes with a lot of benefits, and you would see why there is no reason to give patients a voice. It fosters good patient-doctor relationship, open communication and trust. Often we think patients go away satisfied, but I tell you, you give, good, you give patients a voice, you will have that satisfaction, and that will help you to carry on in your calling, in your job, in your career. Most, this will help us to come to the most accurate diagnosis, tailored patient treatment plans, better compliance, better satisfaction for patients and us, and it will cultivate a healthcare environment that values empathy and understanding. Looking at senior teachers here, meaning I am grateful, I have learned so much from many of you sitting here, and that is what we want to continue in the healthcare system where we work in. We want our juniors to imbibe that because ultimately all of us are going to be recipients of that at some point. Promotes holistic patient-centered care and reduces medical litigations. I'm sure this rule we would have heard, golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So in a situation like that, you would ask, ask, you would ask yourself, how would I want to be treated if I were that old, if or I were that dependent, that disabled, disfigured, marginalized, or disease-ridden? But we are going to move to a new standard where you're going to take yourself out as a reliable barometer of patients' needs, values, or goals and move to a different rule called the platinum rule. Do unto patients as they would want done unto themselves. Doing unto patients as they would want 
done unto themselves. And this would actually lead us to achieving a more optimal person-centered care. And for you to do this, you need to know your patients as persons. What would you want in this situation? It also applies in guiding substitute decision makers make decisions for patients. Sometimes patient is incapacitated and not able to make decisions. You don't ask them, what do you want me to do for her? Or what do you want me to do for him? You ask them, tell me what your dad would want us to do, not what you want us to do. And like uh, Dr. Lakshmi all, already alluded to, the, pay, the problems they come in with are so complex. We often are limited to seeing only the physical aspects of it. There are emotional, social, spiritual, informative needs. And what they express may be just the tip of the iceberg. That lady is saying pain here, pain there. But as you dig deeper, you would see, you would understand that you are, they are only telling you the tip of the iceberg. And knowing your patient is so crucial to giving them a voice, to giving them what they need. So explore, explore. Establish a care tenor that is informed by asking what we need to know about them as a person to care best for them. Sometimes we make treatment plans which, which are in tune with the standards, guidelines, but ultimately not relevant to this patient or the patient will not comply by it. So what are your needs and priorities? What do I need to know about you to help me treat you better? Is there anything you want me to know about yourself, your family? You know, you need to come for radiation for this many six weeks. Is that possible? Is that feasible? Who will come with you? Who is with you? Who is supporting you? And this kind of care should happen. Many of you are in oncology setting. Should continue through the treatment from diagnosis till end of life. Because if you look at these different trajectories, the physical, social, psychological, and spiritual, the needs are varied through the trajectory. And unless you explore, find, you will not be able to give what the patient needs. Patient autonomy is not a new word for most of us sitting here, but are we able to do that? Are we giving them the right to decide? Are you giving them adequate information, all that they want to know? You do not push in information. You always ask permission. Shall I talk to you about this? Shall I discuss with you or you want me to discuss with your spouse, your son? And in a way, they understand. Are you explaining risks and benefits, the needs, addressing their fears and concerns? Many of them run away for, from treatment because of unrealistic fears, which are never expressed, never addressed. So empower your patient to make autonomous decisions. You know, that is our responsibility. And for this, you need to tell them the truth. And I think that is where we face a lot of challenges in, our, in we ourselves not have being trained, also relatives coming in the way and colluding, saying don't tell. So collusion is something that implies any information being withheld or not shared, and this conflicts with patient autonomy and shared decision making. So this was a very innovative way of a patient relative telling me don't tell, discuss anything with the patient. He handed over me a file. He didn't make any non-verbals, and I had to read to say, understand that he didn't want me to tell anything about the disease to the patient. However, the information needs of cancer patients, let me tell, this is from an Indian study in North India that most of them want to know. 94% wanted to know what their illness was. 92% wanted to know about chance of cure and gender did not have an effect on information needs. Another study from TMH on cervical cancer patients Two-thirds did not know the diagnosis, and in 15%, even at the end of life, there was collusion. That means they never knew what was happening or what was happening to them. In CMC, in our own department, we figured out that 40% who came to us in their first visit, 18% didn't know even the diagnosis, and 40% was not aware of prognosis. So this is the ASCO statement on individualized care. I've just highlighted there is so much it emphasizes on information sharing, discussion for you to decide an individualized care for patient. So decision making often is paternalistic. You can say this is this, all this is there, so I recommend this treatment. Or sometimes it can be just giving information and patient decides without you 
um, guiding them into any management or any choice. What is best is something called shared decision making or participative decision making where information is given, recommendations are made, but also the values and preferences of the patient is kept in mind and a shared decision is made. This applies even till end of life, much more important when goals of care, what do they want? Do they want at this point to do certain things? Or where do they want to be cared for? Who do they want to stay with? So I just want to tell about one patient, again with a metastatic lung cancer. She never, she said, I've never come to the hospital. I don't want to come to hospital. I'm afraid to come to the hospital. I don't want treatment. Leave me alone. Keep me comfortable. So we did motivate her a lot to take something which is not too, uh, not with too many side effects, but she was very clear. She continued to be at home. We supported at home. What is written, you may not be able to see, but the son came back and wrote a thank you note in Tamil, meaning, but for y'all, I wouldn't have known how to take care of my mom and fulfill her desires. So keep looking out for the vulnerable, the elderly, poor, disabled, those who can't hear or speak or see for different reasons, maybe disease-related, treatment-related, illiterate or those who walk around with some kind of guilt or shame or attributing that is the reason why they are suffering so much do not discriminate do not give adjectives to your patients you know very easy to say that's a difficult patient this lady is very manipulative be non-judgmental there are ways we can learn from patients giving a voice by them telling us this went well this didn't go well patient reported outcome measures not just for symptoms and quality of life but also studying the effectiveness of care evaluate your care discharge interviews and feedbacks are a good way so this is what dame cicely saunders the founder of modern hospice moment had to say you matter because you are you you matter to the last moment of your life and we will do all we can not only to help you die peacefully but to live until you die so i want to introduce you to one last concept of intensive caring i'm sure we are all familiar with the word intensive care but in intensive caring is a way to give voice to the patient non-abandonment you are committed to journey along with the patient till the very end you say i will support you till the end you know this is uh, something again dame cicely has said suffering is only intolerable when nobody cares suffering is only intolerable when nobody cares Take keen interest in the patient as a person. Show unconditional positive reward. Regard, convey appreciation for who and what they are and all they have tried to be. Ma'am also talked about appreciative listening. So basically you acknowledge them. You have done this much in your life. You are going through so much. You are coping well. No, positively reinforce the person they are. When patients feel they don't matter, hopelessness is never far afield. Use a tone of care that is dignity affirming. That is called therapeutic presence. You can maintain dignity, you can preserve dignity, and you can restore dignity. Many of them lose dignity in the process of the disease progressing. So how can you restore that through compassionate, being compassionate and empathetic, respectful and non-judgmental, genuine and authentic, trustworthy, being fully present, valuing the intrinsic voice of the patient finally to end giving a voice to mrs rama so we encouraged communication earlier the only way she was communicating was actions get a slate get a note finally they even got an electronic writing pad so every time before rounds we would say don't wait for us to come in this note you write down all that through the day you write down whatever you feel like telling whatever you feel somebody else should know to your son to us we involved her in treatment decision. It took time. It was what would have happened in 10 minutes with the patient took 25 minutes, 30 minutes. But that time was spent to make her agree to admission. She received palliative radiotherapy. ENT was called to see what can be done for her hearing. She was very clear she wanted to go back home. So she's being continued to be cared at home. So the rounds was an extended rounds. We encouraged her to read books. It was fortunate for us that she celebrated the birthday while she was in the ward. Cake was cut, we gave a card. 
she couldn't hear us so she sang for us she read something from the bible she prayed for the team she said every day she prays for the team so we showed her and the family she as a person is important her desires and needs are important we value what she has been is and does we also requested that she continue to pray for us that added gave her meaning and purpose to do something more than what she was already doing and motivated and encouraged the family to ask find out her needs and do that because the time they had to care for her was short i would really encourage everybody to go and read this small um publication i wouldn't call this an article but something that came out on science and compassion but the greater of these is compassion so many of you may be familiar with 1 corinthians 13 but it is paraphrased and written in the place of love compassion and for a medical setting i'll j- just read the first bit because many obstetricians are here if i speak in the jargon of doctors and surgeons but have not compassion i'm like a beeping ops machine but uh, it just goes on it's quite an interesting and an inspiring read i put this up in our uh, department notice board so knowledge skill and compassion abide but these three but the greatest of these is compassion so just to end giving patients a voice being patients advocates is a responsibility of every healthcare professional patients are active partners in planning their care compassionate care is a crucial element intensive caring is a way to show our patients they matter because of what they are patients voice is instrumental in medical excellence to keep it compassionate and effective thank you thank you dr jeeva it was very lucid talk it was very nice uh, now i would like to invite dr george dr george jenji sir he is a director of and ceo of at believers believers college medical college hospital former director of cmc velo former head of department of gastroenterology and hepatology he is going to uh, he is he received a national award on dr b c roy national award for excellence in healthcare leadership in 2008 and he is going to talk about the power of patient's voice in healthcare system thank you swati and rita for this opportunity and to anita to vinotha the gynae oncology team thank you for organizing this for us and yesterday was fantastic today is going to be even better and i'm extremely grateful to all of you for making this happen <clears throat> when i prepared this talk i had not been for one of the um cancer survivors meeting so having been to one of those yesterday i realized a lot of things that i'm going to say they are things that you've already practiced and to so ab downwards anita you know to all of you i must say congratulations for showing us the way in fact if i want to tell somebody about the patient's voice in the healthcare system i'll send them to the next uh, survivors meeting because i don't know whether you realized as yesterday there was one session where you were asking them what more do you want and they said we don't want anything more because we have everything that we ask for for me over the years <clears throat> particularly after Rachel joined gynae oncology um there's always a half to one hour session every night now when i set aside time because i have to listen to every problem that uh, she faced including what vikram said and my job is to listen and uh, it is only after coming here yesterday that i realized the importance of it and the value of it so in fact uh, there was one trip that she made to kerala to see a patient of vikrams who was uh, had another week or two to live and we went all the way to trishu uh, to trishu to see her in amala hospital and looking back i i feel that these are valuable moments in one's life and i think this is what the children saw and heard <clears throat> we never told them to stay back so a lot of what uh, dr lakshmi said or jabba said are things that we practice but as time goes on i think we have to <clears throat> remind ourselves that this is why we are here and this is why we need to 
remind ourselves of this. To Lily and uh, I think Gigi is here. I need to tell you this. A few days ago, there was a patient <clears throat> who came home, uh, rather the mother of a patient, asking Rachel to please come and be there at the time of the delivery. And then I was checking with her, what is, what is happening? Why is it that you have to go? Apparently, the department, because of the excessive lycra and the possibility of a flo floating head, the department has told her to take out a, a room near the hospital so that she and the patient would be able to come in within uh, 10 minutes. That was the time given. And I thought that much thought had gone into this patient's, uh, this person's delivery. And I think that's what we are talking about. So what Lakshmi said, Dr. Lakshmi said, was reinforced by Jennifer Jabba. And I probably, what I say will, I hope, reinforce what they both have said. This is a story of a patient. Uh, I call him a buddhijivi. He's a 39-year-old man who... <clears throat> came to us where I'm working now, and he saw our best doctor. Our best doctor means he's never been less than first or second in Trivandrum, Calicut, and wherever he studied. He's very, very good with his hands. He's very good. But at the end of the conversation, this guy who has cholangitis told his brother in Pune to find out whether this chap from CMC Valor is there. He professes compassionate care, please find out if he's there, because he's the only one I want to meet. So with trepidation, I went and met him, and he asked me this. This is the compassionate care that you talk about. And I looked at the details, and I told him, he has given you everything right. In fact, you refused admission. You asked him too many questions, and he tried to give you the answers, and he gave you an antibiotic for your cholangitis. What more do you expect? I mean, I didn't say it in this tone, but he said... If you want me to be with him for the procedure, because you say that he's very good, as long as I'm anesthetized, I have no problem. But I don't want to be under him. I don't want to have one more conversation with him. That was the anger that he had with the way my colleague addressed, and he's very, very good at his work. Mrs. Shobana is a patient whom we looked after in Believers. Unfortunately, she had CA breast and then I, uh, I'm sorry, CA ovary, and I know that she landed up here, and I know she's a relative of mine, and I know that she's struggling now because we had not given her the right advice. We had not told her what needs to be done. <clears throat> and this is a picture of a lady who told me that I woke up 3 o'clock in the morning from uh, Rani and... She got to my OPD and she said, Doctor, I want you to know that when I woke up, I was very scared. I don't know what you're going to tell me, how you're going to tell me. And I don't, I don't know whether we as doctors realize this, that when patients come to the hospital, they are scared. Not only because of the diagnosis, they're even scared whether we'll be kind to them. <clears throat> so... Freddie wanted recognition, he wanted acknowledgement, he wanted curtsy. Shobna wanted to be aware, she remained unaware, and her need was unrecognized. She still struggles at the moment. And, sorry, and Leela was hesitant to face the world when she came out. But I must tell you that my experience was totally different. Two years ago, I had a fall because the children were playing with soap and water. I had a bad fall and I had a bad shoulder injury. But what I received from here was absolutely fantastic, both in terms of the preparation preparation for the surgery when uh, I was brought here by Sam Chitaranjan, seen by Tilak Jabaknyana, who explained everything to me. And I realized at that time that I'd never been into a theater as a patient. I've been there as administrator, which is totally different. But as a patient, you're suddenly sitting on the wheelchair, seeing a different level, and you're lying down and you're seeing the roof, which you've never seen before. Suddenly, the whole experience is so different. And I say this because, for me, it was a fantastic experience. Sergeant came home, and for an hour, he explained to me 
all that was going to happen, the surgery, everything together took seven hours. And when I went to sleep and when I woke up, it was exactly as they had told me. And I think this whole PAC system has taken away a lot from us, which was of great value to the patient, where the anesthesiologist would see the patient in the ward, in the room, talk to them, become their caring person. Now this with very operative care being uh, touted so much, I'm talking to our team, would they do this? Would they see the patient? Because what is happening now is the PAC doctor is different from the treating anesthetist. It's a totally different scenario. And the patient suddenly seen somebody new whom he or she has not seen before. I'm trying my best to tell our team, can you, with this whole focus on perioperative care, can you change this? In fact, our PAC system, the patient has to go round and round because it's on the second floor to the fourth floor to the third floor. By the time an 80-year-old man has a colonoscopy, he will wonder why he ever came there. But I just thank God for CMC and for the care that I received. <clears throat> So what to look at the power of the patient's voice in the healthcare system, the International Journal of Quality in Healthcare, Jan Mays et al. has written a lot about this, about how important it is. And I am happy to say that India is also looking into this. The Kahokon group has started looking at this in a big way. <clears throat> So the patient should define what is desirable, what is undesirable. Patient report, should report what is for the patient convenient, comfortable, timely, and accessible. What was the patient listened to? You heard about this in the last two talks. Was the patient informed? <clears throat> was the patient involved in the decision making? And was the patient treated with respect? Were the risks explained? the outcomes pursued, <clears throat> and then what uh, Jabba said a little while ago. These two things have become extremely important. In assessing the patient experiences, you're looking at the patient reported experience measures, P-R-E-M. What did the patient go through? This is what we need to ask the patient. And the patient reported outcome measures, P-R-O-M. How did you feel? What was your overall experience? And to ensure that the patient voice is heard, we should really, like you did yesterday, we should really, actually you did exactly this yesterday. That's why I was so touched and impressed. You asked them, what is it that you wanted? Is there something more that we can do? And I think most of us, wherever we are, should be doing this so that the patients can make an important contribution to setting standards in evaluation and making the decision. <clears throat> so this again, Jabba said, keeping the patient in the center, patient centricity, a patient-centered picture of his or her journey. So when you measure it from the patient's perspective, I was hoping the MS office people would be here because there's a, th thank you, Manju, because when you're talking about patients first, you are saying that the patient is the most important person in our whole work. Most of the time, unfortunately, because, as Dr. Lakshmi said, because of the various other things that come in, this becomes part. And now you have the computers as well. So do you look at making sure that you enter the data because that becomes very important? How much time do you look at the patient? So to capture the patient's view of what happened during the healthcare visit, and to look at the patient impact of the illness from the patient's perspective. And this used together to support patient-centered care. And then the patient reported outcome measures. So Manju, I would recommend that you have a conference just for this. Get your patients here. Yesterday, what they did is what you should do. Get a hundred patients and ask them what they would like. And Christensen, writing about PROM, says, it should be an iterative co-creation process involving patients, their relatives, and clinicians as equal partners. And you will see it's the patients that come first, then the relatives, and then the clinicians, 
all together deciding on the kind of care you want to give. Remember, it's not to include and involve. It is about co-development and co-design. And one of the things that I realized from our emergency department, we have a MEM program going on. So by the time I get to see the patient, it is always one hour later. Why? Because they have to have the training program for the first year and the second year and the consultant before I as a gastroenterologist get called. That is not what the patient wants. Patients want, patient wants me to see them as quickly as possible. How do you make that happen? So Manju, if you try and ask this question, you are stuck. You don't know how to move forward, but it's worth asking ourselves and trying to see. I know compared to my hospital, we have a huge load here. But how do you work through this? Is co-development and co-design possible is what you ask us. us. The OECD says that one out of six pe people will have a mental problem within a year. And one out of two has a mental health issue in a lifetime. This is scary. We are saying that somebody normal you're seeing with an abdominal pain is likely to have one, six of them will have a, an aberration. And then their response will be different. So anything you say or not say, listen or not listen, can end up in a problem. The economic impact report says, they're talking about examining patient empowerment in the Asia Pacific area. They call it a patient experience should be a process, but also you must look at the outcome. And you must look at the health literacy because many of the patients we see here are very different from the patients I see. So how do you look at health literacy? How much do they know? How much are they aware? And then go into this shared decision making. So the patient empowerment will mean, what is it in the clinical setting? What is it in the community? And Dr. Lakshmi alluded to this. What do they come with? What is the family telling them? And within the healthcare system, how do you empower them? This again was mentioned. Move away from a paternalistic model to a patient-centered model. We think we know. Actually, we do not know what the patient wants, unless we've been a patient ourselves. And Lakshmi said those two beautiful stories that makes us realize when we go as a patient, things are so different. So in the health communication models, we need cultural sensitivity, and we need to remember that each patient is different. And this is where, wherever I'm asked to speak, I tell them, this is where healthcare is so different. Don't bring in your machines, and the engineering is easy, the finance is easy. But for us, each person, each patient is different. And the patient preference studies with quantitative data becomes important. The WHO says that the patient empowerment is a process through which people gain greater control over decisions and actions affecting their health. The European Union network has talked about a multi-dimensional process. Now, I'm saying all this to let you know that the world is thinking about it. In our country, in our institution, it is important. Therefore, the summary of best practices for patient empowerment is health literacy, shared decision-making, you need to do a lot of research and development on this. And you need to tell the corporates that the reputation process, if you do this, the corporates will get more patients. Because along with the health technology, the patient groups will say, this is the doctor who listens. This, this place has what we need. And then you have to bring in the patient voice initiative, the PVI, collaboration, patients, researchers in industry. There is the SDM, which is the shared decision-making mo model, and the health technology assessment schemes. <clears throat> so if you want to bring patients to the center, you call it patient centricity. You need to motivate your colleagues. You need to tell all of us. And then we look at cost reduction, better decision-making, share the evidence. And uh, Tyler Marcinia says, 
the power of the patient voice has to be emphasized. And reputation improves the hospital reputation, the institution, the doctor reputation improves with patient centricity effort. That is why PREMs and PROMs are so important. So it is also a very good screening tool and a good prediction of physical health. We did three things in the hospital where I work. We started a telemedicine program. I know we've had this for uh, 25, 30 years. But we started this during the COVID season because we said we could not communicate with people. So we allowed them to talk to us. We also went ahead and gave the patients tabs to be able to talk to their relatives. And we started a call center, a patient information center. They can just call any time and ask any question that they want. This may be something that we can think of in CMC. And one last thing which we did, which has worked out very well, which is called the Happy Discharge Initiative, where the patient, this is one of the complaints here, which is a complaint where I'm working now. So the day before you have to decide about your discharge, you have to have your discharge summary ready, the bill ready, so that the next morning at nine o'clock, there is a team that will go with a gift and also a little plant to be planted in their homes. And by nine o'clock, they are supposed to go. The idea is that they should have lunch at home. Nine becomes 12, but still uh, they go home for lunch. And I hope that uh, we can try and see whether this will work. And uh, Mahatma Gandhiji reminded us that the patient is the most important person on our premises. We are not dependent on the patient. We are dependent on the patient and not the patient on us. Not an interruption. He is or she is doing us a favor. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you, sir, for our excellent talk. It's very nice to hear you. So I'm happy to invite Dr. Jesse Lionel for the next talk. Next talk is on communicating in the face of difficult patients. Ma'am is a consultant in family medicine of a distant education department of CMC, and she is the uh, former professor in uh, CMC Vellore. Uh, her pioneering work in HIV in Opsin Gaini is very commendable. And uh, I hand over the mic to ma'am for taking over this session. Uh, actually, I'm very, very, very glad that I can be in Rachel's uh, farewell and CME. Even though I have known Rachel for many years, I think she came in in 1985. I married and came in, that's what I heard. I came in in 1985 as a postgraduate student. Uh, even though I never sort of worked with you as a registrar or a colleague or in the same department, something which is very, very encouraging for me to see is the smile on her face. Every time I see her on the corridor, she'll have a nice smile to, <laughs> to everyone. And to me, it was really encouraging. When you work in a department, sometimes with so much of pressure upon you, to see someone smile at you is really nice. And um, I thought she's someone who is guileless. I keep telling at home, she just spoke what was in her heart and there was net, nothing inside her. And it has really been, you've been a good friend to me and I'm happy that I could be with you this morning. Now, actually after having heard uh, Dr. Lakshmi and uh, Jennifer and Dr. George Chandi, I think if we practice all this, we will have no difficult patient. So I don't know whether I should talk about difficult patient because if you have, if you're following all that they said, all our patients would be quite happy. I don't think we will have any difficulty with patients. Anyhow, now that I've been asked to speak about uh, how to tackle difficult patient, I thought I'm, I don't know whether people thought I had a lot of difficult patients when I was working here, <laughs> which I had to tackle, but I don't know whatever it is. I'm glad, quite glad that this has been given to me because it's something close to my heart in the sense, I've always wanted to look at patients as someone like mine. I kept telling my registrars and my students, don't look at them as a client, as we said, they are people. And I always said when, I, when they lie down on the couch, I used to say, these are people created in the image of God. Whether they look, they look well, whether they are well-dressed or not, whether they are stinking or smelling of perfume, when I look at them, they are people created in the image of God. 
that helped me a lot in my process of dealing with patients. And um, so I just want to speak about uh, uh, what, is, what do we mean by difficult patient? Actually, we have problems in forming an effective working relationship with the patient. The patient and the uh, doctor, physician have a problem to have an effective working relationship. Often we say patients are difficult. Actually, patients have problems and we have the difficulty. They have a problem, but we look at it as something difficult for us. So I would like to just go through a few things. What are the spectrum of difficulties? I'm not, there are actually, if you look at, um, <laughs> now that I'm in family medicine side, there's a whole lot of family medicine principles and things like that when you go through. There are a whole lot of difficult patients, but I would just, uh, because we won't be able to go through all these patients, I will speak mainly about people who are angry and agitated in our OPD or with us because certain things, or there are sometimes people who are very manipulative, and we all of us know about the VIP syndrome, how difficult it is to take care of care for people who are the most important people when the OPD or when they are admitted. And sometimes we have people who are very uncooperative and some people who are nagging. So whatever may be the spectrum of difficulties that we face with them, we need to look to see that they have a problem. So we are here to help them resolve the problem. That is what we are here as physicians. Now, I want to just look at few things which would lead to the problem. Why is a patient having a problem? Basically, there are three things. One is the patient, next to the physician and the process. Patient, as we said, they have their own perception when they come to us. They may have, uh, okay, this must be like this because they are used to going to different places and they must have gone to a, a hospital where they are treated as VIPs and here you come and make them sit for four hours, their appointment is at nine o'clock, you call them at 12 o'clock or one o'clock. So their perception is different and so they think, or oh, the doctor should be like this, they should be dressed like this, or they should be, each of them have got their own perception and they also have their expectations. They feel this is what I want from this place or from this doctor, which we may not understand or know. And the thing is, temperament is really make, makes a difference. People are anxious, people are afraid. And now when Dr. Jochandi said that one in six have mental health and one in two, I think it's something which we have to be very, very careful of. So the patient themselves have uh, things that lead on to as a problem to them. Much more now I find that uh, there are a lot of problems with our physicians, ourselves, our doctors. Because of our busy OPD and things like that, we are rushed and we are stressed. And uh, you know, we don't, we are not able to sing. You know, sometimes I've seen a registrar, the patient is there a little. They just hit the patient and just walk out. You know, I, I, it's very difficult because they're so rushed. Maybe there's a call from casualty or something is, you know, we're not able, we're so rushed and stressed about that we are not able to understand. And patients perceive and understand it differently. And often we also have a judgmental attitude as uh, people have spoken earlier. When you look at a person, the way they dress, the way they speak, we have a, you know, we have formed a, you know, opinion on them. And on that basis, we tend to react or interact with them and that leads to problem. And uh, as ma'am said again and again, we all think we are just there and we are serving down. I think that's something which all of us have to realize. And uh, we become arrogant and proud and disrespectful sometimes. And uh, uh, maybe because of language also, but I always we say when you are in a place, try to learn the language and how to speak to people with respect according to the cultural. And sometimes physicians are quite distracted. As ma'am again said, phone calls and looking at the computers, the physicians are distracted, which really puts off the patient, you know. And the other thing I would want to say is lack of knowledge and skills. Some of us, uh, because being a training institution, we have trainees in different stages of their knowledge and skills. And unless we are careful, we are putting patients at risk and that also can cause problems. So we need to be very careful when we have trainees coming of different standards into the institution. And sometimes we, all these may be all right, but the patient may 
get you know put off by the process that they come through there's a security who stands there and says you cannot get in while he sees somebody else going in with four of the family members going in but with this poor girl who has come with someone they'll say no you can't you know there are uh, problems there and the mro making them to wait and everywhere there's a queue and then all this i'm sure leads on to problems to patients which land up as difficulties for us now i just i'm not going to i just will tell you few steps that can help us how to solve a person with difficulties or the problem that they have and the difficulties we have the first is we need to avoid confrontation when a person is having a problem confrontation has to be avoided we have to facilitate discussion we have to allow them to vent their feelings and find them why it happened explore the reasons and refer i'll just go on each of the steps first is avoiding confrontation when a person a patient is agitated or upset we need to keep calm because um, the patient has something which is really troubled him or her almost proud of for us for a patient but most often our patients don't come and shout at us it's the spouse or the family that comes and they're very very excited and it's difficult to speak to them at then but it is said human beings are behave like a mirror image you know when when somebody is excited and you shout back they shout back but if you are calm it is they mirror what you do so it's a human tendency to mirror what you see and so we have to sit down calmly so that they may calm down the other thing that we need to do is if they raise their voice deliberately we need to lower our voice so when they shout if we are we are able to be calm and speak softer than what they speak surely it will calm down the, the fire or the temperature will keep coming down and from the point of view of the doctors i think a few things when you have a difficult patient or the problem patient we need to address them by name you can say ayya unga per enna varingla ayya vandu ukkarunga you know it is rather than say meena oda veetukara ra va ukkaru you know it it makes them very you know it, it doesn't give them but if you call them ayya unga per enna vaanga ukkarunga as in nature solunga so the when it, you and you are able to call them by name all of us have some kind of an affinity towards our name and we call them by name and give them the cultural respect they need and always something which i feel in a transparent open relationship we are able to see eye to eye with people so we need to have an eye contact and also we have to have a right attitude to listen we have been talking about listening listening how to listen we are here to listen and resolve and we don't go to defend when a patient comes to us a problem comes we are not going to justify and say what did it da 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 we are there to willingly listen quite often the problem may be on our side so i don't think we are here as people we are not uh, perfect saints we do go wrong and we should have the grace to accept but not in the sense to let go of our institution or our department or a doctor who is working with us but we should have the right attitude to listen and resolve and not to defend and when you sit down you should have a proper posture if a person is sitting down you sit down don't sit down and cross your legs and you know i don't care uh, you say i will say you know to be able to go down to their level and to have a proper posture and one more thing i will teach you is um, suppose in spite of all this you think the zen counter is going to be difficult please try and sit close to the door so that you can exit if the patient turns violent because I, i remember this being told to me when i when we went for psychiatric class in the first clinical year <laughs> so this is something uh, we have you know sometimes things can turn violent so try and be near the door where you can exit okay so then how do we facilitate discussion one thing you know uh, when people are upset they shout uh, you know start shouting in a crowd you know in front of the opd or the labor room and they make so much noise and everything you know that's a way that they want to express 
But the way that we can diffuse this and bring, the, bring it into a smoother relationship or understanding is to gently take them to a private place. This will definitely reduce the hostility and don't allow crowd to come in. And even if you have to talk, get few close family members to come in and say, you can say, Aya, ningalang konja irunga. Sundakaranga matto, venangarang matro ulla manga. So, the way that we are able to give them respect and bring them in is something which would again see the whole process is trying to cool, cool, cool down so that the person who is so angry and upset will come to senses. So, never try to uh, do anything, solve problem in the midst of a crowd when all people are around and agitated. And the other thing is, we must realize we set about listening. And when we say listening, we should have a year to listen. Let them speak, especially someone who is really upset. Something is trouble. Something is so heavy in them. That's why they want to speak. Whether it is right or wrong, for them it is something very important. So give them time to express their anger. Uh, people said, the maximum, however much somebody has got a problem, they can't speak more than 20 minutes. So if you're going for a resolution or a problem, take about half an hour with you. I'm sure you'll be able to resolve. Just let them speak as long as they want. Whatever they want to speak, let them speak and don't interrupt them. All that you have to do is don't respond to them. Or when they say something, your doctor did like this, your man did like this, or you didn't say, don't justify your action. Don't try to respond saying, no, 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 we did like this. Uh, you didn't understand. Don't let them speak what they want. Don't justify your action or your omissions even. You know, I'm so sorry, we didn't, we didn't do. Just let them speak. Let them say whatever they want. And uh, sometimes we tend to defend our doctor or our staff or our institution. The main thing is just let them speak and speak. And to even encourage, where are the solanumanga, where are the kashna irkada, solunga. No, to help them to speak, to run out of steam. Again, you know the temperature is coming down, down, down. And always, as I said, maintain an eye contact. And the expressions in your face and body language tells you you care. You're not just here because you're an administrator or a senior doctor, you just want to resolve something and run away. I do care for you, whatever is the problem for you. I think that really makes, you know, people are able to sense whether you're truthful, whether it's coming from within your heart or it's just a part of your work that you do. I think uh, something which uh, God through this institution gave me is that. To be able to be sincere and genuine in whatever you're doing, taking people for who they are. You know, so that's something uh, which we need to have that comes from. This is something which has to come within our heart. And I pray that it may be true for our for people younger. We have seen it in our seniors. We have seen it years along. And I pray that it will be a reality. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart from within. So let them bend feelings. Then, then you sit down and slowly expo, explore what they say. See, the more hostile a person is, more angry the person is, your kind and understanding response matters. And, um, and it is, you know, for sure that it's very difficult for people to keep shouting when you're compassionate and listening. Even if you don't have an answer, they can't go on, on and on shouting when you're quiet, you're compassionate and listening. And always try to take a generally a gentle and neutral attitude to the real problem. And always we may not be able to solve the problem. Why the baby had asphyxia? What happened? They could have done this, they could have done that. We cannot. But we always can say, promise to investigate. And sometimes it's difficult for us to be able to solve the problem. We must always refer to people. When not all problems can be uh, reg uh, you know, solved as a registrar or a consultant, but you can always, and even in a department, sometimes it's difficult, so we always say, let's go to the medical superintendent or a director. So we'll have to be able to speak to people who are above us. So they tell the patient at the end of the conversation, we will try to go into what we the problem is and try to bring the problem 
and attention. And most often, when you find a patient with problem, we get to know actually what is the problem in your services, and we'll be able to improve the services. Now, I want to, when you have an encounter with people who have problems, uh, the danger signal that we have to be careful about is the body language. When somebody is agitated and moving closer to you, better be careful. And when somebody becomes very, very quiet or very rapid and louder, call for help and exit the place. Don't think you can manage it alone. Then I just will close with a personal strategy that I had used in my clinical years. Starting the day with God, when I start the day with God, I know God is with me and his spirit is there to enable me. And I believe that God prepares the day for me because the words of God says, God has prepared good works for us to walk into it each day. So the good work may be to face a challenging person. And um, so you have come not alone, but with God within you and his spirit and power to be able to manage that day. And whenever there's a problem, just try to get to know what is the side of the problem. What does your registrar say? What does the staff say? What is, you have to know what is their opinion on that. And it's always nice when you can call another colleague to be with you rather than trying to manage yourself. And um, in the midst of trouble, in spite of all this, I've had problems. I used this quick and short arrow prayers. Lord, I really don't know what to say. Give me the right word, what to say. And so that has really helped me a lot. And uh, speaking to God, and it's very easy to speak to God. You don't need to go somewhere. You can sit and ask, even as I'm speaking, and I ask God, give me the wisdom. So God gives us wisdom and helps us to be calm. The one thing that I want to say very clearly is be sincere and truthful. Never say a lie or a half truth. If you don't want to let go, something has gone wrong, don't disclose the truth. Remain silent, but never speak something which is not truthful. And be genuinely understanding, kind and compassionate, knowing that they are like you. And we may also be in a place like them at some point. Like ma'am said, she was a patient walking around. You know, sometimes we may be put in circumstances and situations. So let's look at them like that. So let's not look at them as problems and that we have difficulties. We look at them as people who have concerns and we are put in here by the grace of God with the wisdom and the power and the knowledge and abilities to be able to resolve problem, not to defend and justify ourselves. I think I'll stop here. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your nice uh, discussion on the difficult patient. I think we can break for tea for 10 minutes. Respected teachers, colleagues, and friends. I'm quite uh, at a loss of, for what to say, so I'll refer to my paper at times. Now, how can I adequately thank all of y'all for giving me a lifetime of love, joy, fulfillment, and expectation? What can I give back to each of you for the fullness of life that you all have given me? And how can I respond and ensure that I remain faithful to my calling? I came to CMC in 1984, soon after my wedding, to an entirely different culture to what I was used to in West Bengal. I was welcomed into a new community, a world of commitment, camaraderie, oneness, and family. My teachers taught me the basics of obstetrics and gynecology, a subject I always, always loved. I enjoyed the time in labor room, running helter-skelter, delivering babies, running to theater, sometimes perched on the trolley, standing outside the obstetric offices in the morning, explaining why things went wrong in the night in labor room. And I, what I liked most was consultants listening to me patiently and consoling me and teaching me to learn from my mistakes. 
I'm ever so grateful to Dr. Lakshmi, Dr. Bala, Dr. Padmini, Dr. Alice, Dr. George, Aruna, Ruby, and all my colleagues who taught me so much. I enjoyed medical students campering down the stairs in the previous labor room when the bell rang to assist in the forceps delivery, and all of them looking over your shoulder as you applied the forceps. And I really loved the coffee breaks in labor room where coffee was made available at the right time by the intern and the meticulous way they collected money and handled accounts. Having coffee sitting on the culvert with my seniors between a laparotomy for ectopic and patients to manage in labor room was something I really missed when we came to ISSC building. So gynecology and all its complexities was taught to me meticulously. I'm eternally grateful to OG2 and all the surgical skills I acquired during my period there. In 2010, when we were asked to branch out into specialized areas, or specialized areas of work, I was really in a muddle. But it's with God's guidance that I chose gynae oncology, and I have been really, really blessed. I enjoyed my interaction with my patients, m and and MDT meetings, where we discuss patients in detail, surgeries, post-op care, follow-up, and most of all, the home visits and palliative care. I enjoyed the informal chats in the office with AB, Anita, Vinota, Ajit, Dania, and all the registrars where we discussed anything under the sun. Gynae Oncology provided me the opportunity to learn, grow, and to experience all new opportunities, and to serve families who are going through the most, most difficult times. So to AB, Dr. Alice, Dr. Lakshmi, Anita, Vinota, Dania, and Ajit, I will always be grateful for the last 13 years. To our colleagues in radiation oncology and medical oncology and palliative care, thank you for all the teamwork which helped to serve our patients better. And to all my registrars, there's so much I learned from you. Thank you so much for being a part of the journey. And they tell you, ma'am, this is not so okay. This is better. Try that in surgery. And I'm really blessed because when I listened to them, things went proper. And I'm very really grateful to all my registrars who come from far to be with us today. And I'm indebted to all my dear staff in G4 West, G3 South, G7 South, A6, Labor Room, Theater staff for all the help and support these 25 years. And to my office team, Roja, Violet, Juliana, Linda, and Jamal, sir, who made my time in office so memorable. And as I move on to the next phase of my life, as was the case till now, I thank God. And I hope to do what God has called me to be, be it as a doctor, a friend, or as a family member. I leave the department with cherished memories, strong bonds of friendship, and love. And dear friends, always remember, our endeavor is to serve our patients as to the best of our ability, and we should leave no stone unturned in that. Thank you.
improve the examination accuracy. Patient characteristic again is very important. And all I want to say is that the ultrasound scan is no more uh, extended physical examination. It is the examination and I am sure none of you are going to do a laparotomy or a laparoscopy or a robotic surgery saying that it is an ovarian mass or a uterine mass based on your clinical examination because the clinical examination has its own limitation. Clinical examination has been overshadowed by ultrasound scan which is more accurate, it has got better specificity, better sensitivity and it is definitely going to tell you whether it's a uterine or an ovarian mass. Let me ask my postgraduates, how many of you have used these gadgets? A Pinard's, a daily stethoscope to do intermittent auscultation in labor. I'm not talking about in the antenatal clinic but in labor, how many of you have used it? What do we use? We use electronic fetal monitoring. Electronic fetal monitoring is different from intermittent auscultation. Intermittent auscultation, the Dublin study, which my colleague definitely will quote that, one is to one ratio, hear the fetal art, and then say fetal tachycardia, fetal bradycardia, post of a cesarean section. But today, intermittent auscultation has become a glorified art. Why? It takes time to develop expertise. It is very subjective. Dr. Jesse may say it is 120. Dr. Rita may say it is 140, right? Initially, it may not be able to recognize the fetal heart. You may feel the uterine shuffle. You may hear the maternal pulse. I remember patients have had cesarean section for fetal distress on the basis of auscultation and delivered a fresh stillbirth. It was not the fetal heart which was heard, it was a maternal pulse. Don't want to make such mistakes. It is impossible to recognize the subtle feature. You may hear 140, you may hear 160, you may hear 200, but can you know the baseline variability? Answer is no. Can you know what the accelerations are? Do you know whether there is any deceleration? Sometimes the patient is very obese, nothing will touch the fetal heart. You put your eye, you put your ear, you put anything, you will not be able to hear the fetal heart. And number, the last and the most important is, there is no documentation of events of labor. You will write 140, but then Dr. Lakshmi cannot take rounds, saying what is the baseline, what is the acceleration, what is the deceleration. All this will not be possible if you just do intermittent auscultation. Doing intermittent auscultation and having a cooked baby is a sure shot recipe to medical legal case. Because continuous fetal monitoring, we know, has increased the cesarean section rate. It has increased the instrumental delivery, forceps and vaginal um, for, uh, vontuse delivery, but it has definitely reduced the number of hypoxic uh, HIE and neonatal seizure. What do you want for a patient? Do you want a cesarean section or do you want a cooked baby? What do you want? An intermittent auscultation or do you want a continuous fetal monitoring? Why are in CMC we are having intermittent, not having intermittent fetal monitor? Because of the reasons which I have already given you. How many of you go to G3 South Ward? Is it right? Is it the obstetric ward? To look for breach. Is it a flex breach? Is it an extended breach? Is the head extended? Is the head flexed? No, nobody does that. Exam sex, you do it. But after exams, scan pannungo, scan sonnang. Scan you do, you know what is flex. And nowadays, the art of vaginal delivery in breach is gone. Nobody delivers anybody by breach, uh, does a breach delivery. All you need to do is cesarean sections, whether it is breach is flexed, extended, irrespective of that. How many of you can diagnose intrauterine growth restriction on a abdominal palpation? All of us can do it. 32 weeks uterus. Gestational age is 38 weeks. We know there is growth restriction. That's all it tells you. But you need 12 to... Minutes, as... 12 minutes over. Okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> because the, the examination is incomplete. I didn't know that I'm... My Dr. George Chandy, Dr. Sunil Chandy, I want to ask you, how many of you, I, I rather I would say, I'm sure you took pride in auscultating the fetal heart, uh, auscultating the, uh, the murmur, and also um, looking at the JVP. How many of us do that? 
How many cardiologists do it? Not many because you have ECG. You have echo to answer all the question. Gastroenterology. Will Dr. George Chandy treat a patient with gastric pain with uh, just pentaprosol? He will do gastroscopy. Every organ is illuminated. Why? Because it is inappropriate to treat a patient without proper investigation based on your clinical examination. I'm not going to go on this track because Dr. AB is going to yeah, talk I about the whole approach. take one minute off your rebuttal time. <laughs> yes, yes. Limitations. <laughs> Subjective with interobservable variability, inaccurate, inadequate, in, unreliable, done in a hurry, and you can miss early ovarian cancer, early uterine cancer. And this is another limitation. Truth is, it is a token of gesture for patient satisfaction. No more earns a trust or serves as a ritual that transforms two strangers into doctor and patient. Consumer provider relationship, and most importantly, we are physicians, we are logicians. We are not magicians with a magic wand in the hand. We can make mistakes. Making mistake, you land up in this court of law. Are we justified in the court of law saying that my clinical examination is right? Answer is no. New paradigm shift, artificial intelligence. It is going to not only kill the art of clinical examination, but is going to make us jobless, redundant, and replace human. Not to disapprove, demerit, declass, degrade clinical examination or nor am I here to refute and oppose physical examination. I have been brought up doing physical examination, but it has its own limitations. Sophisticated technology has shaken the healthcare industry. It has been a game changer, a path breaker, and we need to use it wisely. We are not cavemen. We have technology to make patient care safe. A glorified past, it has taken a back seat. Physical examination has receded into the background, experiencing limitations and decline in practice. It has taken a back seat. And May whenever I remind some you? Last. And whenever something takes a back seat, it eventually does not function. It is not practiced. It becomes effaced. It is considered obsolete. It remains in shadow. And that is the fate of clinical examination. Clinical examination has disappeared and declined. And you can see the diet, the death of clinical examination. However, you may be in love with your clinical examination, Dr. A.B. Objectively, they are losing their relevance and practical utility is dead. Clinical examination is a dying art. It will be a dead art. And it is time for us to offer our condolences and write their object. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Dr. Rachel, Nina. You're a free bird now. This is a western blue bird. You're as beautiful as this bird. And you're now free. And you can be at disposal to Dr. George Chandy. You'll be free bird. OK? Thank you very much for your patient listening. May I invite Dr. Rebi to resurrect <laughs> the dead art, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's really happy to be here at uh, Dr. Rachel's uh, farewell. And I think the morning session was fantastic. And I think this debate also is really keeping in line with her um, emphasis on patient care. Respected uh, Chairperson Dr. Lakshmi Seshadri, it's really good to have you chairing this. And I would like to remind my worthy opponent that I'm not against technology, and technology is definitely alive. But the topic of the debate is clinical examination, not technology. So I'm here to talk to you that clinical examination is important and still relevant. Now, the clinical encounter, our first moments with the patient are packed with visual, auditory, and tactile information that determines both the effectiveness and the costs of our subsequent care. Of all the diagnoses that ever will be made, most are made during history and then the physical exam. It's so important to build rapport with the patient. As she walks into the clinic to greet her with a smile, a hand on her shoulder and a hand on her, and the other on the pulse really gives a healing touch and half her troubles will be over. Touching breaks down barriers. The physical exam is a unique characteristic of the doctor-patient encounter. It's a ritual connecting the doctor and the patient. At the exam table, the doctor and the patient talk directly, science impediment of technology such as the computer screen, 
physically close to each other, actually touching, there is an intimacy. Like all intimacies, this has an effect of changing the dynamics of the interaction. Often during the phys physical exam, patients reveal what is truly on their mind. Like we heard in the morning session, it's so important to know what the patients really want. This precious moments of touching and talking is an irreplaceable diagnostic and therapeutic tool. So the optimal physician has all these components, expertise in history taking, physical examination, clinical epidemiology or quantitative clinical reasoning, a rational mind, an ethical physician, patient interaction and compassion. And the basis of clinical decision making be based on the evidence-based medicine and also on the patient interview and exam. One without the other makes no sense, but both put together with good quality are fundamental in clinical practice. As Osler said, medicine is learned by the bedside and not in the classroom. Let not your concepts of disease come from words heard in the lecture room or read from the book. See and then reason, compare and control. And I'd like to tell uh, Dr. Aruna that, you know, diseases may, may be present and absent, of course, and test results may be positive or negative, but there are always true positives, false positives, false negatives, and true negatives. So medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. One finger in the throat or vagina and one in the rectum makes a good diagnostician, so said William Osler. And as clinicians, we need to tolerate this uncertainty because there's always uncertainty. Patients do not have disease, only probability of disease. And diagnostic tests, all the fancy technology that she was talking about, are merely revisions of probabilities. And the probabilities have to start from the when the patient walks into the room. Test interpretation should precede test ordering. And if you're not going to change management with the result of a test, you shouldn't order it. So we have to look at what is the gain in information. How far do you move from the pre-test probability to the post-test probability? The pre-test probability is the prevalence. And after your history, your every question you ask, every clinical finding you elicit is a test. And of course, lab tests are necessary. I'm not saying lab tests or technology is not interest, in, in, uh, necessary. But have you really moved? How far have you moved from the diagonal, which is the neutral point, to the topmost left-hand corner? And we, if you're familiar with likelihood ratios, the, like I said, the prevalence of the pre-test probability with, after the history gives you a post-history probability. The examination gives you a post-examination probability. And the lab test or imaging will give you a post-test probability or post-test odds. And that's what we need to explain to the patient. So there's a multiplier effect. Probability increases or decreases in a stepwise manner. It is foolhardy to skip history and exam and go straight to the lab test. You'll end in all sorts of trouble. Again, to look at the effect of prevalence and predictive values, when the prevalence is low, whatever test you use, you're moving from, say, 99% to 99.9% of, if it's very low, you're moving from 0.1 to 0.01 of two. So the tests are useful only in the middle area where you're not very sure and you have the maximum gain. Whereas in extremes of high prevalence or low prevalence, the really no point doing a test. So how do we decide what to do? If the prevalence is very low, we should not test, we should not treat. If it's in the middle, we should definitely order tests and uh, go with that. And if it is an extreme, uh, likely that the patient is uh, having a disease. For example, if the patient comes to casualty, a young lady with six mix amenorrhea is in shock and white as a sheet, please do not order your fancy ultrasound test or do any test. Rush her to theater because she's got a ruptured ectopic. So this is an example of a perplexing case. An otherwise healthy 23-year-old man was hospitalized with a life-threatening pulmonary embolism. Doctors had no clue as to what had caused it. Patient underwent every diagnostic test that Dr. Aruna talked about. CT scan, coagulation workup, MRI scan, PET scan, whatever they had. But all were negative. Dr. MS, MS I think I put it as MC, performed a simple test, the AdSense maneuver. With the patient's arm straightened, he placed a finger over the pulse of the wrist and then moved the arm behind the patient, man's back. When he asked the patient to turn his head, the pulse disappeared. When he looked forward, the pulse returned. Though many of us are not aware of these maneuvers and tests, it's very useful to know. An expert clinician should know this. So the diagnosis was a thoracic outlet syndrome, and surgery fixed the problem. 
All of you know that, you know, assessing rotation, station are so crucial. You can't apply instruments without knowing that. You can't uh, do gynecology if you can't uh, know the size of the uterus or whether it's antiverted, retroverted or whatever. And uh, a patient in the tropics with uh, a fever who's got an S char, straight away you know it's tick typhus. Or if there's a loss of sensorium, then you think of cerebral malaria. If there's jaundice, you think of malaria, leptospirosis, and so on. So clinical examination is so very important. Now, factors threatening good clinical practice, yes, there are time constraints. There's lack of confidence in one's clinical abilities. And if we do not teach our students these things, of course, they're going to feel uh, they're not able to do these things. There are improvements in technology, and have, this has perpetuated a focus on lab and imaging. And like I said, training weaknesses. And physicians are asked to do all things for all patients rushing around. So there is a problem here. So the problem of technology is that physicians once relied on seeing, hearing, touching a patient to make a diagnosis. Technology has often replaced those skills. Medicine has become impersonal and AI will make it worse. I agree with all that. But many doctors lament the decline of the art of history taking and clinical examination. True. But we have to know the limitations of technology. New technologies allow doctors to explore parts of the body that they can't examine in other ways but they don't give the whole picture. They can't feel when an abdomen is tender, discern clues from the look on a patient's face or focus on a particular area because of how it feels or what the patient says. And like I said, there may be false positives and false negatives. Even if you do an MRI scan and measure, there's going to be inter-observer variation. There's going to be inter-observer variation. Subjectivity will remain in most tests. The problems of excessive testing. Expansive use of imaging creates unnecessary costs. And this is a real problem in today's world. So I think technology is the problem. Over medicalization of the patient is the problem. Repeated CT scans, x-rays, PET scans. I don't know, even in oncology, if some, if some patient has ultrasound scan, MRI scan, CT scan, PET scan, and whatever else other scans is available. So, and this promotes defensive medicine. False med positives lead to unnecessary interventions. False negative leads to false security. So technology has to be seen in context. Excessive reliance on technology has not improved the quality of patient care. Tests are just one more piece of evidence that has to be interpreted. So that's what's important. The rational mind. History and clinical examination are valuable guides in deciding which tests to order. Letting specialists know where to concentrate their efforts. Clinical examination allows technology to become an extension of a doctor rather than a replacement. And limited resource setting. We are supposed to be sending doctors to mission hospitals or remote parts of the country. Being able to identify a problem when you don't have access to CT scans or echo highlights why it's so important to gain proficiency in the physical exam. So if you are a patient advocate, be cost effective and save their money. So from inability to let well alone from too much zeal for the new and contempt for what is old, from putting knowledge before wisdom, science before art, and cleverness before common sense, from treating patients as cases, and from making the cure of the disease more grievous than the endurance of the same, God, Lord, deliver us. <laughs> so in conclusion, technology is important, but the clinical encounter should point to which technology is to be used. History and clinical exam are fundamental in choosing the best technology, keeping costs down in the patient's best interest. Understand the threats to good clinical care, strive to overcome them. Clinical examination should be alive and kicking if it is not already so. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ebi. I think you have successfully resurrected the-, the, the Before three days. <laughs> And, and an extra point for you for sticking to time. Thank you. <laughs> yes, so Dr. Aruna for the rebuttal. Yes, you do. He will, because you chose to speak first. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. No, we just want to be democratic and say both will have the opportunity. 
Dr. Aruna, you chose to go first and therefore no, no, AB no, happens no, to get the no, last no word. No problem. I Too can bad. prove myself. No problem. Where am I? Okay. Yes, of course. Yes, we agree that Aruna, but Aruna killed it quite well. So okay. let's see whether. Thank she you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are, we are, we are taking. We are not um, cavemen's. We are technologically advanced people, and I don't refute the art of clinical examination, but. Technology has to be used wisely. Okay, let us now come to the rebuttal. History taking, I do not refuse. History taking is extremely important. Listening to the patient is extremely important. Patient hearing, Dr. Lakshmi has told us very well. Human touch. Dr. A.B. goes and touches a patient, holds her hand. He will be in the court of law. Touch today has a different meaning, mind you. Who takes the history? You're talking about history. Today, who takes the history? I have a physician assistant who is extremely smarter, beautiful, knowledgeable than what I am. So the physician assistant is thought to be a doctor. And that is the first encounter. And then I walk in with my salwar kameez and the doctor inge, Nanda doctor ma. Right? I am the doctor. My physician assistants are very smart. Everybody knows that they are beautiful and good looking. So history is taken first by the physician assistant. Chaperon, can you work without a chaperon? Whether you need a male chaperon, female chaperon, we don't know. We in gynecology may need a female chaperon, but a gynecologist like Dr. Abraham and XX, XY, we don't know what chaperon the person is going to require. So again, that is a downside of relying on clinical examination. Patients were and are human. They are inanimate, not just made of flesh and blood, but also have emotions. You cannot keep poking your fingers. They have independence. They need confidentiality. You cannot discuss the patients on rounds. They have the right to question and argue, and they don't like to be poked and pushed. Bedside clinics, I'm sure postgraduates will agree with me. After doing night rounds, if a consultant takes you through the ward rounds, Discussing patients, this is the condition that you will have. You will be sick and tired. When will it get over? So you're not going to learn anything by the bedside. Nothing is learned by the bedside. So my dear opponent, using a map in a world that has switched to GPS, lost in the past while the rest navigates in the future. Sorry, I do not agree. You are hopelessly lost when it comes to clinical examination. Thank you very much. You may agree, you may disagree. <coughs> Do you need any weapons? I got this. <laughs> Can I have to get back to my... Enough for the counter punch. <laughs> so the importance of the clinical counter, like I said, the quality of a doctor-patient interaction is paramount. So shift away from the medical objectification of the patient towards patient-centered clinical practice like we heard in the morning is so crucial. And clinical decision-making really depends on utility and probability and the value that is we have for it. So the cost effectiveness would be net cost per change in health outcome. These are things that we need to keep in mind. The OSCE is there to stay. This is what I like my opponent to look at. Too much technology, no common sense is going to be a problem. So in the first cartoon, it says, I would be a lot healthier if you would stop finding things wrong with me. 
And the second one, you caught a virus from your computer and we had to erase your brain. I hope you got a backup copy. So there are problems with screening. Just an example, all screening programs do harm. Some do good as well. So all these examples that are listed here are really problematic. And she will know that PSA testing causes more problems and really may not be useful. So there are potential biases in screening tests like lead time bias, length time bias, over and all these biases. So tests are not always useful. So your lab tests are back. Your cholesterol weight and self-importance are all too high. All of these tests will determine if you can afford any of them. So don't be taken for a ride. Don't be fooled by her charm and her oratory. <laughs> human emotion and the human touch cannot be replaced by computers or artificial intelligence. So always start with history, then go on to examination, then investigations, confirm your diagnosis, and then do the treatment. So it's a knockout, sorry. But I didn't mean to no ill feelings. And when you get up, please get this book. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Abraham and Aruna. I think Aruna using technology, her charm and oratory skills, as, she's, as you said, and uh, Abi using his uh, clinical epidemiological statistical and mathematical uh, skills have tried to convince us whether the clinical skills or clinical examination, the art is dead or alive. And I think both of them toned it down towards the end to say that we need both. I'm not sure whether I should put this to vote. Should I? No. OK. So I think all of us agree and go back uh, accepting, understanding, and agreeing that both are mandatory. Clinical examination can never be dispensed with. Sorry? Yes, and they are complementary to each other. And uh, you need clinical examination to decide on what uh, in investigations or technology to use. So thank you very much for a wonderful uh, debate. Yes. Thank you so much. So when we uh, when we thought of this program, when we thought of debaters, we made sure both the debaters were retired and out of CMC, so they can let their hair down and debate all that they want. So yes, <laughs> and we had a senior person to make sure to moderate skillfully. So we'll go on to panel discussions. We invite uh, Dr. Annie Reggie, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Gigi and Dr. Ramesan to uh, please chair the session. We'll start with uh, recent advances in clinical perspectives in AUB and postmenopausal bleeding. We invite Smitha to uh, be the moderator. Uh, would the panelists like to sit here? Or uh, I, I realize it's uh, poor visibility of the screen if you sit up. Smita? What do you say, sir? Say Panelists.
Patna ma'am and Abraham sir, uh, we are all familiar with, uh, they no, need no introduction. Uh, Dr. Bina, she is a consultant in OG1. Dr. Aarti, she is also a consultant in OG1. Dr. Binakshi, uh, she is uh, in OG2. I am Smita. Okay, to cover an, an entire uh, AUB in 30 minutes is trying to fit an elephant in a small size fridge. So because of the limited uh, time, uh, we are covering very limited uh, topics as well. I hope that the next uh, few questions will do some justice to our doubts. Itne mein itna hi milta hai. Okay, diving straight into AUBO. Weight loss, weight loss, weight loss. What else can you offer as a patient-friendly doctor? Dr. Bina. So in, AB, in AUBO, the main thing that we always stress upon is lifestyle modification. Lifestyle modification is basically we're talking about exercise and exercise. So exercise which can be either moderate or of uh, vigorous intensity. The guidelines talks about more than 150 minutes per, day, per week of a moderate activity or more than one, no, 75 minutes per week for a rigorous act, vigorous activity. But that is the baseline thing for an AUBO. One is that, why is it important? Because it is known to actually improve the metabolic profile of the patient and it's actually known to improve uh, the, the PC or the outcome of PC, even if you're talking about ovulation and uh, fertility, it's known to be the, the first thing that we have to actually stress upon. The entire cycle of obesity, insulin resistance and so on. Okay, myo-inositol, metformin, prescribe or not to prescribe, Dr. Aarti? Myo, inositol and uh, metformin, both are insulin sensitizers, but uh, literature and studies say that uh, they, they do have effect in the menstrual cycle and ovulation, but it does not come as a recommendation in any of the guidelines. Metformin, <coughs> the reason uh, in the international guidelines for PCOS committee has said that it, can, it is uh, effective for those who have insulin resistance uh, with PCOS and uh, uh, with BMI of more than 25. Okay, I guess BMI of 25 for us in our OPD is a little overkill, yeah, but uh, I guess we can consider when uh, they are obese. Okay, how early would you recommend endometrial biopsy for a woman with AUBO who is already at risk? Abraham, sir. No, even if, she, if she's having anovulatory cycles, then, uh, you know, if it's for more than uh, six months of, or a year or so, then I would definitely do a pipal biopsy. 30, 35, 40, how early? Uh, that age is not a criteria. If she is having persistent irregular anovulation, then I would sample the endometrium. Thank you, sir. Is there an endometrial thickness cutoff you would consider for a woman, young woman in reproductive age group uh, with AUBO, Dr. Minakshi? If the friendly neighbors are more knowledgeable, please do share the knowledge. Question is early age. See, is, is there an endometrial okay. thickness cutoff you would consider for a young lady with AUBO? Above which you say that, uh, yes, I will do uh, endometrial biopsy. So young age 15, group, uh, we take uh, is premenopausal patients. So there is no set cutoff uh, of endometrial thickness for taking the endometrial biopsy. But major guidelines given by ACOG and NICE, they uh, say more than 45 with AUB, less than 45 AUB with the risk factor of obesity, diabetes, and uh, background history of anovulation, we have to uh, sample, as sir said, there is no age cut off. Would you like to add on anything, uh, Aruna ma'am? Say I, I, it was 20 millimeter, 15 see, millimeter. See, ovulatory cycle, she is bleeding every month, she is bleeding heavily. You are talking about ovulatory yes, and ovulatory. Yes. 
I think in a patient who has got uh, anomalatory cycles with excessive bleeding, um, you don't know which lute whether you are doing a scan in the luteal phase or a, the other uh, follicular phase. Mm. So in that case, I think the cutoff which they have given is any patient who has an endometrial thickness of more than 16 millimeters will require an endometrial sampling because there is a possibility that 16 millimeters there could be a possibility of hyperplasia. So I think the cutoff which is given for an anomalatory cycle is 16 millimeters. I mean, you have read the literature very well. You can answer the question. Yeah, 15. Uh, that, uh, but it's, I guess if the patient is symptomatic, not responding. Yes, obviously. And, like, anomalatory is cycle is symptomatic. It is more than uh, Yes. When you're talking anomalatory cycles, heavy bleeding at the end of three months, she's got heavy bleeding. You do an endometrial, via, uh, endometrial thickness. You find it is 16 millimeters. I'm not going to wait for her till the age of 45. I will definitely yes. sample her if the endometrial thickness is more than 16 Earlier. millimeters. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, do you also look at the irregularity? Or yes, if there is irregularity, if, um, uh, <coughs> all those things, uh, echogenic lesion with vascularity, that's a straightforward answer. This is just if everything else is normal, just a thick end endometrium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think in the female population, it's more than, I think, if I'm not wrong, it's 20, 16 millimeters. Entrance books and also 12 mm. Well, I, I, uh, I want to add, ma'am. Just now, one doubt. Looking irregular, qualified, uh, you know, then you can. Yeah. This 20, 21 year old unmarried girl with uh, maybe no, to one. This uh, 20, 22 year old unmarried girl with uh, an ovulatory for a year and all, do we really do a biopsy in and that the, yeah. yeah, I mean. The patients with, I mean, the patients with AUB, the 16 uh, mm cutoff is given. Uh, so, uh, but there is uh, low sensitivity and specificity around 60 to 70%. So to uh, decrease the false positive rate, we should do the endometrial biopsy in the uh, uh, proliferative phase, immediately after the menses. Because in proliferative phase, already the endometrial thickness will be more. Okay, let's move on. Irregular cycles, but normal looking ovaries, is it reassuring? Dr. Aarti. Uh, according, uh, according to Rotterdam criteria, uh, the clinical criteria for de defining PCOS is, the three three criteria are there. One is oligoanovulation, PCOM, that is polycystic ovarian morphology, and uh, hyperandrogenism. So, uh, this actually uh, help us to substantiate uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome into four phenotypes, which is A, B, C, and D. So, in uh, phenotype B, uh, there is absence of polycystic ovarian morphology and the presence of only oligoanovulation and uh, hyperandrogenism, uh, like what you said. So, I would uh, like to classify the patient into PCOS phenotype B and counsel accordingly. The flip side of it. Required. What I wanted to uh, bring forward uh, from these two questions is that we don't really need to chase the ovaries by the appearance for uh, counselling because that is one of the doubts or things that the patient comes with. For us, uh, we think differently, but when the patient comes there, ovaries are they normal? Do I need to keep scanning till they look normal are the doubts. Okay, the, fl the other side of it, PCOM, no menstrual complaints. What do I do? Reassure, scare, send them with a warning. Aruna, ma'am, can you? She's got regular cycles and if the scan shows that there are follicles, peripherally arranged follicles. Just morphology. Well, I otherwise would not really cycles. worry about. But one thing which I would definitely look for is the BMI of the patient. If the BMI is high, then I would definitely ask Send her to reduce weight. Not just with 
exercises because it's not 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 possible only ex diet control is extremely important they say i just eat a, a, one biscuit and one cup of tea and one cup of coffee but the amount of sugar that they put in that coffee and the sugar uh, in the tea is excessive so i think it's a combination of diet control and exercises which have to be really emphasized and i won't do anything just because the ovaries are looking abnormal be consciously aware of the calories totally taken and the calories spent Okay, now what is new uh, in the FIGO classification uh, that has come up? Can you come quickly? Currently, uh, we use WHO classification for uh, uh, for classifying the ovulatory disorders. Uh, they are group 1 or type 1, 2 and 3. So type 1 is uh, basically hypothalamic pituitary causes and type 2 uh, PCOS and type 3 uh, ovarian failure. So <clears throat> FIGO uh, has come up with a new classification and uh, the core component of this system uh, can be... Uh, remembered with an acronym HYPO-P, which is uh, hypothalamic, pituitary, ovarian, and PCOS, they have classified as separately. So this is the diagrammatic representation of the FIGO classification, under which the type 1 is hypothalamic causes, type 2 pituitary causes, type 3 ovarian causes, and type 4, they have separated uh, PCOS from the uh, WHO classification and uh, so primarily uh, for this classification first and foremost we have to diagnose the patient uh, with an ovulatory disorder and then subclassify them into the primary classification which is type 1, 2, 3, 4 and then again uh, there is a secondary classification to it that is gain fit pi. So, so basically uh, gain is genetic, autoimmune, iatrogenic and neoplasm. This comes under the type 1 and uh, in type 2, functional infection, pituitary causes which is uh, which can be classified as functional, infectious or inflammatory and trauma and vascular causes and type 3 for ov ovarian, physiological, idiopathic and endocrine causes. This is, uh, come, as a, come as a new, this is, the, there is no clinical, uh, I mean this is mainly for defining the ovulatory disorders, not for diagnosis, I mean not for the management purpose as such. Is there any clinical uh, relevance in the outpatient, that classification? It's it's academic or will it also help? It, uh, the first three is uh, basically it is the anatomic uh, this thing, the, because it's not related to, to that uh, to the anatomic this thing. So it is uh, put, se that's why uh, PCOS is put uh, down separately. Yeah. Now it's very easy to quickly run through the acronyms and each sub to just quickly and uh, classify yeah. the patient. To the patient, so, it, uh, so finally to the patient, how, so it, does the it patient make... management remains the same. Okay, so this is only for your exam. Okay, for uh, when it comes to fibroid management, uh, in the realm of fibroids, it's management, lot of doubts and grays revolve around the area when it is uh, AUB submucosal type, especially when there is a concern regarding the fertility. Just uh, to put up on case scenario, Mrs. P, 33-year-old, P1L1, heavy menstrual bleeding for six months, planning for a second child, TVS shows type 2, 7 centimeter, anterior wall fibroid. Now, which is better when it is a submucosal fibroid, laparoscopic or open myomectomy? How do we choose which is better? Bina. See, uh, 
this answer i think we can answer in two ways one is what is the guidelines and if this patient has to come to us what will we do so the guidelines is always they say that there is definitely a gray zone but laparoscopic is moving in a big way and we say laparoscopy minimally invasive procedure wherever that it can be used is probably better than open surgery that is one statement second thing is also it always depends on the surgical expertise the type of the fibroid the extent of it so in this i think this is a type 2 submucosal fibroid so the extent of myometrial disruption which happens during the surgery and the surgical expertise the technique which is used for closure of that uh, dead space which is there now that is for the sir and why is it important because based on that is the mode of delivery because the end result what you are looking at is rupture uterus so the in theory if you look at literature they say only 1 to 0.3 percent is probably the chance of uterine rupture but again all of these even the Cochrane review and everything ends with the saying that the study has been inconclusive the uh, the strength of the study has not been adequate so why, why is it important for us to decide whether we are going to do a laparoscopic or is going to be open is basically for that surgical integrity of closing the myometrium so if this patient comes to us one is we will counsel her that probably lap is better but uh, also take a consent for an open surgery or a mini laparoscopy you no know, mini lap incision lap assisted myomectomy because in case while doing the surgery if there is a lot of a myometrial disruption or the endometrium is breached and we are not able to take that suture separately and there is some technical difficulty in creating that uh, occluding the dead space then it's probably better to err on the side of doing a mini lap incision uh, enucleate the fibroid and suture it by hand is probably what ma'am on a practical to note I know that you all are so concerned about it. We have stopped trusting uh, uh, operative findings. Anybody who's had a lap uh, myomectomy, we do a cesarean section, irrespective of what you say. So, I, I mean, uh, not everybody comes with notes like in CMC. Most people have a myomectomy done elsewhere. So, I don't think that should be your criteria anymore. You sh if you can take it laparoscopically, you should take it out laparoscopically. Yes, because what I the think. guidelines, what they say is, if there is increase in myometal disruption entering the my endometrial cavity, in those patients, it is probably better to treat that patient as a classical cesarean section. The way that you'll treat them as a classical cesarean section, make a note of it in the discharge summary and make sure, convey to the patient that it has to be an elective cesarean section at 36 or 37 weeks. But the same thing, if it was an intramural fibroid, you have not really disrupted the myometrium much, those sort of patients, we can give them a trial of labor, but like we will do for a previous cesarean section. Pedunculated subserosal, it can be dealt with like Again, a Again, on a pr practical note, when you uh, do these things, you are using cautery and also you don't know how much damage is done beyond what you are actually doing. And therefore, once you uh, engage in myomectomy laparoscopically, you have to say cesarean section. I do agree that um, that should not be the only cretin. I feel that the number of fibroids, the size of the fibroid and the expertise matter a lot. When they are very close to the endometrium, irrespective of what you do, you will enter the uh, cavity and therefore that may not really influence the um, uh, mode of delivery subsequently. So I think... Um, um, we do, there is a lot of emphasis and it's important for you to document where you enter the cavity or not. But having said that, I think the choice or the route of surgery should depend on the numbers, the size and the expertise thereof. I think this is one single fibroid 7 centimeter uh, definitely needs to be removed not because of this fertility but if she's got heavy bleeding it needs to be removed. Now whether you want to do lap versus open myomectomy it all depends on your expertise whether you do lap whether you do open type 2 you are going to open the endometrial cavity and when the endometrial cavity is open it becomes an indication for doing a cesarean section it really Irres doesn't matter how we irrespective of whether it is one fibroid or it is 10 fibroid the minute you enter the endometrial cavity you cannot assess the integrity of the scar during cesarean during labor and that becomes so the answer to your question is the patient can have either lap or an open depending on one single line answer the depending on the expertise. It's not laparoscopy but how well it has been sutured. Okay. Then moving on to the next question. What time of the menstrual cycle will you plan your surgery? Any guidelines or any reasons to that? Dr. Arti. Uh, regarding the timing, uh, okay. there are a lot of studies which uh, looked into the timing of the surgery like pre um, 
I mean, uh, post-menstrual uh, ovulatory time and uh, pre-menstrual also. But then uh, there is no statistical uh, st uh, significance which found that there is there would be a less blood loss uh, in any of the cycle if the, if the surgery is done in any of the phase of the cycle. So as such, there is no recommendation. But uh, I would say like if uh, we have to exclude pregnancy, better to do it in a post-menstrual face and the endometrium also will be looking thin in the post menstrual be hysteroscopy so, or laparoscopy basically because the endometrium is less thickened less uh, there thickened. will be less blood loss and uh, always you can exclude uh, pregnancy. pregnancy otherwise there are no cut and set guidelines to it okay dr minakshi if you wait for a patient saying that come after menstruation she will come from naruvi to cmc <laughs> or she'll come from cmc to naruvi so don't wait till her men only is try try to do it not during menstruation <laughs> Either it is premenstrual, postmenstrual does not it make a difference. Matter. Do it when she comes. Okay. Point taken, ma'am. Is there a role of post myomectomy menstrual suppression for better healing, Dr. Minakshi? There, there are no robust data saying that uh, we should give uh, OCPs for which aid in healing. But there are small trials which says. Uh, at least for short duration we can give because uh, you said the patient is trying for the next pregnancy. So she should not get pregnant immediately after surgery. So at least three to six months, three to six months of uh, 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 contraception and uh, moreover it helps in the clinical uh, improvement of the patient in hematological improvement like HB builds up and she will be prepared for the pregnancy in that way. Okay, endometrium not breached. Is it good enough criteria for trial of SCAR? Aruna, ma'am. As I already said that... It's already been If said. the endometrium yeah. is breached, I would do a cesarean section. If the endometrium is not breached, depends upon how much cautery you have used. Because cautery makes SCAR healing very inadequate and very... Uh, I mean, we are not very certain about it. So the more cautery you use, and if you are open the endometrial cavity, then I would do an elective cesarean section. Uh, because the time is short, we let's move on to the next question. GNRH uh, agonist, will you advise in type 1 or 2 fibroid in a woman seeking fertility with the risk of losing planes, especially since it's a submucosal fibroid? Will you use or you will not use? Abraham, sir. <laughs> Anybody? I think I will not use GnRH in any patient because it doesn't help in reducing the neither the vascularity though theoretically it is fine but practically if you give a GnRH to a patient who's got a submucous fibroid it will undergo degeneration it will undergo necrosis and middle of the night you will be called to the emergency saying that there's something coming out of the vagina so that happens and I have seen it so GnRH really doesn't make any change in the size the vascularity and the route of surgery if you're planning to in fibroids is what I feel. Just a doubt. If it was, a, she's a type one, a type two, even for a type one fibroid, or if it is a sub, for totally submucosal ones, see, suppose it's four or five centimeters, would we still prefer not? I mean, I was wondering whether for a hysteroscopic resection, would we? Yeah, I agree with that statement. I have seen. Uh, where is Alima? I, mean, I know that RMU used to. Um, give so, GnRH analog. I have personally sent patients to Dr. George. Um, if it is, say, a little more, 6, 7, I don't think you will reduce the size from 10 to 5, but if it is slightly larger, uh, they do give a GnRH analog to make a hysteroscopic resection uh, feasible. Turn a laparoscopy yeah. into hysteroscopy. Yes, that has been done several times. If you look at the stepwise classification, yeah, yeah. right, 7 centimeter you'll no. find that the score will be very high. very high and it is a very complex surgery so either you have alternative to doing a myomectomy but don't do a resection type one or yeah one and two you can attempt one you can definitely attempt hysteroscopic resection two you can give gnrh and attempt resection three you need to have an alternative yes ma'am um we say one year healing time for cesarean scars how long do we offer the rest time when we consider myomectomy, Aarti? Uh, again, there is no uh, set uh, recommendation uh, in any guide, any of the guidelines regarding the time, ma'am. But uh, three months minimum we should wait. There have been studies saying uh, looked at MRI uh, 
MRI and healing. So they say at least 12 weeks to three months should we should give for the healing of the scar. Gigi ma'am, would you like to add on something to this? We say one year of healing time for cesarean. How long would you advise for post myomectomy patient? No, no, no. I, I think there is no research and no, they can conceive when they can conceive. We want them to conceive. We'll do yes. section. Yeah. Yes, especially so in a... Is there a... Any literature says three months, Sarthi? There is the no, healing but time is three healing. months, yes. No, we yeah. would like to know how long we should wait for her to have yeah, pregnancy. Uh, I think it depends delivery. upon the age, man. Pregnancy. If, uh, elderly, if the patient is little elderly, hmm. uh, the ovarian reserve will come down. And the recurrence of fibroids. I don't know, are we thinking so much about ovarian reserve in one year or six months or three but months? definitely for... I don't think so. Ma'am, definitely. Yeah. 18 months. Electricity. Exactly. So, these are people who are, who are obviously infertile and they are yes. dying to have a baby. Then you say you wait for one more year. Yeah. So, just let them conceive. Yeah. <laughs> Next day, we say the studies have shown that MRI, all the studies have shown that uh, three months is good enough for uh, healing. So, for uh, the people who are seeking fertility faster, we don't have to really, really wait for that long. Okay. Allegolics, relugolics. I'm just wondering, does it like the placental placenta attachment because some problem? No, no, no. There's no definite evidence to it. No problem with and there's that. there's a scar. The endometrium heals within the next cycle. She's already shed, built everything. So there's no problem with the presentation there. There is no... We'll anyway do section. No need to worry. No, but we don't want an accretor, no? <laughs> Give them a big hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Thank you, Smita. You yeah. did a good job. Yeah. Well, well done. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our uh, A6 ward uh, staff have come to felicitate ma'am. I invite Sister Christy. Good afternoon to everyone. I thank God for giving this opportunity before stand us, stand you to say a few words about our uh, dearest ma'am. I would like to thank Dr. Anita also for giving this opportunity. Ma'am is a very cheerful and friendly person and she's a humble and, uh, and caring, shows motherly love towards us. She will be very strict, never compromise to our patient's care. She maintains professional dignity and she's a prayerful person and she always prays for her patient and spends extra time with them and giving counseling. And the example we uh, admitted with the long-term patients, Sultana, Sultana patients are there. And she were, we were uh, so privileged to take care of ma'am's mother who was admitted in A6 ward. She appreciated the care which was given by us. Ma'am always prepared to send her patients and her relatives to A6 ward for believing that we will be given, providing better care for them. Thank you for believing us, ma'am. She always appreciate our staff when she comes for rounds and also she corrects us in a positive manner when something is not done. She never hurts us by her words. She always enter to the ward like a butterfly with a colorful series and pleasant look. Whenever ma'am comes for rounds, after the rounds, if I am not there, my staff used to come and tell me ma'am came with this color sari like that. We will be missing that ma'am. And ma'am, we will miss you, motherly love. Although it, if you lease your kindness and hard work, attitude, the values whichever you taught us in our heart, heart forever. Thank you for being with us as a family member ma'am, as a teacher, as a well-wisher, as a boss and we will miss you. Actually, sir is our boss. In, we are in A6 ward. Dr. Chachandi was our boss for our uh, gastro and hepat. Once, Sir came for rounds after a retirement to see one alumni. 
and he asked one of us staff, you know me, like that, and he said, yeah, I know, you are uh, Dr. Rachel Chandi's husband. So, <laughs> Sarah felt a little bit, and, <laughs> but Rachel Chandi ma'am was very proud of it, that, so, <laughs> sorry sir, but we will still we will continue her in our heart. So ma'am, we will be missing you for lots ma'am. The motherly love and your characters in such a way, we have to give the best care for the patient. Always she prefer the patients given the best care when they are living by this ward, I mean this uh, institution, they have to remember us always. Thank you very much ma'am. Thank you. I call A6 what to come. We like to honor ma'am with the shawl and a token of love as a gift. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your contribution and for your love. I'd have to really thank A6 sisters. When my mother was ill with her malignancy, the last two weeks of her life she spent in A6 ward. And we were really, really blessed because they looked after her so perfectly. And that's why I sent all, all my patients to A6 ward only because I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I thank the sisters who came uh, timing with their break. I call upon the OPD staff to uh, felicitate ma'am. Thank you ma'am for giving this opportunity for A6 Ward. Invite the OPD staff. Okay. I'll invite the theater staff while the OPD staff are getting ready. Sister Sheba. Good afternoon, everyone. I thank God Almighty to given this opportunity uh, to felicitate about uh, Dr. Rachel. Uh, Rachel Mam is very close to us in the theatre. Whenever we are working together, Mam is very prayerful person. Uh, before the day itself, the day before or the week before, whenever there is a difficult case posted, Mam will give us the information. This patient is this condition. Please pray for them. So first request will come for the prayer only, Mam. Then any VIPs posted, any family members, any staff. Everything ma'am will give the details even one month before also many times. So it is easy for us to remember in our prayers as well as uh, to uh, uh, get ready for the staff who has to scrub all those things. Thank you very much ma'am. Then having the consent on the staff. Whenever they are becoming sick, no, ma'am will come immediately, sister, that uh, sometimes we may not uh, recognize that staff is sick, but ma'am will come, she will say, the staff is sick, why can't you send her for this area, that area, all those things she will have more concern, mainly about the uh, weight of the staff. Many times ma'am will come and tell me, you have to teach about the diet for your staff. <laughs> you have to tell them according to the age they they have to uh, how they have to do the exercise, what all the diet they have to take. Everything like a child, ma'am will uh, uh, have that consent on everyone in the theater. Whenever she comes, she will visit all of the staff. Whoever ma'am knows, no, mainly she will give importance to the seniors. So she will particularly she will go after her case. She will go and talk with them. She, uh, she will spend some time, even she is in busy uh, schedule, she will come and inquire the staff about their family members. Uh, recently, one of our clerk, um, she passed away. 
uh, actually that time uh, she moved to 2016 she from cbor she moved to main theater so i i didn't inform all the many gynae doctors those who are on that theater that day i informed but ma'am next day uh, after she hears that message she came and she was asking where is her family uh, all the details so why you didn't tell me it is uh, she when she was admitted in uh, ranipet campus uh, i could have visited so that much concerned uh, she had over the uh, all the staff even our housekeeping attendant and the hospital out housekeeping attendant everyone so that's um, very nice ma'am it's very encouragement for us uh, then ma'am always she will have a smiling face so that uh, smile itself we can uh, very all the many staff they were uh, so close they will express all their feelings and uh, thing the so it is very encouraged for us then for the during the assisting during the case time itself ma'am will ma'am comes in uh, some staff they will have fear in that time only she will get angry then after that soon after she come back she will have again uh, all the colleagues feeling and friendship feeling uh, then uh, we all will talk nicely so like that so every day uh, when we are seeing ma'am it's very encouraging uh, all your uh, uh, thing ma'am we are very thankful to having with you along with uh, in cb or family in this uh, occasion i continue to we continue to pray for your good health and uh, for your family thank you very much i request all theater staffs to come forward and uh, give honor to ma'am to say a few words about the theater when uh, my mother had her surgery they were all sitting outside we were sitting outside theater and we all got hot cups of coffee and every half an hour reports as what to what was happening in theater and when i went for my hysterectomy at least the whole theater was standing in the foyer as i came in my trolley not to say dr ruby arrived in the ward when before i reached the ward and the whole theater staff was standing in the foyer waiting for me to come in and i was so blessed and i really thank them for all their help in the difficult surgeries putting up with my tantrums and at the end of surgery i told you i told them a bad workman blames his tools so thank you very much sisters and thank you for all your my so opd staff pd nurses We have the OPD nurses. we invite the clinical assistants
It also happens to be uh, the clinical assistance day who very often start the history taking. So happy clinical assistance day to all of you. We uh, invite the MRO, MRO staff, M MRO and MRD staff. I'm a clinical assistants for many years in CMC. And I don't think I can manage my OPD without them because they do all the history taking and all the computer work, which I'm really bad at. I'll be typing the wrong things all the time. And when they're not there, I never finish my OPD. So thanks very much, very much for all of you. Thank you. Hopefully, I will gain one clinical assistant now. <laughs> we call the G4S staff. Call in the G4 West staff. So we'll, uh, this is Roja, MRO, okay, they'll come later. Okay, we'll start with the next panel discussion on adnexal masses. Invite uh, our uh, Askar. We invite Dr. Manisha, moderator, panelist uh, Dr. Swati, Dr. Anuja Abraham, Dr. Kavita, Dr. Santosh, and Dr. Alka. Please be, please come to the front. Go directly, go directly to the adnexal masses. Go directly to the adnexal masses. Close this. Where is the adnexal mass? Don't show me. Okay. Adenexal masses, no, no, not this. Adenexal masses, I told you, no? Which one? Let me come. Let me come. Let me come. Let me come. This one, yeah. Just open that. Forget this. Just open that, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Anita, Dr. Vinota, and team for giving us this uh, opportunity to be a part of this uh, occasion. Uh, um, so today, we will be discussing about adenexal masses in pregnancy. So uh, how we decided to do it was uh, do it through a series of, we have a couple of cases, and we would like to cover as many clinical aspects of it uh, uh, to be able to guide us to the clinical management as obstetricians when we come across and add an Excel mask during pregnancy. So I have got an uh, eminent panel of obstetricians and a gynecology or a gyne oncologist, Dr. Alka. So in the obstetricians team, we have Dr. Santosh Benjamin, Dr. Swati, Dr. Anuja, and Dr. Kavita. All of them serious senior obstetricians who see a lot of complex cases in the OGOPD. And I'm sure each one of them has come across a woman, a pregnant woman with an adenexal mask. So let's start with our first case for today. So 
Mrs. X, she is 24 years old. She's been married for the last seven years. Her obstetric score is she is a seventh gravita with one living issue and five abortions. Uh, as a part of evaluation for a bad obstetric history, she was found to have primary APLA, that is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. In the current pregnancy, she is nine weeks and six days pregnant and she has come for a routine antenatal checkup. Uh, presenting complaint, not really very a uh, lot of complaints, but off and on if you probe, she would say that there is some abdominal distension, which has been increasing and worsening over the last one year, but however, she didn't feel the need to get evaluated for the same. And of course, she said that after she became pregnant, she has been feeling a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of vomiting sensation as well, no significant family history. Uh, coming to her obstetric history, the first baby was in 2017. That baby was a term normal vaginal delivery, 2.3 kg boy baby. The baby had cleft lip and palate for which baby required surgical correction and she was very distressed about the fact that baby had uh, anomalies. Uh, the second pregnancy, 2018, because the first baby had some issues and baby required surgery, she decided to undergo vol voluntary termination of pregnancy. Following which she had uh, four pregnancies between 2019 to 2022, which all ended up having, uh, ended up in spontaneous miscarriages between six to eight weeks. And it was during the last, eval last miscarriage evaluation that she was found to have these antibodies. So this is a seventh pregnancy and she has been started on Ecosprin and Heparin. Now, uh, we were talking about clinical examination, so we did do a clinical examination. Uh, the abdomen appeared quite distended and actually we felt a firm mass which was occupying the abdomen which was around extending up to the epigastrium measuring around 15 into 10 centimeter. At this point of time the uterus was not palpable, we could not feel any other organs. Per speculum examination the cervix appeared normal. In a per vaginal examination a large mass was felt anterior to the uterus. The mass was mobile. Yes Lakshmi ma'am we did feel the groove sign which was present. Uterus was felt separately and it was bulky and soft. So we come to the ultrasound findings. Unfortunately, as obstetricians, we do resort to ultrasound to look for the fetal well-being. So what we found on ultrasound was a single live intrauterine pregnancy corresponding to the gestational age. And we also found a complex ovarian mass which was measuring around 17 into 18 centimeter in the left ovary and the right ovary was normal. Liver appeared normal, there was no ascites. So these are the scan findings. So we found a baby intrauterine pregnancy corresponding to around 10 weeks. And we did find a left solid ovarian mass which was measuring 17 into 18 centimeter with increased vascularity on 2D ultrasound. Uh, question number one to Dr. Santosh. What percentage of ovarian masses do you uh, think which are detected during pregnancy are likely to be malignant? The second question is, what are the two most common malignant neoplasms uh, that are seen in pregnancy? I just decided, oh, sorry, I was trying to escape with the mic. Um, so generally, although we're a tertiary center, so we might see a lot more, but the overall incidence of malignancy is, is low, 1% to 3%. Um, so what I'm trying to tell the postgraduates is most often it's going to be a benign mass. We have to look for signs that tell you that it might be malignant, but most often it's likely to be benign. Amongst the ones that are malignant, most often again, it'll either be an epithelial tumor in half the cases or germ cell, because the young age group that we see pregnancy, germ cell tumors are also there. Most often a mature cystic teratoma or a dermoid, often seen there. And again, advantage that we see is because the young population, those who are have malignancies, again, tend to be early stages and those could be either borderline or a very early stage. So we tend to get away with seeing women in early stages um, for the most part. Again, because we're a referral center, we do see more complex patients, but, but for the outset, I'd say they're not, as, not very common, and those that we see are either epithelial or germ cell tumors. Okay, so, uh, so we were thinking of a malignant tumor in this lady. So on ultrasound, uh, when we do an ultrasound examination of an ovarian mass, Dr. Swati, would you like to answer this? What do you think will make you suspect that this is probably not a benign lesion, it's probably a malignant lesion? So yes, we'll do some technology use, not only the clinical examination here, ultrasound. So what are the features we are going to see? First, size, then solid, solid areas, heterogeneous mass is there, then septation, internal septations will be there, it will be thick, 
then papillary excursions will be there. Then come to the Dopplers and increased vasculitity and presence of ascites. These are the features which will be suggestive of malignancy. Thank you. So as, as rightly said, some of the uh, findings which will make us suspect that it's a complex mass and not a benign tumor on an ultrasound would be these findings that I have enumerated and these have been taken from clinics in Ops and Gynae 2020. The size again debatable, some say 8 centimeter, some say 7 centimeter, but the other features, presence of solid areas, a heterogeneous appearance, present of, uh, presence of papillae, thick internal septations, irregular borders, uh, vascularity which is increased and a low resistive index on uh, color Doppler and presence of ascites would suggest a malignant, uh, probable malignancy. So Dr. Anuja, uh, having said that we are suspecting malignancy of the left ovarian uh, mass, what do you think we should do next in this patient? Since it's a large mass, you have already described it to be a 17 to 18 centimeter mass and it was looking solid in consistency on the ultrasound image over there. Uh, these large masses, we cannot be always sure they are arising from the ovary. So we need to do a, uh, an, an imaging. MRI is the safest in pregnancy because there is no risk of uh, radiation exposure. So we would suggest an MRI. It will confirm that it is arising from the ovary primarily. Then after that, it also characterizes whether it is solid cystic, whether it has cystic components, then the presence of nodes then whether there is ascites, whether there's minimal ascites, and it will tell you if there's any other deposits anywhere. So some amount of information, extra information, you will definitely get from an MRI. And for large masses, even if it is cystic, I would advise an MRI because there has been a case where we've gone in and the cyst was seen to be arising from the liver. So if the mass is very large, 15, 20 centimeters, an MRI is definitely indicated. Then since this is a solid mass that we saw on the ultrasound, and she's in the reproductive age group. Tumor markers, although their role, certain tumor markers are definitely elevated during pregnancy, we still, it still has a role because there are certain tumor markers that are not elevated. Some are elevated in the first trimester and depending on whether there are fetal anomalies or not. So we'll send off the tumor markers and ask for gynae oncology opinion as well. Okay. Um, so this lady is pregnant and we need to do the tumor markers. Dr. Kavita, can you highlight some of the challenges that come in interpretation of tumor markers during pregnancy? Is the mic not? So um, I would like to start with uh, the tumor markers of epithelial ovarian tumors because those are the uh, most frequent tumors in pregnancy. So uh, the first thing that would uh, that we would like to see is CA125, and CA125, as we know, it is uh, usually elevated in the first trimester of pregnancy because there is some secretion from the uterine endometrium. So, but in the second and third trimesters, actually, it comes back to the normal value. So it is not actually as much a gray, gray zone as we think, like it is not uh, absolutely useless. We can use it during the second and the third trimester uh, to look at um, uh, when, when we have a doubt about malignancy. The other tumor markers would be alpha fetoprotein and LDH, which we use uh, in, uh, for, to looking at, uh, for looking at uh, dysgeminomas. So these uh, both markers are borderline elevation will be there in normal pregnancy itself. Uh, but when there are ex uh, very high elevated levels, that in turn suggests is an, uh, that's a, another feature of malignancy. And uh, then there is the third, uh, fourth marker, which is inhibin, uh, which we use to characterize granulosa cell tumors. So inhibin is also showing a borderline elevation in uh, like uh, uh, preeclampsia patients and in uh, pregnancies with aneuploidies. So since it is a very rare tumor, granulosa cell tumor, um, maybe we can, um, uh, it's a, it is still a gray zone, like we don't have the exact statistics as to how it behaves in pregnancy. 
So as very rightly said, the interpretation of these uh, tumor markers can be very challenging in pregnancy, especially when we look at markers like AFP, which can be elevated if the baby has got certain anomalies like a neural tube defect or an omphalocele. And again, as we know, LDH is a marker for preeclampsia, eclampsia. So those, le uh, those uh, conditions, again, can lead to a rise in these markers. And of course, beta-HCG, which is used as one of the markers, also uh, is elevated, as we all know, will be markedly elevated because of pregnancy. CA-125 usually rises in early pregnancy, but thereafter plateaus. But one thing to remember about epithelial tumors is if you have an epithelial tumor, the CA-125 will be in the range of thousands, like 1,000, greater than 1,000 to 10,000, and usually that will be more suggestive of a uh, for a malignancy. So coming back to our patient, these are the results of these tumor markers. Dr. Santosh, would you like to comment on these tumor markers? Yeah, like we discussed earlier, the HCG is hard to interpret uh, because you know the ranges at this at this gestation could vary with so many other factors. So we can't really use that. Alpha fetoprotein, uh, generally our lab talks about the upper limit being, you know, close to two or three. So that is significantly elevated. And then the absence of an anomaly, which you would have looked for by this gestation, something gross, an exomphalos would be obvious. Mm -hmm. Even ural tube defects by this gestation, you know, we can make out early features of that. So if that is ruled out, um, that's again a significant value. LDH. Our lab has changed the cutoffs by chem from 2021. Changed the cutoffs so you have to make sure that you are you know the range for your own lab because oh. they used to take up to 460 as normal yes. earlier. Yes. And now the, the lab takes upper limit around 280, 290 as, as normal. So we need to know when they change that. Uh, given that this would you know in the old system it would be within normal, but with the new values that would would be elevated. C125 as Kavita also said. Hard to interpret. It's it's you know it's not in the thousands like you said. So that wouldn't give us any clue. CA here uh, would appears normal. So uh, to interpret the whole thing, AFP is definitely elevated. LDH is probably slightly elevated as well. Okay. So we have tumor markers which tells that CA 125 is mild to moderately increased in keeping with pregnancy. Both AFP and LDH LDH are elevated. Okay, so Dr. Swati, would you really want to do an MRI in this case? Is it safe to do MRI in pregnancy? Yes, MRI is safe in pregnancy. Only the contrast uh, gadonium not to be used. Second one is what is the role of MRI? Yes, whenever we are suspecting the malignancy, definitely it will tell us the type of lesion, what it, did it, what it is, and also the lymph nodes also will be able to know about. So MRI is to be advised for this. Okay, one important thing to remember, we should not use a contrast if we are doing MRI in a pregnant woman. Okay, so coming back to our images again, these are the MRI images of the case that we have at hand. So there was a huge abdominal pelvic mass showing areas of uh, central necrosis, and you can see the gravid uterus with the fetus behind uh, the, the mass. So coming to the MRI report, this is what the MRI report read. The left ovary was not seen separately, and there was a possibility of a malignant ovarian neoplasm, likely left ovarian origin. The right ovary was normal, and there were some lymph nodes seen, uh, lymph lymphangiectasia, which was seen from the left adenexa, extending up to the left retroperitoneal space, up to left renal hilum, with minimal fluid in the pouch of Douglas. Okay, now coming to our gynae -ong specialist, Dr. Alka. Uh, when would you like to operate on this lady? And could you briefly tell us what would you like to do at surgery? So from our evaluation, it very much looks like a malignant mass. There's a solid cystic mass with elevated tumor markers, mainly the AFP and LDH, which could hint towards a germ cell tumor. It's a 10 week pregnancy. So preferably I would wait for another two to three weeks at least so that we move towards the second trimester, which is safer. And it's definitely a precious pregnancy with the history of so many abortions. So yes, I would like to wait for a few weeks and then maybe proceed for an open surgery, a laparotomy frozen proceed. We'll take out the mask, send it for frozen and see what it's like. And if it's indicating a malignant status, then in that case, we would complete our staging procedure with uh, lymphadenectomy and omentectomy if required. Okay. So she was already 10 weeks. So you said you would like to wait for another two weeks, even if it is malignancy, you would like to wait for another two weeks. Okay. So this is the staging uh, procedure, laparotomy. You would like to take peritoneal washings, left salpingo oophorectomy, 
frozen section, omentectomy and lymph node sampling bar dissection based on whether they are enlarged or not. So a multidisciplinary meeting with, uh, was planned for this lady and she was planned for surgery and then she underwent uh, laparotomy, frozen proceed, left salpingophorectomy, omentectomy, mesenteric node biopsy, enlarged retroperitoneal nodal dissection at 12 weeks and three days gestation. gestation. So these are the intra findings. We can see the enlarged mesenteric lymph nodes that were there around four into five centimeter with involvement of jejunal blood vessels and another three into two centimeter over ileo, uh, ileo colony vessels as well. So this was the histopathology. The histopathology came back as germ cell tumor with predominant dysgerminoma with some small component of a yolk sac tumor. Uh, FIGO stage 1A, lymph vascular invasion was not identified. Although the lymph nodes were enlarged, they were free of tumor and it was reported as granulomatous inflammation. Omentum was free of tumor. So this was the final diagnosis for our lady now. She is 12 weeks pregnant with dysgerminoma and yolk sac tumor, FIGO stage 1A, with granulomatous inflammation of the mesenteric nodes, but they are free of tumor. Now coming to Dr. Alka again, will this re a woman require adjuvant chemotherapy? And if, you, if so, why? So if it would have been just a dysgerminoma stage 1A, so we could have avoided. But now it has a mixed component of a yolk sac tumor, which are usually associated with the worst prognosis. So yes, I would like to give adjuvant chemotherapy for this patient. Uh, maybe BEP regimen uh, would do. They are very chemosensitive tumors and they respond well with minimal side effects. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Anuja, this lady is quite anxious. She wants to terminate pregnancy. Do you think this pregnancy should be continued? She is very apprehensive. Now she has to receive chemotherapy also. Uh, if the pregnancy should continue or whether sh she should terminate because her previous child had anomalies, baby had cleft lip and palate and she is very anxious about chemotherapy leading to fetal anomalies. So how would you like to further counsel this lady now? As stated earlier, she is um, primary APLA syndrome and she's had recurrent abortions. In addition to that, right now she has a stage 1A uh, malignant neoplasm of the ovary. Now, um, we need to counsel her. The pregnancy theoretically can continue. There is no harm in continuing the pregnancy. Chemotherapy can be given in the second trimester. It has certain side effects. It can, I mean, chemotherapy can cause fetal growth restriction. We have to have a discussion with her and her family as to what she wants. What she wants has to be taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. We have to explain to her that because she's got primary APLA, she is already at risk of FGR preeclampsia and there can be an increased risk of stillbirth in her. She needs close monitoring for primary APLA per se. In addition to that, we are going to give her chemotherapy, the regimen that is advised by gynae oncology, and then the, and that she, has, she will be a high-risk pregnancy on close monitoring follow-up. If she decides to continue the pregnancy, the decision is up to her whether she needs to continue the pregnancy or not. If she does not want to, we can offer termination, but we can tell her that there have been reports of where pregnancy has been continued safely till term. And cleft lip and cleft palate is not, the previous cleft lip and cleft palate cannot be, I mean, we can identify this on a morphology scan. And those are correctable things. So we can advise her and counsel her in detail and the decision can be taken by her and her family together. Yeah, so as we were talking about shared decision making, so this uh, is also a very good example of how we should, uh, actually we uh, s made the patient and family sit down and talk. Dr. Vinota and myself, both of us were there during the counseling sessions. So the counseling that went was like this, that she will not need further surgery as it is stage 1A, stage 1A, and that uh, she would read uh, need three cycles of chemotherapy. Risk of adverse effects to chemotherapy is minimal. There's a small increased risk of FGR for which uh, this thing will be monitored. The fetal growth will be monitored. So she received her... Yes, ma'am. Is that why you're worried about the terror about the effect on the fetus? You're worried about... Uh, so but since you are second trimester... Yeah. No, if there is a worry, I want to know, is there a place of give, delaying the chemo? I just want to know. Is there a place of delaying the We brought it to the second trimester. We waited for two weeks and we started. 
we would advise her that would not be advisable because it's a rapidly yolk sac component. There is a yolk sac component as well, ma'am. And that so has that would more chance her, of yeah. peritoneal recurrence rather than other. other. So she received, so this is a quick follow-up of the case. She has received her first cycle of chemotherapy uh, with carboplatin and paclitaxel. And yesterday she came back for a morphology scan. She was visibly worried about the cleft lip and palate of all things. But we reassured her with normal pictures of a morphology scan and a fetal growth, which is corresponding to the gestational age. So learning points in this case, most malignant neoplasms, which are diagnosed during pregnancy or early stage, interpretation of tumor markers can be challenging, MRI is safe, surgery cover consists of staging, fertility sparing, with conservation of contralateral ovary if normal. Now coming quickly to case two, we have again a 24-year-old primary, married for one year, spontaneous conception, admitted in our ward at 14 weeks with hyperemesis. On ultrasound findings, she had a single life fetus corresponding to gestational age with a right at an XL mass and a left ovary which was normal, no other findings. So this is a fetus with 14 weeks and this was the mass which was around 13 into 8 centimeter. Dr. Santosh, would you like to characterize this mass and do you think this is benign, Dr. Kavita, do you think this is benign or malignant and what do you think are the differentials of this mass on scan? So this is an ultrasound picture which is showing a unilocalated mass, low level internal echoes, homogeneous appearance, so most likely to be a benign mass. It doesn't show any feature of malignancy as Dr. Swati had mentioned previously, no septations, no solid areas, no solid cystic uh, um, shifting, no papillary excrescences, no okay. vascularity. So what are the differentials you so would like to indicate? Differentials most probably will be a mucinous cyst or a hemorrhagic cyst or endometrioma. Okay. So hemorrhagic cyst would be your first differential considering she's 14 weeks and 2 days? But... Uh, she is uh, not having any severe. Yeah. yeah. Although the functional cysts do not persist beyond the first trimester, yeah. or sometimes they can persist up to 16 weeks. Okay. So these were the findings. These were the differentials we had in mind, most likely to be benign. Dr. Santosh, what are the most common benign ovarian cysts during pregnancy? And what are these complications? Even if they are benign, what are the other complications they can cause? Yeah, the most common ones we see are functional cysts that are there, or if all a corpus luteal cyst. Um, otherwise, you might often, you know, rarely see uh, endometri endometrioma or uh, rarely a mature cystic teratoma, which is a dermoid cyst. Complications most commonly what we see is torsion, uh, rupture often, they have pain, you don't realize it by the time they come, you know, it's hard, unless you knew she had a cyst, you might not even realize that it's ruptured, but torsion is something that's common, especially with dermoids, so you have a long pedicle, mm -hmm. it's light, it floats with the fat that's there, so when you have a dermoid, maybe note it down, she's got a dermoid, if she comes with acute abdomen, they should think of that first so that they don't you know, waste time trying to do further imaging at that point. If she's got a dermoid, it should come with acute pain, vomiting, think of torsion. Mass effect and labor obstruction, meaning we generally with benign tumors, we don't see it theoretically there. Mm -hmm. And obviously that malignant potential that we said, which is much lower down. So I would say torsion first and foremost to think of that, especially with the benign tumor. And remember, most most cysts that you see early on in pregnancy, by the time they come for the morphology scan, we don't even yes, see them. Yes. So we get the patients into a TZ, they're worried, they're thinking everything is going terrible. And by the time they come for the morpho, you know, they are often disappear. So all that is often not really worth worrying about. Yeah, so most common worry that we have is torsion, although the rate is just 0 to 7%. Most important thing to remember, usually happens when the uterus is growing big and coming out of the pelvis. So the second trimester is when you're really worried about it. The chance of having a torsion after 20 weeks is relatively much lower. Okay, are there any benign cysts which may appear complex masses in pregnancy, Dr. Swati? Yes. On ultrasound? Yes, yes. Whenever some debris are there, or whenever it looks like a dermoid cyst, or this are the dermoid cyst, endometrioma, what uh, Dr. Santos said, carpus luteal cyst with the hemorrhage, some debris are there, or it can be the fecal cyst. So these are the things which can appear like complex, complex cysts. Okay. Yeah, so these are some of the cysts which might have a complex looking appearance on ultrasound examination. Okay, what are the indications for doing surgery for benign ovarian masses, Dr. Anuja? For ovarian masses in general, when, when would you like to operate on these? Uh, benign ovarian masses, if the size of the cyst is very large, if it is more than 10 centimeters, or if there is a suspected torsion or a rupture of the cyst with peritonitic features when the patient presents with acute abdomen, or when you see a complex ovarian mass with features of malignancy, these would be the conditions. But a cyst that is identified as 10 centimeter in the first trimester, 
would like to repeat a scan in the second trimester, ensure that the cyst is not regressing in size uh, because majority of them regress and then decide for surgery. Yes. So very rightly said, persisting and more than 10 centimeter, complex ovarian mass, suspected torsion, suspected rupture leading to peritonitis. Okay. If you want to do a surgery in this case, Dr. Kavita, when would you like to do and quickly justify why would you want to do at that particular time? Which during which uh, part of pregnancy? We prefer to do it around in the second trimester, around uh, 15 to 20 weeks. By this time, placenta has already taken up the function of corpus luteum. So even if we disrupt the corpus luteum, the pregnancy is not going to uh, be aborted. Uh, the chances of spontaneous loss is less. Another thing is, uh, if you uh, want to give chemo or anesthetic agents during the surgery, it is not going to interfere with the organogenesis of the baby at, during this period. The organogenesis is all already over. And baby is remote from the period of viability also, so you are not blamed. Even if it goes into an abortion, uh, you don't have the, like, uh, baby, uh, you are not near to the viability of the baby. Another reason would be it is easy to um, manual your laparoscopic instruments when the uterus is around 14 to uh, 20 weeks size. Yeah. And, uh, laparoscopy would be the best for these patients. Yeah. So the, uh, the ideal time would be in the early part of the second trimester between 14 to 22 weeks. So Dr. Alka, coming back to you again, what surgery would you recommend in this patient? Please comment on laparoscopic versus laparotomy. One, one minute yes. on a practical note, it's very important to differentiate between endometriosis and others. Because endometriosis, you will never operate because it will never torn. And it's a nightmare of opening an endometriotic tube. And that's why it's very important to differentiate between an endometriotic tube in pregnancy and an ordinary MRI. Yes. Quite common. It's common. Yeah, but we also have uh, out, uh, overshot the time. Yeah, we're just finishing. And the size criteria, 10 centimeter, also we have to take into consideration. Like the, I mean, yeah. it's not always possible because sometimes 15 centimeter, 14, then can be an endometrioma. Hmm. Corpus yes. luteal cyst will usually disappear, ma'am, after the first trimester. Should not stay. So. Yeah, for maybe an MRI, can, they can always specify whether it is an MRI, uh, endometrioma or the other kind of cysts. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so we Alpha? have a large cyst in the second trimester. Looks benign, we'll do a laparoscopy, uh, excision, endobag retrieval, controlled aspiration without spillage, and maybe send it for a frozen if required. Sure. So this lady at 18 plus 2 weeks underwent a lap ovarian cystectomy. Histopath came back as mucinous cystadenoma. Pregnancy was ongoing, continued, labor induced at 37 weeks. She had a small baby. For FGR, she was induced, delivered a baby girl weighing 1.6 kgs. Okay, this the final question to all the obstetricians. What would you do if you were to incidentally discover an ovarian mass during LSES? Simple ovarian cyst, do the cystectomy. If it's the complex, call gynion. Call gynion. <laughs> After rupturing the cyst, how will you know if it's complex? <laughs> So complex okay. mass, always send a frozen, make sure, and then complete whatever you can, a salpingo If you if you are if you are lucky as we are, we can call the gynionk in spot to come and do the complete thing. Otherwise, close and refer to gynionk. Thank you so much. So these are the learning points that we have from uh, uh, from the benign ovarian mass. Uh, uh, just a quick word about the theme for today's CME, each one teach one. And I think Rachel Ma'am truly uh, is an example of a good teacher. And you would be very, uh, this thing about what are the caves that I have put here. Actually, this cave is supposed to be the best university in the world. And you would want to know why. This is a picture which has been taken from Robben Island in South Africa, where Dr. Rob Nelson Mandela was imprisoned for almost 27 years. And this is the lime quarry where they used to work. And they had a lot of inmates who were illiterates. And they had people like Dr. Mandela, who were political prisoners who were very well educated. So at the end of the day, they would meet in this cave. And each one took on a responsibility of teaching the other one. So with several years of teaching, what happened was the ones who were illiterate actually went on to become you know, university graduates. Some went on to become medical doctors. Some even went on to become lawyers. So let's not give up the profession of teaching. It's a noble profession. Thank you so much.
Thanks, Manisha. Uh, invite the uh, MRO staff to uh, felicitate, ma'am. The MRO staff, medical records. Also invite the office staff, the other OG office staffs. Yeah, ma'am, it is open. It is open. I kept it, ma'am. Thank, thank you. Next, I invite uh, my own teacher, Dr. Vinota Thomas, for the session on approach to an infertile patient with endometrial cancer. So, I call upon the panelists, Dr. Eliyama, Madam, Dr. Gigi Chandi, Madam, Dr. Lakshmi Shishadri, Ma'am, and Dr. Amy Jos. Thank you. Thank you. We hope to finish it in 20 minutes. Invite our panelists, Dr. Eliyama, Professor of Reproductive Medicine Unit, Dr. Gigi. Physician at, uh, in RMU and Department of Bioethics, Dr. Lakshmi Shishadri, a retired professor and favorite teacher. And uh, Amy and Mona, who have uh, graduated out of CMC. Amy is working in Nadayar, and Mona is working in Zyrus Cancer Center, Gujarat. So uh, the key objectives of this panel discussion is to look at the infertility specialist perspective and our gynae oncologist perspective. And the problem is, when you look at a recent publication in which emerged in 2022, when the cervical cancer rates are actually going down with the absence of screening and vaccination, I mean, but still a problem, might be probably because of the change in denominator. Look at the endometrial cancer risk, it's slowly climbing. And uh, unfortunately, we live in South India, where you see Bangalore, uh, Bangalore, Chennai, Kerala seem to be having the highest risk. Sorry, this is the wrong thing. So when you look at our own statistics, when we have 157 patients of endometrial cancer registered in an outpatient department, 12 of them were less than 40 years of age, support 7.64. 10 of them were operated, one had conservative management. Unfortunately, out of the 10, four had advanced disease. So when you look at endometrial cancer in the young, it's just not cancer and infertility alone. There's a social dimension to it. It's what the society might say. Very often, it's only the husband and wife who have come with the diagnosis of endometrial cancer, not anybody else. They might be just in the beginning of a relationship, beginning of a marriage, unstable relationships, partnerships. They don't have a bank balance. And they might, be own, they might, might have be on their own career trajectories. So we'll start with the first thing, epidemic of obesity in India. I mean, I'll ask Dr. Lakshmi, if you look at the statistics, the blue is 2005 and the red is 2015. Seems to be an epidemic right now. And uh, you've been here from 2005 to 15, and your CV slides say that you've been in rural, looking at rural women. And it's the same. 
whether it's urban or rural, the epidemic is slowly increasing. It's absolutely the same. And I think it is an epidemic that we need to actually worry about. Um, we did a uh, look at our women between ages of 30 and 50 in the area of Ranipet. Um, I did, the, we were just doing cervical cancer screening and I just thought that many of these women who are, this is astic acid test, many women who are coming in are really grossly obese. So then I thought, let me check everybody's BMI. So in addition to just doing a, a test, we also checked their height and weight and calculated BMI. Believe me, 60% uh, of them had a BMI of about 27. I'm not even talking about 25. So yes, it is an epidemic and it is an increasing one. In this, I'm talking about rural and semi-urban areas around Ranipet, and it can't be any different. And what is more, we see much, many more uh, girls with obesity, adolescents, just, uh, you know, just married between the ages of, say, even 15 and 30. If I ask Dr. Gigi, you probably had an obesity program in RMU. You would have gone through their diet. What have you seen different? over the ages. Yes, so this is a, a problem that we do encounter, especially with polycystic ovary problem, which they come to us for the reproductive medicine department to take care of their childlessness. So uh, through the younger age group also, as Dr. Lakshmi mentioned, the problems of uh, the diabetes and hypertension and all are there in the rural areas as well. So the, what they have a larger, I mean, higher body mass index that they have. When they come to us, you know, as all of us, find it difficult to accept the fact when somebody tells you that you are fat or obese. They find it difficult to accept. But we did find that the cup the carbohydrate in their diet was definitely high. And then we had to advise them as to how to go about through the weight reduction program. So if you are asking me about the incidence of, uh, no, of obesity. Reasons, dietary changes. The dietary genes, um, I think changes. they, the, the? Dietary change. Ch why, why is there so much of obesity? What why is there the so much of practices? Yeah, yeah, the practices that, they, I mean, the fast food definitely comes into play, whether they are from a higher uh, economic strata or a lower. The, through, the, through the years, definitely the, type, the lifestyle has changed a lot. So the parents, uh, I mean, if you're looking at the younger children or the adolescent, they are all trying to give them whatever everybody else has. So they needed a lot of advice in, in the type of dietary style that they had, they were already observing. And definitely, as I said before, the percentage of carbohydrate was very high. And the, the lifestyle of going out and eating in hotels, rather than having your home food, which will be definitely controlled by you know, the percentage of carbohydrate and uh, what should not be there, and fats will be controlled if they are having at home. So the lifestyle of going out and having food uh, to hotels was uh, did did uh, uh, have a role to play in their being uh, you know fat or obese. I think the model diet would be Dr. Rachel's lunchbox, which has got two helpings of millets instead of rice, and uh, her passion for Zumba, or probably Dr. Abraham's two and tablespoons of upma for breakfast. <laughs> well, or was it one tablespoon? Okay. I'm not sure. <laughs> Talking about the women in the rural areas, it is a rice, uh, which is subsidized and is almost free in the ration it's shop. It's free, 10 it's kilos free in per the month. Shop. And the vegetables and fruits being extremely expensive, millets doubly so. So if I tell them to eat vegetables, fruits and millets, expensive. they laugh at me. So there ends the whole story of council. Unfortunately, uh, we are in South India, whether you belong to Kerala or you belong to Andhra Pradesh, where the prevalence of uh, central obesity, where the we're not talking about absolute BMI. We're talking about waist circumference more than 80 centimeters. I wanted to check mine and my husband's. It's more than it's more than 50 percent. We're not talking about BMI. We're talking about waist circumference. Women more than 80 centimeters and men more than 95 centimeters. 
So we'll go on to quickly move on to our first case. We had a 34-year-old who came to us at the beginning of this year. She was referred from RMU. So she came from OG1 and then to R from RMU. In view of thickened endometrium, historically she had continuous bleeding per vagina for two months. Outside she was told to have molar pregnancy by thickened endometrium. She had chronic anovulation. Past history, she's been married for 11 years. She had a spontaneous abortion in uh, 2015. In 2016, she had, and since 2016, she's been having curettages every year for thick endometrium. In 2020, she was told to have endometrial hyperplasia. She had multiple cycles of OI, ovarian stimulation, uh, um, ovary, uh, ovarian stimulation and one cycle of IUI. And uh, she came with this ultrasound scan report with a hyperechoic lesion within the endometrium with internal cystic areas. On clinical examination, she had a BMI of 33.29. On clinical, ex on speculum, surprisingly, she had watery discharge. Uh, just on speculum examination, the uterus size could not be made out because of a habitus. Rectal examination parametrium was free. So this was her ultrasound scan. Uh, endometrial thickness of 2.9 centimeters, supposed to be 29 millimeters, far surpasses any of the criteria they described early. So I'll ask the audience, not our esteemed panelists, what should be done next? This is 34 chronic annulation, endometrial thickness of 2.9. Any register, resident? I'm glad. Please don't refer to them to us for endometrial biopsy. She had an endometrial biopsy of hyperplasia with atypia with focus suspicion of well differentiated endometrial carcinoma. This was her metabolic profile with a high cholesterol. So we'll move on to our oncologist. How will you evaluate for risk of how should she be further evaluated with this diagnosis? Amy, if you could take the question. She wants another child. Yes. So the diagnosis is uh, she is kind of a uh, case of metabolic syndrome, the basic underlying metabolic syndrome with the endometrial uh, hyperplasia, which have over the years been progressed to a well differentiated endometrial. So when we are carcinoma. thinking of conservative management, we are thinking what is her chance of progressing on conservative management? On conservative yes. management? This the particular patient or any other patient, when you have a diagnosis of endometrial cancer, before we offer them conservative management, we have to first look at that patient's risk, risk. of progression on conservative management. So it uh, for that, we need to know the clinical, radiological and uh, pathological uh, underlying risk to stratify. So the clinical risk underlying will be whether she has any genetic risk factor to have the cancer like uh, the possible Lynch syndrome one because early endometrial no family cancer history. Yes, family history is important. Second is uh, the pathological. The good uh, endometrial biopsy which is said it is a well differentiated endometrial. So only the grade one, the very low grade endometrial carcinomas can be given a chance of conservative management. So she fits in that also. Third is uh, an MRI, the radiological imaging which needs to know is there any myometrial invasion or any extra uterine diseases present. Fertility, uh, Dr. Elima, when yes. she has, yes, ma'am. Do you think, because, can you go back to that report? Um, it says endometrial hyperplasia with ATP and focus. This is endometrial biopsy. I would like to do an, a DNC before I proceed because there is a focus of suspicious well differentiated. Actually, I do not know whether a, there's anything. I more. had a good suspicion she had because that watery bloody discharge on clinical examination, I knew she had something more. Sure, yes. but is it well differentiated elsewhere? Is it focal? We yes, don't know. So I would like to do a DNC and confirm this diagnosis yeah. before I proceed with whether Agreed, I'm going to do cancer because I need to know the grade of the tumor. Most certainly. Great. Another one more question. Uh, with that ultrasound finding, uh, is it justified to do a hysteroscopy guided biopsy? We could have done hysteroscopy guided biopsy, but I think in January a hysteroscope was done. Down. <laughs> if it was working, you should have done. We could yes, have done. You should have. We could have done. We could very well like, have excluded a polyp also at the same time. Yes, hysteroscopy. Resection, just like T U R B T, is recommended. Uh, if you don't have, if you don't have hysteroscopy, it's better to cure it out whatever tumor is there. Agreed. Give the, Agreed. Yeah. If you remember, one of our outside diagnosis was molar pregnancy, and that's why we were very touchy. We went sent her for an urgent HCG just to make sure everything was right, 
and immediately in opd we did the people just to, we didn't we didn't think of cancer we just said let's get this sorted out actually when we gave her the diagnosis of this she went off the radar for one month so it's just not fertility and cancer there's a lot of uh, 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 players in the game uh in yama ma'am when you're talking about bmi and to, and fertility does it uh, so when you talk about conservative management and bmi how easy is it how difficult is it for these patients to immediately lose weight lose weight lose weight here uh, we have a diagnosis with ca and uh, endometrium most probably she will come to us after you have done a medical management and she is uh, in a she is regressed and she is coming to us for fertility treatment bmi 25 i will counsel her for weight reduction simultaneously but i will not wait on that yeah. okay now we have to counsel her how quick and how important is to uh, important it is to start a fertility treatment most probably she will be pcos and so one more thing that we will not start with a simple ovulation induction and waste time on uh, smaller treatment we will start counseling her that she need a, a treatment which will benefit her more like assisted reproductive technology and we should start it's difficult to talk about weight reduction before lunch so this was her mri <laughs> we'll coming we're we'll coming to that <laughs> the panelists probably you can decide sir lunch is open still so when we looked at the mrs we looked at two images this was the uh, growth and what you can actually see is it involving the cervical stroma and coming till the cervix and also involving the stroma uh this is the Cor yeah coronal view and the axial view and this is the thing the cervix so we didn't offer her conservative we counseled her repeatedly she went off the radar again and then came to us and uh, mona would you concur dissent she's got more than 50% myometrial invasion with probable cervical involvement so uh, definitely she doesn't fit in the criteria because the hyperplasia was there since 2020 and now it is uh, biopsy proven endometrial cancer with involving cervix cervical stoma so definitely conservative option is not for her and she should be counseled about uh, the proper surgical staging uh, whether open robotic or laparoscopically and yes if she is very much keen finances are not issue surrogacy then probably oocyte ret uh, retrieval is something we can offer which takes uh, if we uh, use short protocol that takes 10 15 days we can give her that much of chance if she is very much uh, keen on her own uh, child Okay, so we went back and forth, and in view of this progression risk of advanced disease, we told her, we're not even going to preserve your ovaries, we will take it all out. And true enough, this 34 year, year old lady had stage 3C1 disease with nodal involvement. So the take home message is these younger women often come to us with advanced disease because of delay in diagnosis. She's been going from place to place, place to place, and very often, sometimes we have to make the discretion repeating biopsy. Uh, with a lot of discretion because very often they just default you tell them come back for the biopsy they default then again you have to get the entire group to counsel They're, it's not easy so the second case sorry wanted to ask dr Gigi. very often we struggle with discussion discussing adoption in cancer survivors because uh, we don't know whom to refer to and uh, they have to go to google and it's not ha helpful at all what would you Advice. So you're asking me how yes, to counsel for adoption. 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 Yeah. Who Definitely. should they go to? What are the rules? Because they might be discriminated against because they have cancer. Yes. So first thing I would do, identify the couple. And I will have to discuss with uh, my HOD, Dr. Eliyama, as to how the health of the couple is going to be, of the lady, of course. And then you consider them as a couple. So because the adoption agencies look at one of the, the forms that they have to fill up is their health status. So that has, I have to find out from her how 
good she would be as a even if it, it is adopting children adopting uh, an adoptee you have to look after them because unless the health of the parents is very good they will not be considered to be given the adoptive child so once that i have got through that and dr liamma tells me no she is fine and she will be able to the prognosis is good and she's finished her treatment is it me or dr liamma dr liamma <laughs> no i'm i'm going to ask her about uh, yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, about uh, cancer. Yeah, prognosis. about the cancer patient. Yeah, yeah about uh, yeah the specialist as to how good the prognosis of the health of the uh, person is or the couple is how good they are. So in this Then case, advanced that, disease three C. So they have a higher chance of recurrence than stage one. Mm. So how long should she wait to be disease free? Usually, the most of the recurrences happen in first yeah. two years. So uh, is there an age limit before adoption? see we know that they first of all they have to be healthy enough in order to fulfill the specifications that the adoption agency says okay. so, so they may not be fulfilling that at so all so can i wait till 36 when she is 36 because most recurrences happen the first two years 50% of them can recur in the that first you'll have to decide i think okay when, so when exactly will the remission happen when the recurrence will happen will they be um, uh, be able to look after a family look after children Okay. So I think that that decision has to come from you, and once you decide that they are able to uh, foster, I mean, foster adopt children, then only you should send it to the adoption counselor. Okay. So they actually the decision is yours, okay. because once they come to us, it will be the process of how to go through the adoption. CARA agency, the adoption agency, how to go about it. and because it's a long process it used to be when i started 15 20 years back uh, counseling for adoption it used to be within 10 months to 1 year now i believe it is 2 to 3 years by the time you get a child of late we are seeing a lot of young cancer survivors and that is something we really have to explore we'll quickly go to the case, second case monica is warning me from there this is a 31 year old nurse with primary infertility for 2 years she had regular cycles and during evaluation of infertility she was told to have well differentiated endometrioid carcinoma on a cervical polyp she is married for 2 years to another nurse with no comorbidities family history mother had breast cancer 60 at 62 years of age her maternal grandmother had uh, colon cancer 96 years of age another cousin had breast cancer all on the mother's side on clinical examination child bmi of 29.6 rest of them were unremarkable and uh, this was the ultrasound uh, mri endometrial biopsy reviewed over here was moderate differentiated endometrial carcinoma her metabolic profile was normal in, in the local hospital so it is just a polyp this was before covid before we had better understanding of hysteroscopic resection i'll ask amy what can we offer patients with possible genetic predisposition with the genetic predisposition we should counsel her like going for a conservative management is risky that uh, she herself has a high risk of uh, having the malignant serous the progression i um, mean the su surgical treatment is the de the definitive treatment for the malignancy which she has to go for okay so one thing MS what we can offer is on the biopsy is look for microsatellite instability MSI which test. looks which kind gives of you a, a, a small clue whether she might have a lin syndrome and we need to discuss them case by case fortunately this woman didn't have uterine cancer and breast cancer and colon cancer usually don't fit in don't fit in unless they have cowden syndrome or one of those and uh, the thing is they have a different molecular mechanism by which they have cancer and they might not respond to our usual uh, hormonal therapy mona treatment options for this particular patient again i will repeat if it was just a pipal biopsy i would like to do hysteroscopy uh, directed biopsy or resection of the polyp completely and assess of course that it's just a lower uterine segment uh, involvement and how's the uh, disease state the status so mri definitely uh, uh, says it is a 1a but grade 2 so we have to have a proper biopsy and reconfirm whether which grade it is and of course msi is something we would like to do for her and uh, yes uh, she can be offered because she is just 31 
even if she fits in like lin syndrome and all we can still give her chance for yeah uh, and we can still give this even without doing erpr testing on the tumor because we expect it so we gave her a chance you can yes so histoscopic resection is similar to turbt where you take uh, endometrium along with margin a margin on the side and the below with the myometrium so we can also the assess myometrial margin and enough depth basically and we have to reassess them after 3 to 6 months and conservative management with iuc i uh, lng iud and oral magistral combination every 3 months reassessment with biopsy uh, of course and the merina can be left in c2 but the repeat biopsy has to be done every 3 months yeah once consecutive two biopsies are negative then only she can be offered for the art so we can assess myometrial progression with ultrasound scan good transvaginal ultrasound scan or mri so she was started on metroxyl progesterone acetate yes ma'am would you prefer lng ius plus um, oral progesterone or would you prefer one of the two oral progesterone the reason i am asking is there's a lot of uh, uh, poor compliance that you see because of the high dose and the number of tablets that they have to follow whereas if you have an lng ius and then add one of the oral progesterones the compliance is much better and at least some progesterone is definitely there and for sure what is your so we don't have randomized don't have, control trials we don't have uh, rcts we have some uh, retrospective studies and meta analysis which has supported that combined modality is better in term of uh, uh, regression complete regression and of course the compliance as you men mentioned she may not be popping tablets regularly but the IUS, iud is there so combination is always preferred the other thing we have found is with magistrol within 3 months they come back with 8 kilos weight gain because it causes retention we are trying to ask them to lose weight and they come back with weight gain because of magistrol magistrol is okay it's etmg right. per tablet so it's if you do 160 is one in the morning and one in the night so it's not as much Uh, no, so not so many pills to pop it as uh, metroxyprogesterone amy yes. so even just putting in... two merinas inside like oh my goodness i have not tried that <laughs> i will put two merinas inside i have not tried that ravi <laughs> sir we'll try it in your next thesis <laughs> so i had uh, three patients in the last two years who had uh, fit into the conservative treatment options so the first two patients uh, we gave the oral tablet along with uh, after the three months uh, because it was persistent we added on the iucd uh, but to the notice that after the fourth month she had a very bad uh, hypercholesterolemia the cholesterol profile was very bad and uh, the iucd uh, was causing on and off spotting also with the irregular uh, hormonal intake and with the iucd in situ the complaints was very bad uh but the third patient who came she herself initially itself she had a abnormal uh, lipid profile so we couldn't start her on uh, oral uh, magistral or uh, this thing and she was very much keen on uh, conservative so she we had put only an iucd telling the risk we have just put an iucd and to the surprise she didn't have any spotting in between and uh, she was very compliant and the third month biopsy has shown it is uh, reverted it's only progesterone changes this is now rct which is not yet proved but i think uh, now the uh, move, move is me being on to reducing the oral tablet and moving more on to the local uh, treatment yes yes we can offer the even with metformin uh, even along with metformin along. also we can hysteroscopic resection with iucd is being taken care and yeah. so this is one success story though uh, she required uh, two ivfs fourth frozen cycle i mean this is a case of uh, determination of the patient persistence by the uh, rmu team and her faith in god she had two ch uh, she had a twin pregnancy though she delivered at uh, 27 weeks babies were well uh, this was the question that dr lakshmi wanted to ask you how do you modify treatment uh, ivf protocols for these patients so whenever we see whenever we see endometrial malignancy uh, so she has come to us when she is regressed the disease whether it is atypia or uh, malignancy so uh, the main thing is we choose the protocol where there is estrogen level during the controlled ovarian stimulation should not go very high so there are various protocols recommended like can give minimal stimulation protocol 
or can be when we can add letrozole with gonadotrophins. Letrozole is an aromatase inhibitor. So when we give letrozole with gonadotrophins, the estradiol levels are uh, better than the other plain gonadotrophin stimulation. Then antagonist protocol where there are also low, low levels of uh, estradiol levels. So for this patient, specific patient, I just want, so we started with first cycle of IVF first with letrozole with gonadotrophin and antagonist protocol to prevent the premature LH surge. So what we faced that it was the yield of the oocytes were less. So we got hardly two or three oocytes and we did a fresh transfer and it was a negative outcome. So then the aim is that we should have Without losing much time, we should have a stimulation protocol where we will have a good yield of uh, oocytes and good quality of embryos where we can choose more embryos and the success rate implantation rate goes up. So the next protocol we uh, choose to be a different protocol where we will have a prolonged stimulation, increase the dose little higher up and uh, we had a good yield and uh, a good number of uh, uh, good number of embryos were available. But then, because there is a high level of estradiol, we couldn't do a fresh embryo transfer. So we chose to do a frozen embryo transfer. Every time challenge is there, time is going. So when we see for this patient, the time from the regression of the disease to the pregnancy was, I think, around two years. And in between, uh, we have done follow up ultrasound scan, endometrial thickness, and uh, uh, it was all ne never worrying. Otherwise, we were all prepared to, we should do a papal biopsy and confirm that there is no recurrence of the disease. So frozen embryo transfer, again, challenge come. We have to give a uh, HRT, hormone replacement therapy. Hormone replacement, give a high dose of estradiol, uh, and then add on progesterone for uh, endometrial receptivity and do an embryo transfer. Two frozen embryo transfer because of the uh, this type of protocol, she didn't conceive. So the challenge when we do this group of patient, always implantation rate is less compared to the other group of patient. One might be because of the disease process. Second might be because of a high dose of progesterone exposure for a longer time decreases the endometrial receptivity. Third might be because of repeated uh, curettage, endometrial biopsy, all this also damages the endometrium and de decreases the uh, implantation rate. Then for this patient, we plan that we will do a modified natural uh, frozen embryo transfer protocol. That is like we stimulated her and so the endometrium is little better. Always estrogen is required for a better endometrial receptivity. So again, we stimulated her, given a letrozole, result, very small dose of gonadotrophin to have a good endometrium. And by God's grace, that cycle she was conceived and it was a twin pregnancy. May I, do we have time? So usually in our practice, what we do is we usually do frozen embryo cycle. Only problem comes is my uh, infertility consultant will ask me, I'm going to give six to eight milligram of progesterone minimum to prepare her endometrium. And we've seen with that, it doesn't get ready because of that chronic prolonged progesterone. So endometrium doesn't get uh, ready with even such high dose of estrogen. And my infertility consultant asks me to put on paper that uh, it is safe to give 8 milligram of, of uh, pro, uh, estrogen daily to prepare endometrium for at least 15-20 days, which is a big trouble. So this patient was supported by Rachel, ma'am, all through the way, all through the two years, and all the photographs of the babies were provided, ma'am. Ma she took an informed decision for surgery in view of family history. She was amenorrheic even six months after LSES. And uh, she had laparoscopic hysterectomy. It showed a residual one centimeter growth, and that showed focal endometrial hyperplasia with atypia. Besides residual reaction, on that atypia, we tried to do MMR, and she was proficient. Her she's planned for uh, she has banked her blood for DNA testing. So, in conclusion, endometrial cancer and obesity are growing problems. Our youngest patient with endometrial cancer was 24 years. She was a staff dependent. And treatment for cancer must be individualized. Desire for fertility should be balanced with cancer-specific survival. Recourse early to multidisciplinary treatment. And uh, with so much of molecular testing, we can incorporate that to um, restratify them. Thank you. Thank you so much. A break for lunch. Um,
a sincere apologies that we are running late. So if we cooperate, we'll shorten our lunch break and come back at the earliest. Shall we say 20 minutes lunch break? 10. Dr. Lily wants to give 10. Oh. <laughs> uh, so 20 minutes. Uh, and we also request everybody to please stay back. There's photographs. We want you all in the photos. That's at tea time. Thank you. Thank you all for this morning sessions. <laughs> This one, Amma, Amma. Folder, one man, one man, folder.
the cornelia cartic, the iota clam, which we call the iota, have the uterus delivered outside. And there you can see uh, the cornelia cartic.
teachers and uh, all who have taught not only by words but by their example whether it is uh, skill of communication or whether it is skill of uh, clinical examination or the skill of uh, tender patient care everything we learn from our teachers and uh, thank you for uh, the our institution where it is uh, been an example for many uh, and uh, I'm also one of the privileged student of here. So here I would like to uh, uh, mention here this in obstetrics, uh, it's very difficult to break the bad news because most of our patients are happy patients and after a happy delivery, everybody wants to have a big smile, share sweets, but in the midst of this, sometime we may have to share the bad news. So it is most of the time we encounter sharing good news to the family and the concerned person. But in between, we have to have a uh, sharing the bad news. I just share one uh, recently uh, encountered situation. Uh, she is a 21 year prime gravida at term. She got admitted in early labor. After 48 hours, she had PROM while she was in uh, labor room and she had uh, induced with oxytocin. After 12 hours, she entered active labor, subsequently reached full dilatation in 5 hours. At that time, she had breathlessness, posted for LSES, baby was delivered with low APGAR. Unfortunately, the baby uh, had an END on day 3. So the medical team need to tell the bad news to the patient and the relative. It was very heartbreaking to share this news with the family. Uh, but at the end of the process, we also came to know which really made uh, the team uh, much more into sorrow because the patient lost her parents when she was very young and the husband who serves in, in Indian Army left for work 15 days after their marriage reached recent, recently for delivery going back soon after the process of delivery. So we come across this kind of situation in obstetrics where we have to share Unlike most of our uh, patients who, uh, especially in uh, uh, department sharing or caring for cancer patients like gynae oncology, where uh, the bad news is quite common to share, but uh, it's unlikely in obstetrics. So when we, uh, what is the bad news? So any information that can have serious adverse impact on an individual life and their future also have indirect effect on the immediate family, not only family and patient, but also it affects on the society at a large. In obstetrics, we have uh, many reasons for uh, having a bad news. It can be natural uh, complications or it can be a man-made errors uh, but we can't clearly differentiate both but our clinical examination and clinical acumen can uh, can uh, put uh, maybe PIH, APH, PPH, pregnancy loss as more towards natural complication even though there may be man-made errors add to it Likewise, there are many man-made errors, uh, but not to, for, totally, I can't say it is man-made. There are some natural factors also been involved in that, something like sepsis, medical errors. It can be an error of execution or error of uh, planning and an adverse event uh, out of an uh, adverse medications. So we can see a, a picture of here. Uh, it's a cord prolapse. I just want to ask the PGs whether it is natural complication or a man-made error. So sometimes we may have to uh, encounter both can be there. So whatever the reason, whether it is a natural complication or a man-made errors, we need to address this uh, to the patient. 
we all remember the worst event in obstetrician society which happened a uh, year back dr archana sharma from rajasthan hung herself inside a room of a hospital after facing an allegation of a medical negligence and murder charges following a death of a patient who had pph so bad news are common in medical practice as also in obstetrics but there is a good way of conveying the bad news when it is conveyed correctly and empathetically it has a good effect so it strengthens the doctor patient relationship for a longer period give a medical team an opportunity to share hope for the future and life lessons are learned both uh, by the performer as well as by the listener so breaking bad news affect both the listener and the performer so here we have to remember that uh, we have to follow the ethical uh, practice in uh, breaking the bad news in most of our uh, clinical practices we remember that uh, there are six basic principles of ethic ethical practice the same thing has to be followed even in breaking the bad news respecting patient's dignity respecting patient's privacy do no harm be non judgmental be truthful and be sincere i know it's certain uh, factors are very difficult but even though if it is difficult still we have to follow these basic principles in an obstetric scenario need to be dealt with an extra care because it involves two lives the bonding to the baby occurs from the day of confirmation of the pregnancy so any difficulty even if it is a early pregnancy loss the patient take it uh, very sensitively so we have to uh, have this understanding morbidity and mortality is not accepted by the family as most of our patients are very young and they have a long uh, future to go so there are certain situation where uh, we encounter uh, breaking the bad news a certain maternal condition and certain fetal conditions maternal conditions like maternal mortality we have to uh, face the family after the loss of a mother following a delivery or following an antenatal complication uh, an unexpected uh, hysterectomy which is done in an obstetric patient icu and prolonged stay in the hospital uh, brain death inability to conceive especially in an infertile patient and even blood report of uh, hiv because it has a so much of uh, social implications in a fetal conditions like uh, fetal mortality severe asphyxia uh, congenital malformation and uh, chromosomal anomaly when we are discussing about this with the family so what are uh, the goals of bbn the breaking bad news is often shortened with bbn so what are our goals there are four goals of uh, uh, breaking the bad news collecting the information from the patient because we already discussed that patient is a partner in uh, the medical care so we have to collect the information what they have already know uh, and transmitting the medical knowledge from a clinician to the patient and after doing this providing the support for the patient uh, in planning the future care and developing a strategy for future treatment along with the patient and the family so keeping this goal in mind uh, uh, we have to see is it an easy job so most of us will admit that uh, it's very difficult but it is important uh, because it is a stressful task we all most of the seniors have an experience of uh, breaking the bad news in the clinical scenarios so we all know it is a very stressful and uh, emotional moment even for us uh, most of the time patient wants the truth but sometimes we, we we may not be able to expose the full truth to to them uh, there are many ethical and uh, legal imperatives of uh, telling the bad news 
and of course the clinical outcome whether it could be a physical uh, bad outcome or physical uh, or it's psychological outcome there are many barriers for breaking the bad news there was one uh, asco's survey which uh, where uh, 700 patients were participating and in that 55 percent of them they admitted that the barrier the main barrier is how to be harnessed with the patient and not destroy the hope. 25% uh, of them told that dealing with the patient's emotion was the greatest barrier. Only 10% of them told finding the right amount of time was a problem. So the same survey told uh, re revealed less than 10% of them responded had any formal training in breaking the bad news and only 32% of them had an opportunity during their training to observe interviews where bad news were delivered uh, probably by the seniors. So definitely it has a barrier. So to aid uh, uh, this uh, person by name Bale, in 2000 they have brought this uh, uh, spike model which almost included all the goals of breaking the bad news. So we have to set up an uh, interview. So the setting, I will go through uh, each uh, in little detail. So it is a spike model, S, setting up the interview, assessing the patient's perception, obtaining patient's invitation, giving knowledge and information to the patient, addressing emotions empathetically and summarizing. So setting up the interview. So we should make sure that uh, we need a, uh, we need to discuss with in a private private room or in a privacy room. Uh, we need at least two or three immediate family members accompanying uh, while we are breaking the bad news. We should inform them in advance that the team of doctors are coming to uh, tell about the bad news. So the patients and the relatives be prepared to receive a bad news. A senior member of the team should address. It should not be left alone to a junior person, even though the junior person are involved. One or two junior person can accompany the senior so that they'll be able, it is a learning process for them. And we should definitely allot an adequate time to spend. We don't know what is adequate time. Some patients may take half an hour. Some patient may take even more than two hours. So as a clinician, we should be able to allot that time. So all the uh, unnecessary disturbances has to be avoided during that time, including our mobiles, emergency calls. That should be uh, handled by an another team of people. So the second is P. So we have to know what is the patient's perception. We have to assess patient's perception. So it's good to know what she has understood already. So we can just go through the events which she has already gone through uh, slowly. So whether she knows anything about what has happened, whether the family has understood. So it, it, we can't assume that the patient and the family has already understood. Uh, and uh, to know what they have already know or what they are expecting. Uh, and we can ask few questions like, is there anything they are afraid to hear? Is there anything they want to know? Uh, could they tell me what happened uh, so far? Or is there anything they are worried about? So it can be an open-ended questions so that it, uh, it uh, initiates the patient's uh, uh, op uh, patient or family uh, can open up and uh, thereby we understand what they have already understood. Uh, <coughs> the, the third thing is uh, invitation to ask questions. So we should not bombard with information to the patients. We have to give opportunity to talk about their health condition. So as we have asked a few questions in the previous uh, uh, previous setting so we have to ask them invite them whether they want to and whether they want to know about their condition so 
in that way the patient will be able to uh, 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 able to perceive what the information you are going to tell otherwise it's a very shock condition even though if you give very important information she will not take it to her, the, her heart so it's always uh, uh, it, it is always helpful to ask the patient to uh, ask the question and uh, even if they are not asking the question now it gives an opportunity for them at a later date they can ask the questions most of the time patient will not ask or the family will not ask any question which they have in mind but after uh, two weeks or after one month they will come and ask so when we are giving this opportunity they are feel free to ask even at a later date and uh, most of the questions which they ask you may not be able to answer most of the time they'll ask why me why so many people are there? Why am I having this problem? So we have to, uh, we, uh, we, even though we, if we don't have answer, but still we have to patiently listen to that questions. So sharing the knowledge is very important. So uh, whatever the event has happened, uh, so we have to slowly tell them, uh, maybe in a small spells and uh, use simple language and most of the medical terminologies has to be converted into a simple no, a simple uh, terms so that they'll be able to understand and with each sentences so give a small pause so that they'll be able to grasp and also a time for question can be given and no false information has to be given to them deal with uh, empathy approach them sit close to them uh, when they are crying just uh, give a time, make a, uh, put your hand on their shoulder and uh, give some pause. So they sh it's not the, uh, how, what information you are passing on. It is how we are passing on the information will have a long lasting effect on them. So finally, make a summary. So it all takes all the misconception both from the clinician side as well as from the patient side. It relieves patients' anxiety. It gives time for future discussion and uh, always end with hopeful statements. And of course, record all the events and all the proceedings. Uh, communicating the medical error will become a very big challenge. Uh, here, the clinician need to deal his own emotions strongly before breaking the bad news. And of course, all the uh, strategies which are uh, spoken before has to be followed in this uh, uh, setting also. Uh, prayer preparation is very important even before the, uh, uh, the event occurs. There are certain opportunities for us to be prepared, both clinician as well as the patient. Sharing the risk involved in a procedure, prayer, uh, to the patient and keeping them in the same page is important. Clinicians' discretion to tell how much uh, they can reveal because uh, we know in a normal delivery consent, even a maternal death is being mentioned. But we can't elaborate on a maternal death in a normal delivery consent. Uh, but definitely explaining the consent and allowing them to ask doubts so all these will priorly prepare the patient for any adverse. So this is my last slide, Dr. Vinota. So there are a lot of opportunities. Don't wait for the bad, uh, uh, don't wait for the uh, bad news uh, to be delivered by your turn. There are a lot of opportunities, simulation-based learning. It should be from undergraduate to postgraduate. Uh, direct observation of uh, how uh, this has been delivered and also lesson learned from the past will help us to refine our uh, future events. And uh, yes, it is a very difficult communication, but learning the art helps in mastering the skill. So thank you for listening. And uh, uh, I just want uh, to thank uh, uh, Dr. Rachel Ma'am for being an example not only as a clinician, but also a, a soft skill person. So I appreciate uh, the so much of uh, communication that you have uh, verbalized.
non verbalized to uh, most of our uh, your juniors thank you ma'am Thank you, ma'am, for that insightful talk. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Lily Vargas, we are all familiar. Lily, ma'am, uh, she's our HOD and uh, the unit head of OG2, who is uh, specialized in urogynecology and her wonderful surgical skills. Uh, ma'am will be giving us a next talk. Thank you very much, Veena. Uh, because everybody has spoken about the art of communication, and this talk, what we are going to have, is on the art of communication. So. I said, since everybody is so serious and it's the afternoon, we don't need more academics. So I'm going to it in a very light-hearted manner. I'm, I've taken random jokes off the net. I don't know who these various people are. And we'll see how it commun how it. OK, so. And so my topic was when in soup. OK, so I said. Huh, interesting topic. Now, this was my topic which was given to me, when in soup. Okay, it's not very pleasant for the ingredients inside. But of course, we don't need to add tadka to our soup and make our own situation worse. So, this whole episode, session is about how do we approach the situations when we are in real trouble and, uh, and let's deal with it in a happy manner. Let's enjoy our talk. Before we land in professional soup, the whole point is learning and preparing. You don't go to a swimming pool, jump in at the deep end without preparing to swim. So preparing to swim in your professional waters is a very important part of your profession. And that means invariably bad news and jumping into the hot soup is a part of our profession. So how do we enjoy the ride? Our ride is not just, unfortunately, most of us think post-graduation is only about hard skills. It is, that is only a very small segment. Actually, it is more about soft skills, how you deal with your patients. And the good news is, these things will, you will continue learning it over time. You will continue to learn these skills over time, provided you're willing to teach yourself and be observant. Now, hard skills we all know about, diagnosing, writing, giving prescriptions, etc. PGs, particularly in CMC, need another set of hard skills, which is typing speed, medical terminology from various departments with all shops, funny, funny short forms coming at you, and familiarization with hospital setup. First six months is depressing because these, this is the area which really gets you. Now, what about soft skills? Everybody has spoken about soft skills, but we, we cannot overemphasize this. Actually, I always in my unit meeting say, look, I'm just trying to drive the bus and make sure all of y'all are not jumping out of it at various points in time. So please decide to take this ride with me. And we are all working towards a common vision and towards a common goal. It's very important to have teamwork. I don't know if you can see the pointer, to have teamwork and a common vision and goal, which is why when we spoke to the postgraduates, we introduced them to the vision and the mission. And very often, though we are supposed to be angels of light, this is how we come into the OPD in the morning. You know, we are stressed, and not just stressed, we are distressed, okay, because there are system issues, mainly for us a lot of system issues, overstretched system, shortage of staff, managing horrendous expectations, long waiting times. No, uh, you know, no canteen area, no restrooms. Then on top of it, we are multitasking, innumerable phone calls, multiple languages to communicate with two patients at the same time. All these things, I think we've all been through all these things. However, the parents are, Patients are also going through their own difficulties, and this is very important perspective. We need to keep in our view that they are coming with their with the stresses, and none of them are there for a disco. 
all of them are there whether real or imagined by discharge pv or low back pain they are there because they feel they just need a checkup many of them are just cancerophobic which they don't talk about many of them just have sexual issues which they are un afraid to bring up and unless we address those issues so this is the worm how does the worm look happy in front of the doctor who looks like that big shark who are sitting down there looking at them very clinically, assessing them, sizing them up. How do we develop this happy relationship? Because this is what helps us out when we are in soup. Remember, the patient goes through enormous obstacles to get to sit down for that 15 minutes, so-called 15 minutes. In actuality, it's five minutes, maybe even three minutes. Okay, okay, okay. And like this red ring, there are a lot of faceless people who are rude, they are having language problems, monetary problems, cannot get an appointment. When they finally come to the center point, which is you, you are the only person with a face and a name to them. And very often when they are irritated, it's not particularly targeted at you. So sometimes we just have to take the time to sit down, calm them down and ask them what is the matter. Of course, we heard all about, you know, about the various talks about how we keep a patient-centric focus. However, they're not just ABC in resuscitation of patient, they're ABCs in our professional etiquette. How we appear, how we look, whether we look approachable, whether we look pleasant, or whether we come in in a combative state of mind. I know I have done that on some days, when I'm already irritated when I enter the OPD, and I know that that entire day goes downhill. I've learned from my own mistakes, many mistakes I've learned over the years. Of course, communication, very, very important. And that's the whole point, avoid medical jargon and aggression. Patient care etiquette, stop, look at them. Most of us are so busy typing, typing, typing. Ha, 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 ha. The patient doesn't feel, you know, you've even heard them half of the time. So I have taken the easy way out and I still write charts. My writing is horrendous. But sometimes after five minutes of staring at my own page, I really appreciate Dr. Aruna's handwriting. Wow, Dr. Alice's handwriting, really beautiful. So I really appreciate people with those kind of handwriting and I can see Bina is taking up after me at a very great speed. Okay, so <laughs> beware of the secret recording. Patients are constantly sometimes trying to egg you on and recording things. Beware of the secret recording. When you are in distress or the patient is in absolute distress, don't talk. Like I said, it helps both patient and doctor to take a break in the restroom and to take a coffee break. So send people a little hydrated, empty bladder helps the situation. A little bit of prevention is worth, an ounce of prevention is worth a ton of cure. And once you are really in soup, everything is only adding on top of your head and it doesn't really help. So when in surgical soup, I'm not going to talk anymore about the OPD, I think enough has been said. When in surgical soup, do we feel like this little chicken little or whatever you call him? We are surgeons. We love the trauma, the drama, the theatrics. Oh my God, what an adrenaline rush it gives us. We are all adrenaline junkies one way or the other. Whether we like to accept it or not, we run on adrenaline. And if we have five OPD days or two whole weeks without any emergencies, we actually become listless. So here we are, gowning up. Great theatrics, great drama, open the pack. Do you have the catheters? Did I not ask you? I'm also prone to all this. Uh, so the main important thing is to train the crazy club. Okay, how do we manage in the midst of all the craziness to hold to certain principles? So they joke, surgery is not an art, it's a personality disorder. Okay, and even better than that, there's an inverse relationship between the surgeon's ability and the frequency he has for more muscle relaxants. Okay, this is all, these are very true. Prepare yourself and your assistants. It's very, very important. You know, review your case with your anesthetist, with your team. If you're dealing with endometriosis, don't ask, don't allow them to give a spinal. If you're doing a small case, don't allow them to take epidural one hour and then you end up with barely one hour of surgery. Okay, all these things, like when we're doing a VVF, we need special instruments, so you have to prepare for that ahead. More important for the surgical team, prophylactic nutrition, 
adequate fluids, not excessive, and an empty bladder is my recipe for a better surgical experience. The surgical resident is often like a mushroom, kept in the dark, fed shit, and expected to grow. Okay, so when you are anticipating a bad case, please do not get somebody who's in this state already, semi-comatose, who willing to sleep anywhere, or like this, or like this. Okay, we all know that we are in these states very often where, you know, a person very groggy. So ask them, are you okay enough? It's a difficult case. I'm going to yell at you, but please be careful about it. And don't come if you are in this condition. Now, okay, for the patient, it looks very, very threatening when they are in theater. Everything looks so big, so magnified. It's not very pleasant. So remember always to keep our mouth shut when the patient is under spinal, particularly. Okay? The advent of anesthesia has made it so that any idiot can become a surgeon. I bet this is an anesthetist <laughs> saying this. I bet this is an anesthetist. Now, we surgeons are not less. The next joke I bet is by a surgeon. A surgeon is someone who likes to operate an anesthetist, someone who doesn't like to give anesthetists. Even truer. And keeping your mouth shut. Okay, I, we have all made comments on the patient's amount of fat in the abdominal wall. And woe unto you if the patient is under spinal as this joke shows. He says, oh my God, look at the amount of fat. What are we wading through? All these things. Okay, this says, all right now, let's slaughter this fatty sword. And the, and the anesthetist, oh, oh, it's a spinal. Okay, who are the big boys of the neighborhood who get us into trouble, who bully us in trouble? Okay, these are the big boys, the bleeders, the bubble, the bladder, and the bugs. Okay, so these are the big bees, the four big bees who are always waiting around to bully us. Okay, if there's an acute bleeder, pack, give pressure, and breathe. Because the minute we start panicking, everything goes south. So pack, pressure, breathe, pray, don't forget, and now call for reinforcements. Okay, slowly take your hand off and check where the bleeder is. Or in case of a laparoscopy, if you can see the bleeder, catch it with a tooth or a non-tooth clamp and just stand there and breathe for two minutes. Suck and clear your field. Don't immediately start getting into a panic. Your blood bank is your fuel station. Is literally we run on, surgeons run on blood. Okay, so... All bleeding eventually ceases when the patient is dead. Terrible situation to be in. The only weapon with which the unconscious patient can immediately retaliate upon the incompetent surgeon is hemorrhage. Which is so true. This really struck me. The most important clotting factor is the surgeon. Even more true. Okay, so... There are four degrees of intraoperative hemorrhage. We have all gone through these various degrees at various points in time. But before it gets to the point, why was I even born? Oh my God, why am I standing here? Why did I choose gynecology? Why did I want to be a surgeon? We have to be ready for it. And you can see the anesthetist and surgeon glaring at one another. And this is usually the situation <laughs> that we are all in. So the strategy for angry neighbors, other than the bleeders, learn your anatomy, learn, 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 look. Those pink colors do have different tones, you know, color tones. See, hear, touch. It doesn't matter. You can always watch somebody else operate. You will always learn something new. Touch, revisit. Even if sometimes we feel, you know, everybody thinks the surgery went well, but somehow we are vaguely unsatisfied. We feel, oh, maybe I could have done better. So always revisit and ask yourself what you can do to prevent the barriers between bowel, bladder, and uterus breaking down. Those are the primary barriers we need to maintain, the tissue barriers and planes. Recognition and repair is more important because failing to recognize or behaving like an ostrich and failing to repair it even when you had suspicion, no matter if your heart has sunk like a stone into your foot, but we are still duty bound to repair it if we have a suspicion or cross check for injury. The failure to do this is actual negligence, not the injury per se, because of the unique relationship 
of the uterus with the base of the bladder, the bladder can very often get hit, especially with increasing number of cesareans and isthmoseals. So it's very important. I'm not going into specifics of it. We are all afraid of an abdomen like this, particularly in a case of endometriosis. There are various ways. Okay, oh my goodness, there's a lot more. Okay, <laughs> maybe we can, okay, so bugs. Okay, they often act like a terrorist when they breach the thing. Let's look at Count Banega Karorpati and see what ideas he has for us. Okay, your assistants are like the 50-50, then this uh, Poplu people call friends when you are in uh, trouble, assistants. Okay, you can only operate as well as your assistants permit you to and they are able to see the field from a different perspective than from you. So KBC options, it's good to have and it's, it's good. So ask somebody else what they think when you have confusion how to deal with the situation. Get the audience poll, they are always correct. Okay, expert, you call the colorectal surgeon or the urologist or the vascular surgeon, phone call. Most friends are just a phone call away. Get the opinion. When dealing with trouble, with troubling options, get at least the three wise men who are the colorectal surgeons, the urologist, and the vascular surgeons for us. Frightening epidemic violence. Okay, so what you realize is it helps to have an informed consent and helps to have a few men in black and a dog in black too. Okay, what an idea, Sergi. Okay, this is a very important, famous ad. Always. Consider when you're discharging against medical advice, investigate the patient's rationale for wanting to know, discuss with them the alternatives, evaluate if the patient understands the implication of going against medical advice and allow AMA and always give them a discharge summary, give them the option to come back. Second victim is always the doctor or the surgeon. Just one minute extra. Okay, so the second victim is the doctor. We have to stop this existing culture of blame, rather look at it as to how we can even support one another and our own colleagues. Because very often we like to appear strong, but it often helps. The art of communication is complicated but worth it, particularly with colleagues who understand your situation. Pushpalat and Meenakshi have been my shield and my sword, I cannot say more. Just be there for your friends when they're going through trouble. It helps to sing and uh, talk sometimes. It helps to cry when you're bringing up children. All these things help to keep you as a happy doctor. So I think it's time I stopped talking, like the wise old owl, to just sit there, watch and listen. Rachel, particularly for you, you have been my shoulder to cry on many an occasion, a person to laugh with. And when you cannot do anything about certain situations, grin and bear it. My esteemed professor, Dr. Lakshmi Sheshadri, told me once about this. She said, you can't do any of a situation, grin and bear it, okay? But it always helps to do it with friends, of course, when we are in the same soup. Let's stew together, but at least let's lean on one another's shoulders. Thank you. Next, we have a topic on hormone replacement therapy in oncology convic uh, convictions and controversies by Dr. Pushpalata. Thank you.
first uh, thank you for getting getting me this give me opportunity to speak in front of all the my teacher and uh, my guide uh, i am talking about the hormone replacement therapy in oncology what are the convention and what are the controversies so all we know that uh, there are a lot of gynecological cancer and uh, specifically the genital cancer which are dealing with the most common are the breast cancer cervical cancer uterine cancer and the ovarian cancer and if you look at the epidemiology most of these cancer affect the women who are in the around like 30 to 60 years when they are reaching the perimenopausal age group and this and uh, so uh, they have the uh, if you give a good treatment and good screening tool they have the long life to survive and that is also in absence of the hormone so with the improvement of the uh, screening technology and the diagnosis there is increased survival of the cancer so earlier the diagnosis the more local the disease is there the better is the survival the study have shown that if you diagnose the case in the early stage 90 uh, the if you diagnose the earlier the diagnosis the survival is almost like 90 percent so they have to go with the hormone deficient state for a longer period so they have to face the all the menopausal uh, symptoms so why the uh, uh, menopause occur after cancer treatment. There are different theory are there. Some are maybe because of physiological natural menopause, because of the aging process. Some may have the premature ovarian failure due to the cancer treatment. Either they have undergone the surgery, like uh, removal of the ovary. Some are because of the chemotherapy induced amenorrhea. Some have radiotherapy in the pelvis that caused the ovarian uh, functional uh, depletion. And some have uh, ovarian failure due to anti-estrogen therapy, which is the part of the treatment of the cancer. There may be the independent cause, either due to genetic or due to autoimmune disease. So, what is the climatic? Climatic is the phase from the perimenopause, menopause, and the postmenopause. Uh, so, it extends various uh, various period for the different women. Some may up go up to ten years. So that. A specific issue arising during this period and there is a specific health issue also arises during this period the common issue arises during this period are the change in the menstrual pattern they may have the vasomotor symptom including the sleep disturbance hot flushes and night sweat they may have the genetic urinary syndrome including the vaginal dryness urogenital atrophy loss of libido they also may have the weight gain and mood changes the specific health issue arising at this period are the cardiovascular mortality, osteoporosis. They have the risk of developing the urinary incontinence, risk of venous thromboembolism, and neurological uh, outcome. So definitely all these symptoms will benefit from the menop uh, menopausal hormonal therapy. A study has shown that menopausal hormonal therapy, if we give to the woman, there will be the re relief in the symptom of menopause. They help into the preserve the bone mineral density. They support the cardiovascular system if you give less than before the age of 60. They also help into prevention of the vaginal atrophy and the urogenital symptom. They also help, help into the other cognitive benefit. And the study has shown that if you give the hormonal therapy in the woman less than 60 years, there is a risk of prevention of colorectal cancer also. So what about the uh, WHI study? They also have shown that the risk benefit ratio if you're giving the hormonal therapy below 60 is better than if you're giving after 60 the mortality will be uh, morbidity will increases uh, if you give the after 60 so definitely giving the major, uh, hormonal therapy before 60 we have the benefit in the um, heart disease osteoporosis menopausal symptom and so on so what about the cancer patient what we'll do for the cancer patient so giving the menopausal hormone therapy in the cancer patient there's some Concern will arise. Patient will ask, what will happen if you'll take the menopausal hormone therapy? Will there is a new growth of the cancer recurrence? I have uh, some new cancer developing. If there is a progression of the disease, or is there an increased risk of venous thromboembolism? So this uh, concern is always the menopausal patient will ask after cancer treatment. So deciding for the menopausal therapy. If you give for the cancer patient, there's some concern that decision has to be made by the physician that depends on the 
First is the oncological characteristic of the malignant disease, including the organ affected, the histological type, the grade and stage of the tumor, the stage of remission, the time of survival since therapy. We also depend on the specification of the hormonal therapy, which type of hormonal therapy will give. We'll, shall we give the combined therapy or shall we give the progesterone only therapy? Which type of regime, sequential or consequent, uh, continuous shall we give? What is the root of the therapy and what is the duration of the therapy? The decision also depends on the oncologically re relevant endocrine characteristic of the tumor, like what is the hormonal receptor status, what is the endocrine oncotherapy going on, what are the effect of HRT on the other body part, and what is the immune response of the body. So based on all this, we have to decide on the hormonal therapy. So coming one by one, first is the breast cancer. What do the women do after treatment of the breast cancer? Uh, so there's few landmark study that I have taken that lot of paper, but some landmark studies I only have taken. One, um, one is the habit trial, which is published in the Lancet in 1997. This was the multi-center RCT. They have compared the HRT versus non-HRT in the breast cancer survival after two years of cancer treatment. They have given concomitant tam tamoxifen, but the aromatase inhibitor was not provided. They received high dose of estrogen, two milligram, and follow-up was done for four year. The hazard ratio was 2.4. So after in the midway only, the study was terminated. Later on, they have looked for the same data, and they have found that the new breast cancer increases only in the hormone receptor positive patient. The second landmark study was done for the tibulon, which is basically going, we are giving for the bone mineral density treatment for the postmenopausal women. So what is the effect on the breast cancer? So uh, this was also a multinational placebo control trial. Women who are surgically treated with the breast cancer, they have given the tibulon and they have followed those type of patient. In this also, the hazard ratio was 1.4, which is significantly high. So this study was also terminated in the midway. The other study was, has come as a Stockholm randomized trial. The data from the habit trial they have taken and they have redesigned and look for the outcome. So here they have intervention group has received estrogen and progesterone both. The median, uh, uh, the follow-up period was four year. In, in this study, they have looked for the recurrence that was the hazard ratio was 0.82. This is also significant. The study was terminated. So the recent one, one meta-analysis was done. They have looked for 14 articles, both RCT and observational study. They have looked for the various combination of hormonal therapy, duration of therapy, root of the, uh, hormonal therapy. And uh, the result uh, was the HRT user versus non-user. The hazard ratio is 2.2, which is significantly high. For the oral and vag vaginal root, the hazard ratio is less, but it is not clinically significant, but still it's still higher. For the HR positive and hormone receptor positive and hormone receptor negative, the hazard ratio was 2.1. So finally, the, in, there is a definitely, definitely increased risk of recurrence in HRT, user especially oral route. ER pos positive or PR positive status has significantly increased risk of recurrence. This is only for the current user. Five years after discontinuation of the therapy, there is no, they will return, the risk will return to the baseline. So second ca common cancer is the endometrial cancer. This is a primary disease of the postmenopausal women. Only 25% of the women are premenopausal. Out of this 5% are younger than four, uh, four, uh, 40 years. Potentially it is a curable disease and approximately 75% of the cases are diagnosed in the early stage, stage one. The five year survival rate in the early stage is 86%. So they have to go for long for the in the estrogen deficient state. So what is the safety in the endometrial cancer for the HRT? There are three main meta-analysis has come over the years, 2013, 2018, and 2021. Basically, they have looked for the HRT in the post-endometrial uh, cancer survival about the recurrence, appearance of the new malignancy, and time and duration of the hormonal therapy. So in 13, basically, they have looked, uh, basically, they have taken on the observational study this study has shown that there is a significant increase in the recurrence, there is no significant increase in the recurrence of um, endometrial cancer after hormonal therapy. But this study, this meta-analysis is basically based on the observational study, so we can't uh, 
rely on this study. 2018, other study had looked for the women who were previously treated for the endometrial cancer and now they are, have treated with the HRT. They have shown there is no difference in the symptom relief, overall survival or progression-free survival after HRT. The recurrence rate was 2.3%, which is the relative risk was high. The new malignancy recurrence rate, the, the relative risk was 0 0.8. And the rate of survival is similar in both group. So this study was actually prematurely closed when the WHI, stu WHI study has uh, released. So this study, they have shown that risk of exogenous hormone therapy outweighed the benefit. This, so this study was prematurely closed. 21, the recent analysis, meta-analysis has come that has shown that there is no significant difference in the disease-free survival. Black women, black American women have the higher risk of recurrence, significant reduced risk of recurrence among the endometrial cancer survival treated with the hormonal therapy, and the most of the recurrence is uh, um, uh, risk-reducing combination is the estrogen-progesterone combination or cyclical progesterone. If you give only estrogen, the definitely the risk will be high. About the uterine sarcoma, this is less than 1% of the gynecological cancer, and they have ER and PR positive receptor status, and they behave more like a, um, so they more like endometrial cancer. So the chance of recurrence is high after the uh, treatment. About the cervical cancer, the majority of women are the premenopausal and we have a lot of uterine and the ovarian preservation therapy for that. If you are want to preserve the fertility, we can go for the cervical colonization or tracheostomy. Early stage disease, we can do the radical hysterectomy with conservation of the ovary. Higher, st higher uh, stage of disease, we can go for the chemo radiation with the, uh, with the transposition of the ovary in the uh, field away from the irradiation field. So actually the hormonal status has somehow is preserved in the cervical cancer. This is theoretically, but uh, the, still there is a chance of ovarian failure is very high and women will have reduced or absent ovarian function uh, after the therapy of the cervical cancer. There's few study on this squamous cell carcinoma. This, uh, they have shown that uh, with the HRT, the fiber survival is 80% compared to the control group is about 65% uh, and recurrence is only 20% in the control group it was 32%. So HRT is advantageous to the patient and it can be used without any restriction. For the adenocarcinoma that account lesser percentage of the cervical cancer, they behave like they are estrogen dependent. Biological behavior is like endometrial cancer only. There is a lack of robust data, and only progesterone or progestin in, uh, may can be used for a HRT in this type of patient. For the ovarian cancer, there are a lot of study in the ovarian cancer. I have taken only one meta-analysis that is published in the Cochrane Review in 2020. They have shown that a slight improvement in the overall survival in the women. There is no difference in the quality of life, no effect of HRT on progression-free survival. For the, um, there is a negative influence of HRT on the risk of ovarian cancer in the menopausal women, especially in the serous and endometroid tumor. Germ cell tumor, there are no high risk of recurrence of HRT. This study have actually excluded the granulosa cell tumor, and there is no direct evidence of a negative or long-lasting hormonal treatment effect on the patient survival. However, starting the HRT is not safe. For the BC, uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 uh, gene mutant variant, they have shown that there is increased risk of developing the epithelial cell cancer and breast cancer. So risk reducing salpingiophrectomy have, uh, they may have the civil menopausal symptom. We can use a short term of HRT if it is safe and HRT use after RSSO in the mutant variant does not affect the breast cancer risk. This is the, uh, so what is the consensus after this? So North America Society of Menopause have given the position statement. This is published in 22. For the breast cancer, they have told the uh, genitourinary symptom in the low dose variant, uh, in the, for the genitourinary symptom, low dose vaginal estrogen is an effective treatment option if, uh, because they have the minimal systemic absorption. Diethyl is still as aldosterone. It is still in the initial phase of trial we have the non-hormonal therapy. For the uterine cancer, if the surgically treated early stage, low grade, if patient have bothersome symptom, 
not responding to non hormonal therapy we can give the hrt in consultation with the oncologist um, consultation if they have high grade advanced disease or stromal sarcoma or leiosarcoma systemic hrt of not advised for the ovarian cancer benefit of hrt use generally outweigh risk hormone dependent including granulosa cell tumor and low grade serous carcinoma use of hrt is not advised in women with braca1 and braca2 positive gen genetic variant you can give short term hrt if it uh, if we have done the rsso so what will do for the menopausal symptom in this patient we have to communicate with the patient the option we have to choose the option judicially keep the realistic expectation adherence and compliance is the must choice of the treatment depend on the symptom and more non hormonal therapy based treatment has to be given so coming to the symptom they have different type of variations of symptom including the hot flushes night sweat sleep challenges mood swing vaginal dryness then weight gain body urinary symptom menstrual disorder and memory loss so uh, we have to give the symptomatic treatment for the vasomotor symptom we have hormonal treatment the option are hormonal non hormonal hormonally we have the pharmacological non pharmacological including the complementary medicine and practices just two minute so hormonal treatment we have told it has to be used judicially we have the serum called bigidoxifen that is we can give for the vasomotor symptom non hormonal treatment we have ssri ssrim non convulsant and centrally active agent the ssri is basically improve the sleep serotonin and non adrenaline in reuptake inhibitor basically the venlafaxine that in is better for the hot flushes for the ssri and uh, snri the study have shown there is beneficial and the effect is dose, dose dependent for the mild and moderate efficacy for all this one the choice should be optimal the adjuvant therapy we have lot of thing but all these are non conventional medicine and there is not enough work to advise the patient so uh, we have the benefit can be taken in the in the higher doses we have adjuvant therapy including the hypnosis cognitive behavior therapy biofeedback relaxation technique yoga aromatherapy all this can we can advise but there is no clinical evidences for uses in the patient so second is the genital urinary symptom they will have the genital uh, genital symptom sexual symptom and the urinary symptom treatment option is first is the local hormonal therapy we have local estrogen either in the cream tablet or ring other new drug is the dihydroethinesterone including the paristerone this is approved for that uh, er negative breast cancer oral osmiphene and testosterone for the uh, sexual dysfunction non hormonal therapy are the vaginal lubricant vaginal moisturizer li liquid lignocaine non medical uh, therapy are the dilator and the ablation sleep disorder we have to give them sleep hygiene advice what we have to do like stick to the regular bed time awake in the same time increase daytime brightness light exposure expose establish the daily routine activity exercise regularly and establish regular sleep environment for the we have to tell them they should not nap they should avoid drink alcohol avoid stimulant avoid bright light in the night exercise should not exercise within 3 hour of the bed time and do not eat heavy milk before bed time and should not watch the clock they have to maintain the nutrition i'm just running all this thing and exercise so we have to tell them that uh, we still have the option thank you thank you pushpalata ma'am for such a wonderful and extensive presentation we will now all assemble for the photograph
Kindly all come forward for the photograph. There are seats kept in front and space at the back. So. When did you come back? You went with me, huh? Ma'am, I have few patients. <laughs> So it's height wise distribution, those standing behind, short people please come forward, no harm intended, uh, those taller people please go towards behind.
वीडियो में दिख रहा है वीडियो ओके थैंक यू Juliana ji Okay, can we settle down? We have a few more interesting talks to go. Audience, please settle down. May I request the audience to please settle down? So there will be a slight change in the announcement made. Dr. Lily will present her talk. We will carry on with the working tea.
step outside, get your cup of tea. Don't bring it right into the hall. Please stay at the back and have it if you have to. And we'll start off with Dr. Lilly's talk. I'll get the audience inside.
So our next session is Adapt to Flourish and it will be chaired by Dr. Abraham and Dr. Annie. I call upon Lily, ma'am. Please tell me when your timer is starting, okay? Tell me it's starting now. Okay. We've started. Okay, we we'll start the start. session. We're starting. I'm not getting it full screen. Is it? For some reason, it's not coming full screen. One minute. That one only it's on. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. That's, oh, it's already full screen. Yes. One minute. Uh, eh, uh, don't count. Now you start counting. <laughs> um, my topic was laparoscopic gynecological surgery videos, basically. Uh, to a large extent, I feel a little awkward about this because it doesn't really help to teach people except to tell you what is the scope of laparoscopic surgeries. So we will just look at a few laparoscopic videos. And uh, remember that, you know, laparoscopy is seen as advanced technology and there are many benefits to it. But we always have to ask ourselves, is this technology really useful to the patient and does it really bring benefit for the patient? That's the whole point of this. So there are explicit uh, images ahead and uh, this is a disclaimer. And, uh, for some reason, my videos, excuse me. It's not. Okay, so. Okay, so we are looking at a hysteropexy, as you can see. Uh, this is an advanced uh, uh, prolapse, pelvic organ prolapse. We have held the. I'm fast forwarding all the videos, so please play, pay close attention if possible. I'm holding the uterosacrals here. And as you can see here, what we are doing is a lap. It's coming on the screen one. Just wait one minute. When I'm going, it's not coming full screen first. Okay. full screen You want to close it and close, close it. Can just see if the slides are more full screen for them. See, you can give her a look. In her laptop, is it there? Should I bring my laptop? Ah. Here is a port ring. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Okay. One minute. Okay. 
Okay, so the first one is a Kana sling hysteropexy. And uh, as you can see, we have initiated the surgery, held the uterosacral ligaments, and uh, fixed the mesh at around the level of the uterosacral ligaments. We fixed the mesh arms. I'm doing the procedure which Dr. Pili does and has uh, popularized. So the step is then after this, we did an anterior colporaphy. We did a cervical amputation. You can see the part, cut part of the cervix, and we did the entire repair. After we, we had put the mesh arms, we had pushed it into the abdomen. So here is a video as to how to get the mesh arms outside to get to fix it near close to the anterior superior iliac spine onto the attachment. So you can see here, this is the right ureter. You can see the movement. You can see the laparoscopic port puncture. We are introducing this, uh, the grasper right through the same port site going towards the round ligament and then you can see the infundibular pelvic ligament has to be actually been lifted to be able to make the pass below that okay so you can see that you're crossing the infundibular pelvic ligament lifting the ovary and you you always watch where the ureter is before you come to the site of the mesh so you come to the site of the mesh and then you feed the mesh arms into it, okay? And feed the mesh arms and you have to pull it out towards the abdominal wall. So you can see the mesh being pulled, okay? So I have slowed down the video at this point a bit, okay? So you can see and we are taking it right out of the abdominal wall. So a similar procedure is done on the other side. A similar procedure is done on the other side and you can see the grasper coming in and the mesh being pulled across to the other side. This is the basically the laparoscopic component of it. After pulling out the mesh again through these arms, we closed the pouch of Douglas. We closed the pouch of Douglas and we closed, we closed up the entire area. And as you can see here, one of the mesh arms are outside. And you can see here we have exposed properly. You can see the beginning of the inguinal ligament where it is attached onto the anterior superior iliac spine. We have attached it to that point after tensioning and pulling the uterus up. So this was the end result. We had done an anterior, we had done a cystocel repair and a posterior colporaphy too. In the second case is a case of an aquum, an accessory cavitated uterine mass. This girl came to us from Bangladesh. She was misdiagnosed for, she had severe dysmenorrhea, misdiagnosed as a degenerative fibroid first, then as an obstructed dilated rudimentary horn. However, the minute we saw, we realized this was an aquum because we see quite a few cases. And uh, we, we, uh, we also cross-checked her MRI figures from outside. So you can see the aquum is a small cavitated cystic mass. It's like a uterus in another uterus. But you can see here the serocell contour is complete. It is not like a biconate uterus. It's not divided into two. So here we are going, I'm showing you an excision of an aquum. The aquum is usually situated under the round ligament with the normal attachment of the tubes and ovaries. So, it is just like excising an adenomyoma. There is no difference from an adenomyoma. We have infiltrated vasopressin. And you, you can see here that the uh, cavitated lesion has ruptured and you can see the altered blood that is inside it. After this, I'm fast forwarding the recording. We have excised the entire structure like an adenomyoma, how you would, very similar to an adenomyoma. And then we close the cavity. All these cases are the cases done over the past two months or so. This patient has just left for Bangladesh and she is doing well. We will be following her up subsequently. The next case was a case of a chronic uterine inversion in a 13-year-old. Not obstetric, no myoma. She just went with heavy menstrual bleeding and she went with foul-smelling discharge and retention of urine. Thankfully, there was an AIMS doctor there. She did an examination under anesthesia and said, no, this is not looking like a fibroid. They just packed the vagina and told her, go back, go to a higher center and referred her. When she was referred, she was already referred with an MRI. 
saying this is an inversion of the uterus so it was easier for us also to distinguish you can see here the typical flower pot uh, appearance of the uterus with uh, i'll just go back so this is the flower pot appearance you can see everything has gone inside there's a constriction ring here and you can see we are trying to pull it up. It's called the Huntington's method, I believe. We are trying to walk down the round ligaments with pushing from below, but both of it didn't work. This is Meenakshi's patient. The previous Kanna sling was Pushpalata who assisted me. They both are the ones who assist me. So what happened is we eventually ended up cutting the constriction ring. We entered the uterine cavity. And as you can see here, we have entered this. We did a laparoscopic spinalis procedure. So we pushed, we cut the anterior upper segment and you can see this is the fundus of the uterus which was very congested. Then with pulling and pushing we somehow managed to reduce the inversion. We, you can see of that white uh, tube like is a silicon foley's which we have kept and we distended the bulb so that the uterus would not get reinverted and we also did a round ligament plication you can see at the end of the procedure that we have restored the anatomy but definitely she'll need a cesarean in future this is another weird kind of case which we did which was an innovative surgery pushpalata's patient this is a patient who had mrkh and uh, she uh, she got married and uh, because of coital injury she developed a complete perineal tear because of anal coitus so when we saw there were it was very very thin and very little space between the urethra and the uh, complete perineal tear so we had to make an incision go very carefully and develop the neovaginal space the posterior wall of that rectum was so thin and we we were initially planning to do a pedicle flap however when we went, when we saw inside the abdomen, we saw that this, she had one adenomyotic uterus, one, the right side of the uterus was an adenomyotic component with hematometra. So what we did is, here you can see I'm separating the UV fold and we are looking at the vascular supply and you can see the ureter here. You can see the ureteric movement and you can see the finger moving. See, this is the ureter. We are identifying the ureter here. You can see the peristalsis actually of the ureter here. See how close it is to the vault, to the region of the neovaginal space. Once we identified the ureter, we took the adenomyotic part of the uterus, we cavitated it outside, we removed this, and then we inverted it through the fibrous ridge. So you have a, a uterus which was opened out. Okay, then we put this, you can see that we are, sorry, that is the next one. So you can see we brought this outside into the neovaginal space. We split it and we use this to form the neovaginal graft because the posterior rectal wall was so thin, we needed something thick to bridge it. So we turned the raw surfaces towards the raw surface of the neovaginal space and we use the serosal surface as the neovaginal cavity this patient just completed 27th post-op day with us we had given her hospital free she just left yesterday she was able to introduce the dilators herself and she went home and this is the completed result five more so then this is a vvf repair which we did laparoscopically we take consent for all vvfs for laparoscopically the majority we have done all vaginally i think only two or three cases but this was a surprise this case was a surprise because once we removed the right ovary from the spot we realized that the bowel everything was adherent to the vvf site so we had to separate the bowel and you can see a remnant of the ovary is there. You can see this white spot. You can see the left ovary was adherent there. And eventually we had to slowly, slowly in stages separate all the additions out. Separate the ovaries from the site of the VVF. And only then could we do the VVF repair. This was the left ovary which was adherent to the VVF site. The bowel, the ovaries, everything was adherent together close to the VVF site. So what we did was we slowly separated it and eventually we repaired this laparoscopically. This was repaired in September 22. She went home well. She healed well and she went home. 
So you can see we have put in catheters into the ureteric uh, orifices. So uh, my, what is the point of all this? You know, there is always a new hurdle to jump for every generation. For our generation, it was laparoscopy. And that was the ultimate frontier, the hurdle over which we jumped. But however, you can see now robotic surgery has come in. And as a development in future, I think Priya Bhatti will be speaking about robotic surgery. They will be artificial AI. But the question is, you always need a doctor there to decide between right and wrong. It is just not about technology. It is about doing things with safety. So what, what is my point? Almost any surgery that can be done abdominally can be done through the minimally invasive approach. All uh, The learning curve takes a little time, but once you get there, you can do almost any case through a minimally invasive approach. However, that's not the whole point. The world is your oyster. You know, you can just extend the frontiers of your surgery by leaps and bounds. But the most important question is, that pearl which you're searching for, once you find it and you say, oh, I'm technologically brilliant, the question is, does it actually benefit your patient? It is not seeking technological excellence at the cost of the patient's help. And what is technologically advanced surgery for us gynecologists is what we have to take a call. But what it is not, as a few statements that which went through my mind, it's not about technical skill. It's about patient safety and benefits first and last. If it is not benefiting your patient, I think you should not do it just because you want to learn on somebody. Okay, it is not having that, you know, you have any kind of a knife, whether it is harmonic, whether it is a liger sure, whether it's a thunder beat, you will always have advancement. It's not that whether it's a cold knife or a harmonic knife, what matters? What matters is not having a knife and you will cut somewhere anyhow. It is knowing where not to cut your maturity as a surgeon. Opt out if it is not safe. If it is not safe for the patient and the patient is not going to benefit from it, do not persist in a technologically superior method. Retire from the battle and come back to win the war another day. Always start small, go on to bigger cases. It is not about breaching frontiers at all costs. It's about breaching frontiers with ethics. It is not about one-man brilliance. It's always about teamwork. You cannot do things by yourself, and it's very, very frustrating. So to the teams which stand behind you, the people who encourage you on the floor, to everybody, you we need to say a huge thanks. And at the very basic, the very bottom of it, lies the biblical principle, do unto others what you would have them do unto you, which also means don't do to somebody what you would not do on yourself, on your daughter, on your sister, on anybody that you know. So let us keep that in mind. Let us start small, go big, and let it be of benefit for the patient. And that is my prayer and my message to you. Thank you. Thanks, Lily, for that great videos and the putting it in perspective at the end. Okay, the next presenter uh, thank is... Thank you, ma'am. Now I call upon Danya, ma'am, from the Department of Gynae Oncology to talk on the advances in vaccination and screening. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be talking on advances in cervical cancer screening and vaccination. All of us, this is the fourth common cancer among women world over, 
and most of these cancers, cervical cancers are in the low and middle income countries and in India it is the second commonest cancer among women. So the 25% of the world burden of cervical cancer is in India. But the good thing is that cervical cancer is preventable and uh, it was in 2018 that the WHO Director General called for action to eliminate CA cervix. Elimination of CA cervix means uh, to attain less than four cases per 100,000 women annually. And there are certain countries which are on the way of achieving this goal. And with this target in mind, the WHO brought forward the three pillars that 90% of girls less than 15 years to be vaccinated. This is all by the year uh, 2030. 90% okay. of girls below 15 years to be vaccinated with HPV vaccine, fully vaccinated. 70% of the women to undergo screening with a good high performance screening test by the age of 45 years. And 90% of the women with cervical precancers and cancers to be treated. Now today we'll look at the advances in screening and uh, vaccination, first screening. So uh, we'll just go through three major things, the screening test, which we are all familiar with, the guidelines and about self-screening. So the screening modalities we are all familiar with is cytology, which has been there for many years now, and uh, it's, it's a very good test. Then the other tests are VIA and VILI, but the best test is HPV testing. Now cytology, we all know the sensitivity is moderate and uh, uh, we are familiar with the liquid-based cytology. The advantage of it over the conventional is that it decreases the unsatisfactory smears, but the sensitivity is similar. Then uh, we know that uh, pap smear was a success story in the developed nations which implemented it as a program and there has been a decrease in the cervical cancer in many of the developed nations. This is, I'm talking about 70s, 80s when it was implemented. But in countries like India and other low middle income countries where such uh, lab facilities and training and uh, such systems are not available, perhaps should pap smear sh could not be implemented as a national program. Hence all those, uh, uh, low and middle income countries, the very cheap test to which can be done is the visual inspection tests, which are using acetic acid and lugolcidin. Now, so this is based on the principle that the cervix has a transformation zone, which is the area between the squamous epithelium, the original squamous columnar junction and the new squamous columnar junction. So all of you uh, may be familiar, but uh, just for the sake of PGs, you know, the older, uh, the original squamous columnar junction will be more distally, while the new squamous columnar junction will be more proximally. And the area between the two is the transformation zone, which is prone for dysplasia and malignancy, because that is the area that is undergoing a change, especially in the younger age group, the adolescent and the younger women who undergo uh, sexual activity and all HPV infection can occur. So the so visual inspection is actually visualizing this area, the transformation zone to look for lesions. The two modalities available are the visual inspection with acetic acid, where acetic acid is applied to look for acetovite areas. And lugolcidin is, lugolcidin is applied and uh, the abnormal cells which do not, abnormal cells are the ones which lack glycogen because they are uh, not mature enough. And because of that, they appear yellow. Now, we visual, inspection with acetic acid also has similar sensitivity like pap smear. Now, uh, colposcopy was never a screening method. It's always a triage test. Like That means if a screening test is positive, whether to treat or not is decided based on colposcopy. And previously, we had bulky colposcopes, which were, you know, uh, which could not be moved and uh, which had to be stationed in one place. But nowadays, a lot of these colposcopes are coming up, which are portable, lightweight, which can be carried anywhere. So actually, this colposcope doing it in uh, the community or at, at the outreach stations can actually help in VIA, improving VIA and you know immediately treatment can also be given. And now the latest uh, development, all of us are aware of AI, 
AI can generate the uh, the reports also. You know, so some of us, uh, you know, this may be something that can be used in future, even in our country, where in in remote areas, even the health workers can not just do a, a VIA, but can use a small colposcope, which can even generate a report. Now, coming to the most important and the best test for screening is the HPV DNA testing, HPV testing. So we all know uh, the cervical cancer is caused by the double-stranded DNA HPV virus. And there are various HPV tests available. Like uh, here we are doing the hybrid capture, then uh, Aniplex 2. Uh, then there are various other tests. And the basis is also, uh, it may be either HPV DNA amplification or PCR-based test, or sometimes it's an mRNA-based test. Now, after this COVID came up, there are lots of, uh, you know, indigenous Indian tests also coming up, or uh, HPV, which, which may be very cheap and which may be freely available in many of the places, even in North but many of them are not validated. So we, the HPV test, the only thing, it should be a validated, properly validated test. Now, the problem with HPV test is that each, any person with a positive HPV test does not mean that they have cancer or they may develop cancer because most of these viruses will be eliminated from the body. So HPV, once it's positive, triaging has to be done. Screening test is possible, do the triaging. So there are various triaging methods available. In addition to the colposcopy that we know, we can do cytology, then the genotyping is good, then there are newer methods. In low resource setting, VIA can be done. And uh, care HPV is something that is available, not here in India, but uh, it is something which can in future may be available at low cost and it can be done as a point of care test. So uh, there are various methods of collection of HP. Some of uh, you know our own uh, doctors have done PG thesis and all on different like paper method of collection, then urine HPV and all. But the yield in urine will be moderate. The best test, like you know, if you want to treat immediately, will be a point of care test where the result is available within few hours so that the patient can be treated immediately. Now coming to the guidelines of screening. The WHO brought forward the 2021 uh, guidelines in 2021. WHO advocated cervical screening, the primary modality to be HPV testing. Now the age of screening to be started from 30 years and go on till 50 years, I every five to 10 year gap. Now uh, women beyond 50 till 65 can be screened if enough resources are available. Now once HPV test is positive, WHO advocates screen and treat or screen, triage and treat. If screen and treat is, that means immediately they are treated. If triage is also done, then means that's an additional test which is done before treating. So in areas where HPV is not available, do continue using VIA or cytology every three monthly. Now the FOXI has brought forward the guidelines this year considering uh, the WHO criteria and everything, they have brought forward the guidelines this year. The age to start screening, FOXI has uh, recommended 25 years in a good resource setting, whereas in a poor resource setting, like, you know, WHO has asked only for 30 years. When to end screening, FOXI has recommended till 65 years with three consecutive negative cytology tests or two negative HPV tests. And the interval for HPV testing will be five years, whereas for cytology or VIA, it will be three years. After hysterectomy for a benign condition, there is no need to continue screening. But if it is for, if the report is CIN or anything like that, you have to continue screening for a minimum of, for at least 20 years. Then for HIV or other immunocompromised people, we are screening at double the frequency. Like, you know, instead of five years, it will be three years and HPV testing can be done. Now coming to self-collection, now even in, uh, even though so many tests are available, people are still reluctant to go on to testing. Hence self-collection is something that can uh, overcome this. It has high acceptability, but sensitivity and specificity are uh, lower but comparable to physician collected. So uh, yeah, there was this study uh, 
which is uh, showing challenges in the implementation of self-sampling in India, systematic review. They found, it's not very clear, they found that there are many issues at the level of the beneficiary, like uh, lack of knowledge, lack of motivation. There are many health, health system related issues, like, you know, the uh, report is not ready, like, you know, it will take time for the HPV device to give the report. Then the healthcare provider site also, there are various problems. This is to be further studied until it can be implemented. Now, regarding advances in vaccination, I will not go to the beginning part. It was, uh, yeah. So, viral proteins in the HPV DNA, there are early proteins and the late proteins. Late proteins, L1 antigen is the one for which, uh, based on that, only the vaccines are made. They are virus-like particles based on L1 antigen. So, if you look at the history of the HPV vaccines, it was in 1991 that Dr. Ian Fraser and uh, Dr. Zhu developed the VLP. Then in 2006, Gardasil was um, made. Then uh, Cervarix in 2007, 2014, Gardasil 9. Now, uh, looking at, now we have a lot more vaccines. Gardasil is available against uh, HPV 6, 11, 16 and 18. Uh, Cervarix is against 16 and 18. Ni Gardasil 9 includes a whole set of other viruses, high-risk viruses. There are two more new vaccines from the Chinese companies, C. colin, then Valvax. Oh, I'm not going to the trials. Now, in older women, vaccine efficacy decreases because they may already be exposed to HPV. Hence, uh, it, it is less cost-effective to vaccinate older women. And there are various um, barriers to HP vaccine uptake, like the cost. Then there was there is this worldwide vaccine shortage. Then pandemic was there. Then this vaccine requires cold chain. And the adolescents are targeted, not the children. And there's always vaccine hesitancy. Now, uh, I'll... Yeah, there are certain special situations like, you know, in pregnancy, this vaccine is not recommended. However, there's no need for MTP. Lactating women can take vaccine. Then sexual assault women should be vaccinated, especially at the first visit itself. Women with already abnormal tests can be vaccinated, but it is less efficacious. And uh, HPV vaccine does not eliminate the need for screening. Now the primary target group WHO has recommended girls aged nine to 14 years, and they're given two doses. The secondary target groups are girls 15 to 26, boys, then older men. Uh, and there are actually no major side effects with the HPV vaccines. Now this is a recommended dose, two doses in age 9 to 14, and three doses above 15, between 15 and 26. Now the WHO has recently come up with a reduced dose. Now, the advantage of the reduced dose is that it can we can target more, more and more girls. So, uh, it is before the age of 20 years, one or one dose is sufficient, one or two. Now, uh, above the age of 20 years, two doses. This is based on the data which is obtained from the trials which were stopped midway in from India, and there are other prospective trials also which were conducted. Now, I want to tell about the Indian vaccine, Servovac, which was recently uh, introduced by the Serum Institute company. Now, Servovac is uh, recommended for girls 9 to 26. It is also recommended for boys 9 to 26. It's given like an IM dose. Uh, one vial of it has two doses, and one vial, you know, it, that means for two people you can simultaneously, you can give. And it is against HPV 6, 11, 16, and 18. Now, the immunogenicity and safety of this vaccine, this uh, was recently published in the Lancet Oncology, and uh, uh, this trial uh, was a multicentric trial, and we, our institution also was part of it. They basically looked at the immunogenicity, comparing the uh, immunogenicity in the children, uh, in the girls and boys, 9 to 14, with the 15 to 26 of the uh, Gardasil vaccine and the immunogenicity is non-inferior. And the safety also, and the second 
core primary outcome was looking at safety and the safety also it was safety uh, it is a safe vaccine there were no major side effects only a few minor local and systemic side effects so to conclude as I have told before, cervical cancer, although it is very rampant, it is preventable. And WHO has brought forward the three pillars for its prevention. And as part of the 90-70-90 goals, we should be upscaling you know, our screening methods to include many more women. And this will include, uh, in the future, it should, the self-collected sampling with point-of-care testing of HPV with immediate treatment should be the uh, should be the way forward and then hpv vaccines many are available gardasil is available here servavac has come up so uh, it is available and hpv vaccines have to be given we should encourage others and people known to us also to take the hpv vaccine and it is safe and the indian vaccine servavac has uh, good immunogenicity and i take this opportunity to thank God for the many years, almost nine years, I could work with Rachel Ma'am, and I thank God for her life and uh, her care and uh, uh, care and everything that she has done. Thank God for her. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Danya, for enlightening us on the advances in vaccination and screening. The next topic is by Dr. Anne George, screening of CA cervix challenges in the community. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've, we've just listened to uh, screening techniques and the vaccination that's available to all of us. But I'm going to speak from what is practically possible and what our experience has been in the community. Uh, giving a global scenario, 89% of all cancers occur in low and middle income countries. But 94% of global spending on uh, cervical cancer occurs in high-income countries. And low cervical cancer screening is actually one of the main reasons for these health disparities. So we know cervical cancer prevalence, diagnosis, and treatment are globally inequitable. And it is prevalence and mortality of cervical cancer are one of the two major contributors to the increase in disability-adjusted life years in LMICs. But in high-income countries, successful reduction of cervical cancer incidence can be attributed mainly because there's a screening all over as well as vaccination freely available. So what is the reason for why uh, this screening program in India is failing. We heard about the screening that is possible, VIA or VILI is possible, or cytology or HPV. There is a high disease burden in India. 21% of global cervical cancer cases occur in India, and 23% of the deaths are in India. And uh, Dhania was referring to the incidence rate that WHO wants to bring to less than four per 100,000, while ours is 18 per 100,000. But if you look at the uh, data that is available, this is from the NFHS survey 2019 to 21, only 1.9% of Indian women in, in the age group of 30 to 49 years have been ever screened. This is Indian data. And in Tamil Nadu, it is higher at 9.8%. So why is it that people are not being screened? Why is it that women are not willing to be screened? We're looking at what are the steps that are 
uh, that need to be done in a cervical screening program. If we know what the steps are, then we can look at each of those steps and see where the lacunae are. So initially, there has to be the identification of who is the eligible population to undergo screening. There has to be invitation and education of this group of women to participate in the screening. This is followed by a screening test. And the screen positives need to be referred. The screen negatives need to be told that they are negative. And this has to be followed up by algorithms which need to be in place. If you are positive, what is the next step in the diagnosis and treatment? And this has to be followed by treatment procedure. So there are various levels at which uh, things can go wrong and people may be unwilling to follow through after either screening or a positive diagnosis. So this is uh, from our experience in uh, community health and development. So the kind of cancer screening that we have in place is initially it is there is a motivation for attending health education and screening and this is done by volunteers and health workers from the community health department. There is group education in villages where the women are informed about what this what cancer screen what cervical cancer is, what are the causes and how screening can be done. And there's a screening clinic which initially used to be in the community hospital, but now is being conducted in the respective villages, wherever this screening uh, education is uh, being done. So the uh, screening that we are currently doing is a VIA screening and a clinical breast examination, because both cervical and breast cancer, we are screening together. If the VIA is positive, a colposcopy is done and it's followed by a punch biopsy and treatment. And if breast masses are felt, then ultrasound or a mammography is done depending on the age of the patient. So we were looked at from what uh, data we have, the number of women we managed to screen finally was only 9.6%, which is similar to the NFHS data, which still tells us that women are not coming for the screening. The number of VIA positives detected were 5.4%. Among those who finally uh, were VIA positive, this is because the VIA was being done by community health physicians as well. And corposcopy positive among them was 17.7%. And, and we detected six uh, cases of uh, pre-cancer. So what are the challenges that we face? especially with the VIA-based screening program. There are challenges at various levels. It can be at the provider level, health system level, as well as the population level. So at the facility level, you need to have a, play, a special day for cancer screening. This, you Imagine you say one day you're going to do screening alone, which means you're going to take up time from the regular clinical schedule. And there has to be funding for VIA, for the colposcope, for biopsy. Training has to be done. Every year, there's a new set of postgraduates coming in, which means a new set of people need to be trained. Health education se sessions need to be conducted. Mobilization for screening. So initially, we were taking transport to the villages and bringing the patients for the screening, which was not very feasible. So eventually, now we are doing the screening in the villages. Then this has to be, if they're screen positive, it needs to be seen by a gynecologist. Colposcopy needs to be done. And there are people who, in spite of being detected positive, do not want further diagnosis or management. There was, we, we had one woman who had a carcinoma in situ detected who finally refused treatment and she uh, progressed to stage three cancer. We could have HPV-based programs. What are the advantages? It's more objective. You don't need to keep training people to be doing the VIA. It is automated, better sensitivity, fewer rounds of testing. You can have the screening every five years. And there is always the option of self-testing. But what are the problems? It's expensive. And in a country like ours, there are a lot of logistic challenges as well. So this is another. Uh, study that was done in various parts of Velo, one, one of which was the tribal area that we look after, and also done in the Conch area as well as uh, the Rusa area. 
Here, actually, women were given self-collection of vaginal samples, uh, which they collected themselves. This was followed by a colposcopy in case the HPV tested positive. And this was again followed by a cryotherapy or thermal, thermal ablation. So if you look at the number of women who were screened, the numbers were around 1,000 in each population. But among those screened, if you look at the graph, 12.1% among the tribal women tested positive for HPV, while 55 in the rural and 3.1 among the urban. But what happened after they were tested positive? Among the tribal, only 56% came back for the triage, which meant the completion of the diagnosis and treatment never occurred. The rural area, 84% of the women came, and from the uh, urban, 45%. So even though the screening has occurred, the follow-through is not happening. So what are the issues? At the patient level, there are problems with the test itself. Sometimes they say the brushes got lost. There is poor family support. And usually whenever there's a new test that comes in, there'll be a lot of rumors being spread. Why are, the, why are you putting the swab in the vagina? Which means, is it like a sexually transmitted disease? There are a lot of stigma also associated with doing the test. And very often women are unwilling for any further examination. There was one woman in the hills who tested positive. We went to her house and we said we would do the colposcopy in her house, but she just refused. So even if the test goes to their doorstep, because of the various stigma attached to it, most women refuse to follow through with their diagnosis. What are the problems in the health system? There's difficulty in using technology for, for health education. There are problems in transport of supplies and samples. And very often, it's, there is a uh, limitation with the health, if it's a health worker driven uh, issue. And there is also access issues, like especially for places that are far away. Gynecologists for further treat management also may not always be available, and there can be errors in management as well. Danya all already showed us this uh, chart, which shows the various problems that are associated in uh, implementing a cervical cancer screening. So what are the strategies that we can do? One is health education empowering women to make their own decisions. Hopefully there will be cheaper tests that we can make in India and a, maybe a point of care test so that you get the results immediately and can, they can be treated immediately. And colposcopy and thermo, thermal ablation could be made easier. Finally, we must be relevant to our community. I'm reminded of one of our patients who was 38 years old who was diagnosed to have cervical cancer, and she was end-stage cervical cancer. And the pain was so severe, she was admitted in our ward, we did the biopsy, slotted her in for treatment, but she went back home and the next thing we heard was that she had gone and uh, drowned herself in the well. So the reality of cervical cancer is, is still there, even though screening techniques and treatment is available. So we need to be relevant to our community and make it more available for the, for the women in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anne, for t t educating us about the ground report and the challenges facing the community. The next topic is by Dr. Teresa, advances in assisted reproductive technology techniques. No, 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 close it. This one, this one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
thank you. Uh, so I am Teresa and I am from the Department of uh, Reproductive Medicine and Surgery. Let's call it RMU. So at the outset, I want to thank the Department of Gynecological Oncology and my department for giving me this opportunity to come up here and present something. Uh, so I've been thoroughly enjoying the sessions from the morning. And uh, I'm happy to see that there are so many different areas that we've been covering. And I'm here to talk about something completely different from what we've been hearing till now, that is cancer screening, vaccination, surgery. So this is something completely different. So this is about assisted reproductive technology, okay, or uh, in common man's terms, we call it IVF or in vitro fertilization. And uh, uh, basically, what I'll be covering is just a snapshot of this treatment and what we do and how it really helps us. Uh, but there are other treatments, but uh, for this uh, session, I'll be just covering the main points. Okay, I think it will be more helpful for the postgraduates just to get an idea how this is done. So before uh, I go into the topic proper, I'll just give you an overview. I'll be covering this uh, in terms of introduction, the indications for ART, the endocrinology of the ART cycles, what are the recent advances that are there in the system, and also how this treatment helps in women and men with malignancies. Since we are in this forum, I think that was something relevant I wanted to say. So before we come to ART per se, Let's talk about infertility because this starts only when infertility comes. So as we know, in infertility, the incidence has been rising. Most probably the diagnosis is increasing. More people are coming forward. The stigma is coming down. So we are seeing that at least one in six adults, which accounts to about 17.5% of the population, which is a whopping 48.5 million couples, are presently infertile worldwide. So this is according to the latest WHO survey and because of which the, uh, it, there was a call, there was a need for more, uh, you know, uh, more means, more safe and affordable treatments that should be available for couples who are wishing to have a child. So now what is the role of ART in this? Where does ART stand? ART is the highest form of treatment for infertility with over 2 million cycles being done annually worldwide. Okay, it includes all interventions that include the in vitro handling of gametes that could be sperms and oocytes or embryos for the purpose of reproduction. Now we call it IVF but ideally it is not limited only to IVF and includes in vitro insemination, ICSI, frozen embryo transfer, peri-implantation, genetic testing and embryo or gamete cryopreservation. So we'll be getting into it but just uh, superficially. Now, uh, the relevance is that the pregnancy rates with this treatment is around 30 to 40 percent per, per cycle, which is much higher than any other infertility treatment. For example, if we give an ovulation induction with oral agents or injectables, or if we do an intrauterine insemination, that is an IUI, we can only clock up to 15 to 20 percent per cycle. Now, this helps to go much higher, around 35 to 40 percent, also shortens the time to pregnancy. So, this treatment becomes a very core treatment in infertility. Indications, very simply put, you can just divide them broadly into female factors, male factors, combined and miscellaneous. Now female factors, we all know IVF was first introduced for tubal factor because it's the only treatment that will work when the tubes are compromised. Okay, other than that, severe pelvic disease in the terms of moderate to severe endometriosis. In diminished ovarian reserve and advanced maternal age, it actually helps to improve the time to pregnancy rather than actually increasing the pregnancy rates. And of course, in women with PCOS as a third line treatment, because there are effective strategies of ovulation induction, women who don't conceive on the first and second line will have to ultimately resort to IVF. Male factor, again, the treatment IVF ART has actually revolutionized the treatment for infertility in male factor. Earlier, uh, we didn't have IVF and uh, couples with severe male factor infertility were actually not having efficient treatment options because for IUI also, you actually need at least 10 million sperms. But here, even if there are just 1 million sperms, a few sperms, only sperms in the centrifuge sample, we are still able to give them a pregnancy with the help of ART. Again, even in men who are azoospermic, that is there are no sperms in the ejaculate, we can surgically harvest the sperms and help them to have a biological child. And that's only possible because of ART. 
Combined factors again unexplained and miscellaneous. Here again fertility preservation comes into play and also when you need to do a peri-implantation genetic testing for example if either or one of the parents are carriers or they have a disease and you want to find out whether the offspring has the same gene defect or not. Now just a snapshot of how the whole treatment works. You can see that uh, I have highlighted it in red. There are basically three main parts. The first part is the controlled ovarian stimulation. Okay, where we actually stimulate uh, the female partner and basically we need the follicles and from the follicles we harvest the oocytes. That is done by the oocyte pickup. The next part happens in the IVF lab where the oocytes are handed over to the embryologist. Fertilization happens and after fertilization the embryos are cultured, graded according to the morphology and finally it goes for an embryo transfer. The good quality embryos are graded on the basis of morphology mostly. And once embryo transfer happens, then we basically support the patient to help in getting the pregnancy. So let's come to the first part, that is a controlled ovarian stimulation. So in uh, controlled ovarian stimulation, basically there are two main steps, okay? That is multifollicular growth and the second part is suppression of the endogenous LH surge, okay? Now multifollicular growth, as you all know, the ovaries have follicles, we need the follicles to grow and then only we can harvest the oocytes. So this is the crux of ART. If you go wrong in this, then you're going to compromise the whole cycle. So basically you need good multifollicular growth and for that the dosing of your gonadotropins should be good. That is you need to harvest maximum number of oocytes. Earlier on we had a discussion regarding our patients where we said that uh, when the oocyte yield decreases, it compromises the success rates. So if you end up with good number of oocytes, you'll get good number of embryos, you'll have uh, a number of embryos to select and you can offer her more than one transfer in the same cycle and ultimately end up in a pregnancy. So multifollicular growth is very, very important. Gonadotrophins have to be selected properly, especially the dosing. The Second part is the suppression of the LH surge. Now essentially what we do in ART is we, uh, we help the follicles to grow but we don't want them to rupture. But physiologically what happens is when the follicles grow it releases estradiol and that causes a positive feedback on the pituitary for the LH surge. But we don't want that to happen because we need to harvest the oocytes before it actually ruptures. So that is the second part which is the suppression of the LH surge which can be done either by a GNRH agonist or by a GNRH RH antagonist and that is how we classify the cycles into agonist cycles or antagonist cycles it just depends on which agent we are using to suppress the LH surge okay now once the follicles reach a particular size we still need to trigger them because the final nuclear and cytoplasmic maturation is required before we actually harvest the oocytes so that is done by a final HCG trigger which is like a surrogate LH and as you know, once the LH surge happens 36 hours later, you actually, the follicles will rupture. So we time our oocyte pickup in a way that by 34 to 35 hours after the trigger, we will harvest the oocytes. And that is done by a simple transvaginal ultrasound probe with a needle guide. And we will access the follicles through the vaginal fornix. Usually it is a simple procedure, can be done under conscious sedation. As you can see the on the right side, that is the actual picture how we see it, the follicle uh, the needle is introduced into the follicle, all the follicular fluid is aspirated and we go sequentially from one follicle to the other. All of the follicles have to be aspirated from both ovaries. Essentially, each mature follicle should give you one oocyte, okay? After this, our part is usually over. We hand over the oocytes immediately to the embryologist. They grade the oocytes, see whether they are mature, and then the next part happens, which is the fertilization. Now, essentially, we use two different types of fertilizations. One is ICSI, where a single sperm can be injected directly into the oocyte. But this is mostly preferred in those patients where the sperm count is very, very less and we don't have enough sperm. So we just have to select one sperm and inject it into the oocyte. But if there is, if the male factor is normal, we have good number of sperms and we are doing the IVF for a female factor, then we can always do an in vitro insemination wherein a single oocyte can be incubated with about 1.5 lakh sperms and the fertilization happens almost physiologically with a single sperm fertilizing the oocyte normally. 
Now, once this happens, then we have to check whether fertilization has happened or not. This usually takes 16 to 18 hours. So as you can see on the top left corner, those are the actual pictures on day one. That is how a fertilized oocyte looks like. It's two pronuclear, two polar bodies. That is normal fertilization. Once we see that, then we go back on day three and then on day five. So on day three, the cleavage should happen. You should see eight cells. And on day five, it should be a blastocyst. These Both these embryos are graded morphologically. And basically, we see the number of blastomeres, the size of the blastomeres, the symmetry. There are various uh, factors which have to be taken into consideration. And they are graded as grade one, two, and three. Why this is important it tells is that the grade 1 embryos are believed to have the highest implantation potential. So if we have a selection of embryos, that is what we will select. Okay, And embryo transfer is a much more simpler uh, uh, process by which we just introduce the embryos into the uh, uterus and uh, deposit it around 1 centimeter below the fundus. The second, the last part is after embryo transfer, we need to support the patient for pregnancy. So that is called luteal support. As you know, the luteal phase, the main hormone that is driving the luteal phase is progesterone. So the luteal support is by mainly progesterone. There are various methods. There are various routes of administration, which includes oral, vaginal, uh, the gels, subcutaneous injections. And what we do is that we prefer at least two routes. That is to ensure that the level of progesterone is maintained in the luteal phase. Just a word about two types of ART cycles. One is where you have a sequential transfer. That is the oocyte pickup and the embryo transfer happens in the same stage. Whereas a segmented transfer, we harvest the oocytes, culture the embryos, freeze them, and at a later date, the patient can come back for a frozen embryo transfer. This becomes important because it makes the cycle much more flexible. There is an optimum transfer and there is an ease of scheduling. Very, very important in malignancies where the patient can have the first part done before chemotherapy. Once the completion of treatment is over, patient is in remission, she can come back for her pregnancy. So recent advances, not going too much into it, mainly in the stimulation techniques. This is again very, very important in malignancies. You can start the stimulation at any stage, need not be on the second or third day of the cycle. These are, it's called random start. Dual stimulation and mild stimulation, again, very helpful in malignancies, help to improve the yield of the oocytes. Mild stimulation, as was discussed earlier, decreases the exposure to estrogen. So very, very important in estrogen dependent cancers. Sperm selection, there are various other sperm selection methods. Again, this is just to improve the pregnancy rates with ART. So this is ICSI where it is just morphology. In IMSI, the magnification is increased. This is by the hyaluronic acid binding properties using surface charge or using uh, annexin binding sperm bifurcation. So all these are just methods to select the right sperm which will help in better fertilization and better quality embryos. Time-lapse technology is a newer technique where we can actually uh, have a video camera fixed onto the microscope and will, it will take a full recording of how the embryos are developing. The time of cleavage, how they are cleaving, uh, whether the uh, blastomeres are symmetrical or not, fragmentation, all this helps us to select better embryos. Time-lapse technology is, not, uh, is just coming in now, but it is theoretically very strong and looks like it will come up. This is something that uh, we must know, peri-implantation genetic testing. We all know about prenatal screening where during pregnancy we screen the patients for any genetic diseases. This is something which can happen before implantation. So before embryo transfer, we can actually biopsy the embryos. It can be done on day three or day five. But uh, there are three types wherein we, we can uh, like screen the embryos for structural rearrangement, monogenic disorders or even simple aneuploidy but it has its limitations. The first and foremost, it's an invasive procedure. You are actually biopsying the embryo, which is not uh, very, it may be having its harmful effects. So recently we have something called non-invasive PJD, which is another advance which has come, wherein we actually use the culture media in which the embryo was growing, and the culture media will have cell-free DNA, which can be assessed. So this is again coming in in a big way. I think very shortly it will be coming in and then we can be starting to use it routinely whenever, depending on the evidence, how well it comes. 
Now, finally, just one last slide on uh, the role of ART in oncology. Like we, we had discussed earlier, ART is one of the methods by which we can improve the time to pregnancy faster and better efficient treatment to get the pregnancy. So male fertility preservation, very, very easy because you can harvest the sperms easily. Just semen samples have to be cryopreserved. If you don't get a semen sample, even the sperm tissue can be cryopreserved by using a testicular aspiration. Just one more slide. Testicular aspiration or from the epidermal sperms. Female fertility has to be through ART. So what we can do is we have to consider some factors seriously before uh, counseling the patient for an ART prior, especially a patient with malignancies. Main thing is the prognosis of the malignancy. Patient should be having a good prognosis so that she can come back for a pregnancy. Also to remember that the delay will be for around two to three weeks before we can harvest the oocyte. So the, there should not be any gross harm to the patient for delaying the treatment. Willingness for ART, non-transferability because we'll be freezing the embryos and she will have to come back for ART later. Also that uh, there could be some cryo survival issues which she should be uh, okay with. So if we get good number of embryos, yes, she can get away with the pregnancy. So data just to say that we have around four to five cases of semen cryopreservation per year and over the last five years we have actually done ART for 10 of those patients and uh, out of the seven embryo transfers five have conceived which is actually a very good pregnancy rate. The remaining three are awaiting embryo transfer. Female gynecological malignancies not many but we just this year alone we had two cases of borderline ovarian tumors. We did ART and both of them have conceived and the pregnancies are ongoing. Endometrial cancer, the one that we have discussed earlier, we had one. Ovarian malignancy, we had two cases, but I think they are awaiting embryo transfer. And we also had around five to six cases of endometrial hyperplasia. Around three of them had undergone ART. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Teresa, for the interesting talk. The next talk is by Dr. Priya Bhatti, Advances in Minimally Invasive Surgery Robotic. Yes, <coughs> no.
Good evening, everyone. I'll, I'll be talking about advances in MIS, uh, and uh, specifically about robotic surgery. So a brief history of robotic surgery. 2000, the first Da Vinci surgical system was approved by the FDA. 2005, the first hysterectomy was done. And uh, from now, we have come a long way. Uh, and now, oncological surgeries are routinely being done via the robotic route. And we continue to innovate. Uh, main robotic systems are the Da Vinci surgical system, which were, uh, they were the pioneers of the uh, robo. Uh, the others are Metronic, Hugo, and Verb surgical platform. SI was one of the earlier models. XI uh, is the, actually the latest model, which has got longer instrument arms, improved range of motion, improved 3D visualization, and more ergonomic features for the surgeon. X is almost the same as XI, just a most, more cost-effective version. SP is the single port surgery version. So this is broadly the robotic system, which has got three parts, the vision card, the patient side card, and the surgeon side card. Uh, the patient side card is the one which has the robotic arms, which are docked onto the ports. So briefly, the advantages of robotic surgery over laparoscopy, which is enhanced precision, Mainly the endorist technology, which gives uh, a, a, a seven degrees of motion compared to the laparoscopic instruments. And since you're sitting and operating, the surgeon fatigue is uh, much lesser. And so uh, all this makes the learning curve a little shorter. So the main application is in complex procedures that need detailed anatomic delineation. And the conversion rates are, have been found to be slightly lesser, especially in the obese, obese patients. So standard operating protocol is same low lithotomy, lower limbs in abduction, extension, and slight external rotation at the hip joint, uh, upper limbs by the side, chest strap, shoulder braces, because you're going to give a steep trend work, almost 30 degrees. Uh, die when we are doing a sentinel lymph node procedure port placement followed by Trendlinburg and docking of the robotic arms. Now port placement, the rest of it is pretty standard, but port, port placement can vary according to the procedure planned, whether you have to operate in the pelvis or you have to do a paraiotic procedure or, or an omentectomy. The size of the uterus, patient's abdominal wall surface area and surgeon's comfort. So basically, in general, camera port should be no less than 10 centimeter and low more than 20 centimeter from the target anatomy. And a distance of at least 8 centimeter should be kept between the ports to allow for adequate movement of the robotic arms. So basically, it, it's, it's useful to be a little flexible with port placement because once you have placed the ports, uh, your, uh, the access to the quadrants is determined and you don't have much flexibility after that. So uh, as Dr. Lili said that uh, benign procedures, almost everything under the sun can be done minimally in, via the minimally invasive route. But in oncology, the route of surgery decisions have to be made, uh, keeping in mind that the long-term oncological outcomes should not be compromised for uh, gain in the, for a, a you know, reduced short-term morbidity. So cancer cervix, uh, what is the evidence? The laparoscopic radical hysterectomy was first described in 1992, 2005, the robotic one. And based on uh, a lot of retrospective data, it was widely accepted, actually, until the LACC trial came up. So now these are the trials, uh, these are the studies we have. Uh, LACC and Sukor are the trials which, are, which have found uh, results against MIS. They have found uh, worse outcomes, more recurrences, with their minimally invasive route. And there are two trials, memory and circol, which are both retrospective studies, which have found that uh, the survival rates are similar. Now, uh, in the LACC and Sukho, there were more laparoscopic cases. And in uh, the other two trials, there were more robotic cases. But having said that, LACC is the only RCT out of all these studies. And there have been multiple systematic reviews and meta-analysis but they're all retrospective, uh, all of the retrospective studies. And uh, out of these, only one study showed uh, that minimally invasive was inferior to open surgery. 
in LACC, there was a sub-analysis, and what they found is that a surgical approach only influenced the risk of recurrence for patients with a tumor larger than 2 cm. Post-op morbidity, there is no difference, and quality of life, uh, also no difference. So the reasons after all this for worse outcome in MIS have been cited as lack of radicality, surgeon expertise, and tumor dissemination at the time of colpotomy. So to prove all this, a proof of principle study was done and they found that uh, peritoneal contamination and instrument contamination occurred in 75% and 60% of the patients. And after that, uh, uh, based on this, they have, uh, they have done studies that, uh, to see whether conization helps. And, and conization does help in small tumors to prevent tumor spill. So these are broadly the factors which affect the outcome in MIS. Now, there have been two Indian studies, both retrospective. Both have found no difference, but uh, both are retrospective studies. Now, specifically uh, about robotic route, two ongoing trials are there, so they should give more clarity. So in conclusion, in the light of whatever evidence we do have, the best candidates for MRH are minimally in uh, invasive robotic radical hysterectomy, I mean, minimally invasive radical hysterectomy are small tumors, preferably post-conization, without the use of manipulator, with vaginal closure, and without compromising on the radicality of the surgery. I'm sure everybody's thinking the same thing as I am. Why not do an open surgery? But yeah. Uh, so in endometrial cancer, what, what is the evidence we have? Uh, uh, the main evidence comes from the LAB2 and LACE trials, which were prospective trials. And from there, they were laparoscopy trials, but it has been extrapolated to robotic surgery. And MIS, uh, the guidelines also say that MIS is the preferred approach in early stage endometrial cancer, including high risk cancer. Tumors with METs outside the uterus and cervix, apart from lymph node METs, are relative contraindications for minimally invasive surgery. But having said that, there have been two recent uh, retrospective studies which have found that found a higher rate of recurrence and poorer uh, recurrence-free survival and overall survival in robotic route. So we still need prospective evaluation of long-term outcomes of robotic-assisted MIS. Ovarian cancer, even more a dubious role. A thorough evaluation of all quadrants and all peritoneal surfaces is uh, very challenging. Even in open, uh, even in the open route, it takes a lot of, it takes time, it takes effort to actually uh, go through all the peritoneal surfaces and um, pick out the disease. So in MIS, it's it's quite difficult. But uh, uh, what we do uh, have in the guidelines is that MIS can be carried out for restaging uh, for tumors which have already been removed. So the risk of spill is not there for apparent early stage. Uh, and whatever the approach used, spill should be avoided. The level of evidence is still four. The other uh, other, uh, other surgeries where robotic can be useful is pelvic exenteration. Robotic groin node dissections are being uh, done now. Uh, we don't, we, we obviously, it is a robotic is a new route. So we are still gathering evidence and uh, maybe over the next decade we'll have enough evidence to uh, say, you know, how safe it is. Risk reducing surgeries like risk reducing salpingo phorectomies or hysterectomies, that is pretty safe. And for oligometastatic recurrences in ovarian cancer, it can be done. So, I have some videos. Just, <laughs> I know you're all tired. I'm sorry. <laughs> So some uh, some videos I'll just fast forward. Uh, it's not playing. Okay, <laughs> it's just not playing. So basically, I had an endometriosis video. Uh, I I don't do much of benign gynecology, but sometimes uh, those those bad endometriosis cases do land up because they look like complex adnexal masses. But robotic is uh, that is one area where it is very useful. I feel. So this is, I hope this plays. 
This is a parabiotic uh, lymph node dissection. This is a video of robotic parabiotic lymph node dissection performed. So parabiotic again. So the port placement for pelvic surgery does not work for parabiotic lymph node uh, dissection. So this is the initial port. This is the port placement I tried with knees dual docking in the sense you dock first for the pelvis, and then when you have to access the uh, parabiotic, you do dock it again. So it's one thing is it's a little cumbersome, takes longer, but small things like when you're uh, undocking, redocking, the ports become loose. And uh, what I found was that when uh, during the uh, surgery, that because the port is loose, the blood kept keeps dripping in, and the blood comes in front of the camera. And these are small things, but they, you can't operate. You have to keep come bringing the camera out and cleaning it. So I think each case you keep learning and you keep realizing uh, and figuring out what is the best way to deal with it. But once the ports are placed, you don't have much flexibility. So this is the beginning of the you know, opening the peritoneum over the common iliac vessels. And there's a bifurcation going up. That that there you can see the iso that the duodenum and. Uh, So even this uh, periodic node dissection, I found it's, it's pretty useful because for laparoscopy, uh, you have a learning curve. You're depending on dependent on assistance, so it's a little difficult. With robotic, it's a little easier. So the, ah, this is a case of endometriosis. I think that was the sentinel, which is not okay. So this is a case of endometriosis, and if you open the retroperitoneum in the beginning itself, you can visualize the ureters, and then then uh, from there it's kind of simple. So the fine movements you need for dissecting the bowel off, and uh, that's, that's much easier here with these robotic instruments compared to the, I'm sure like very experienced and talented laparoscopic surgeons can do the surgery as well in laparoscopy, but uh, surgical skill like everything else in life follows a bell-shaped curve. Again, visualize both the ureters and going along the rectum. So this we knew is an endometriosis, so not worried about rupture. Okay, okay, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I thought I'm running out of time. Okay. Two minutes, sir.
there are problems like you have to use bipolar for cauterizing all the vessels which is not so great compared to a ligature or other things because uh, but then if you're using a, uh, these we have as, as a package but if you're using any extra instrument like a vessel sealer in, in robotic vessel sealer that immediately like increases the cost by 60,000 so these kind of issues are there so So I'll, I'll just skip a bit. I'm opening the vault. Yeah. So uh, just a little bit of videos. What are the challenges and limitations? Mainly the high capital and operative costs and instrument costs, which can be overcome by uh, the number of cases uh, over time. Longer overall OR times, which are required for docking and moving the instrument, the equipment around. Main thing is we don't have level one evidence still for short term or long term oncologic outcomes, and access to more than one quadrant is challenging. So, what are the future trends? Uh, the single port approach may help in reaching various abdominal quadrants without the need for redocking. And the computer interface can greatly enhance the surgical capabilities by in introducing digital analysis, image integration, feedback controls, and surgical algorithms. So the main thing is to follow learning proper learning pathways and continued learning and improvisation as you go. And a, a, a prospective evaluation of your own cases, how they are doing, and how case selection is very important just because it's easier to do robotic surgery you should not select cases which are actually not meant for a minimally invasive approach based on the evidence especially in oncology because the long-term outcomes always take precedence over short-term morbidity and patient counseling very important thank you <laughs> thank you dr priya the next topic is by dr preeti Advances in fetal therapy. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for staying back till the last few sessions. Before I start, um, I remember a patient who came to us for a, a anomaly scan, and there was a renal pelvic dilatation in the baby. As usual, we counsel saying we will do a scan at a later part of the pregnancy, serial follow-up. And once the baby is born, we will see a scan, and then if needed, intervention and all that. So the question the patient's husband asked me was, "Your." unit is fetal medicine and what medicine are you giving for the baby with that thought we'll start with the advances in fetal therapy so a fetal therapy is indicated when there is a condition that causes significant risk to the fetus and you have an intervention that will improve the outcome significantly and that is the only indication where you can offer a fetal therapy and this includes both medical and surgical options What's the goal of doing a fetal therapy? One is to correct the problem, which is a prenatal correction of the condition. But this may not be possible in all situations. At least we, may, we can do an intervention that will alleviate the damage before the baby is born. Or this can optimize the condition at the time of birth so that the outcome is better. But remember, whatever treatment we give to the fetus is going to affect not just the baby, but also the mother. So the key issues from morning, you've been listening about this uh, emphasis on the patient care. This is very, very important. In fetal intervention, it is not a one-way traffic. It is very important to know it is a shared and supportive decision making. As a physician, it is our role to be able to define the problem to the patient and outline what are the options that are there, what is the risk due the, to, because of the condition, and what are the consequences of the problem, and what options do they have in pregnancy and along with the mother make a final decision. So today's talk, I'll be coming, uh, giving you a few 
conditions where fetal therapy options are possible. So we will look at the problem and what are the problems if that condition continues and what are the options of therapy and what are its risks. So fetal therapy, before we start, this is something which has been there forever. This is not an advancement, but this is treatment of intrauterine transfusion for a RH isoimmunization has been a well-known thing. So most often it is the anti-D, but it's not always just anti-D, but can be other antibodies as well. We all know of the critical titer. Once the critical titer is reached in the ICT, we do the monitoring by peak systolic velocity flow in the MCA Dopplers of the baby. So this is the gold standard for monitoring. We do an MCA PSV and we plot it in this graph, which is the Maris curve. The lower line is normal. The A line says there is some mild anemia. When we go above, it is the severe, moderate to severe anemia. So if we leave the baby like this with anemia, what is the consequence? It puts a strain on the baby's heart, baby's systolic function worsens, and the end point is high drops. As we know, there is high drops, and after that, if there is no intervention, the baby is going to die. So there is a problem which is very significant, and what intervention can we do? We can give an intrauterine transfusion. So again, this is done under sedation, paralyzing the baby with medication, and a fresh intrauterine transfusion of an O negative blood is given. And how can we do it? Under ultrasound guidance, as you can see, the first option, it is the, through the cord from the anterior placental attachment. The second picture is the through the intra if hepatic part of the umbilical vein, or sometimes we may have to give it into the peritoneum of the baby. So live birth after an intrauterine transfusion is around 96%. It's not without risk. Any intervention is not without risk. This can have a cord hematoma, uh, exsanguination, tachycardia or bradycardia in the baby. It can lead to preterm birth, PPROM, and occasionally fetal demise and intrauterine infections. So what is, the few, what is the advancement that has happened in the years? Can we prevent this from happening in a mother who is RH isoimmunized? Yes, we can, but not prevent it completely, but we can delay the onset of hemolysis by giving an IVIG. Uh, this is given in a dose of one gram to the mother K per kg of the maternal weight from 12 weeks onwards. This is a study that came up, which was to call the Petit study, <coughs> where we postponed the early intrauterine transfusion with IVIG. So when uh, previously a woman who had a uh, hemolytic uh, disease in the newborn, whatever period of time the pregnancy co complication happened with an IVIG, the study showed with IVIG the postponement of the occurrence of anemia could be achieved. And uh, moving on to the next one. So this is a picture of a baby with a huge bladder and we can see the keyhole sign at the bladder end which is the diagnosis as a luto. Lower urinary tract obstruction, this is the problem. So if left alone, what happens? The back pressure changes in the kidney that causes damage to the kidney, resulting in kidney failure. And also there is no urine coming out of the baby, which means there's no liquor around the baby and its complications. So this is the problem. And if the babies are allowed to continue like that, the babies, 95% of them die after birth because of pulmonary hyperplasia. If they survive, the problem is the kidney's problem where the kidney is completely damaged and they end up resulting having an end-stage renal disease. But when we say LUTO, it is not just PUV, as we would think. PUV is one of the most common causes in male babies, but in females it is urethral atresia, which has a very poor prognosis. So what can we do? We saw that no liquor around the baby causes all the problem. Can we solve it? Yes, that is what we do for the vesicoamniotic shunt. There is urine in the bladder which is not coming out. We do a shunt to put a, a between the bladder and the other end of the shunt is outside the skin of the baby, making the urine from the bladder come out. This is a shunt we can put in. And this is a process where the needle is ins inside the bladder and the shunt is being placed. So with this, the lyca comes out of the baby. But remember, this is not a treatment. So we are just bringing the urine out, but the obstruction is not relieved. So in that case, we need to remember the pathology is still persistent, which means after the baby is born, that needs to be addressed. So can we do anything better than that? And that comes the fetoscopic valve ablation. Instead of doing it after the baby is born, this method does the try to prevent further renal damage and reverse um, oligohydramnios and result in a normal bladder and lung development. 
who is eligible to go through that it is for people who have stage 2 luto which means there is oligohydramnios and there is a renal problem bilateral hydronephrosis has started but kidneys are not completely destroyed so this is a procedure where the fetoscope is inserted into the baby's bladder the urethral is vis visualized we can see a valve that is closing the urethra and the laser is abl ablation is done to open out the obstruction so moving on to the next one <clears throat> as we can see there is a heart in the middle and by both sides there is fluid in the lungs around the lungs which is the pleural effusion the other picture is a large massive pleural effusion on the one side of the lung if left alone what can happen it can compress the baby's uh, ivcs and can result in fetal high drops pleural effusion need not be treated immediately but if it causes high drops or is at very large that can cause high drops that is when the intervention is indicated similar to the bladder shunting we can do a pleura amniotic shunting where we can release the fluid from inside the pleura into the amniotic cavity this will reduce the pressure in the compression of the heart and that can resolve the high drops. So the, again, this is the shunt that is there in the baby's pleura and connected to the skin. Same shunt that is used for the bladder will be used here as well. So moving on to the other topic, which is the monochorionic twins. Twins is not just double joy and double fun. It is also double trouble and more so if it's a monochorionic twin because they have the issues of anastomosis the and, uh, AV anastomosis, AA and the other uh, anastomosis. We all know of this TTTS, TAPS and SFGR and all those. And that is the reason why we have to scan them every two weeks uh, till from 16 weeks onwards. So this is a picture where one of the twin has got lots of liquor and the other one is stuck and is almost stuck to the placenta, which is, is a case of TTTS. We all know the quintro staging. So for the stage one, not much of treatment is required, but those between stages two to four need definitive treatment. What can we do? There is anastomosis between the two babies. So you do a laser ablation to disconnect between the two. So <clears throat> laser ablation of the anastomosis is a treatment of choice. How do we do it? We find the cord insertion of both the twins, find the equator between them, that's the vascular equator, and ablate along the equator. This is called the Solomon's technique. By doing this, we expect the imbalance between the two babies would be sorted out. So this is the fetoscopic image where there's a large vessel that is going here. You can see the laser light here, which goes along the um, vessel, completing ablating the vessel. And this is a Solomon's technique where the whole line is ablated. Risks as above, it's a fetal loss and all that. So this is a case of uh, trap where the there is an amorphic mass of the baby and you can see there is a other twin who is pumping the blood and that's the high causing the high drops again what do we do we'll need to coagulate the using a laser or radio frequency or a bipolar cord coagulation as well okay so more of higher higher order pregnancy you can see there are multiple fetuses here and this has been worsened over the years due to fertility treatment and that is why it is advocated to have a single embryo transfer. And if you do a scan for a twins or a multiple pregnancy, remember the most important finding to look out for in a report is chorionicity. And higher order pregnancies are at higher risk of miscarriage, stillbirth, preterm birth and all that. And remember these patients can be offered multifetal reduction and very important to be uh, giving a counseling which is non-directive and always respect the patient's decision of whether to continue as triplets or to reduce the pregnancy to twins. And how do we do it? In dichorionic it is simple because they have separate blood supply. We can inject KCL. If it's a monochorionic pair, use other techniques like the bipolar laser and radio frequency ablation. So what we see here is multiple cysts within the lungs. You can see this is the CPAM. And when there is a CPAM with high drops, that is when the intervention is required. If it's a large cyst causing a problem, we can put in a shunt like the effusion. But if it's a microcystic CPAM with lots of solid areas, the treatment option is to give steroids, just the same beta methasone that we would give. And the second line therapy would be doing an open resection or even an exit procedure. So this is the image of a baby where a open surgery is being done to remove the mass 
and this lower down picture is an exit procedure that is being done at the time of cesarean exit to resection if it's a bronchopulmonary sequestration which has a blood supply from the iota this can be stopped by using a laser ablation so this one we all know is a neural tube defect with a lemon sign and banana sign that is there what can we do for an open spina bifida because all the problems of open spina bifida is because of the hindbrain herniation that causes the effect of on hydrocephalus and also the lower limb paralysis that comes with it the bowel and bladder for this function that comes even after surgery can we prevent all this from happening if we do a surgery earlier in life and that is what is the option for neural tube open neural tube defects this is an open surgery in the mother opening the uterus bringing the baby uh, turning the baby's uh, back to operate on the baby closure is being done and this was the trial that was published few years ago which said once the baby has a surgery in the prenatal period the need for doing a vp shunt after birth had come down and this there is even a reversal of the hydrocephalus and the herniation that could be noted in the antenatal period this does not impact the bladder function but there is some possible improvement is allowed and even nowadays it's not an open surgery for neural tube defect the people are uh, uh, doing a laparotomy followed using an fetoscopy or even a direct fetoscopic surgery for closure of a neural tube defect um, this is a patient with a cdh as you can see there is heart and stomach in one view you know it is not normal that is cdh what can be done we can put in a scope in the through the baby's mouth and inflate a balloon within the trachea what does it do it keeps the fluid of the lungs inside makes the lungs grow better and at the time of birth this balloon needs to be taken out or ideally before the planned delivery and that can help with the lung development so these are few of the things that we need to that have fetal intervention that is a thyroid in a baby you can inject thyroxine into the amniotic fluid this is a baby with a neck mass which can cause airway obstruction what can we do we can secure an airway before the baby is born how do we do it we can do an exit procedure which means even if the baby even before the baby is born half of the delivery is done where the baby is still connected to the placenta the circulation is maintained and the baby is intubated for airway is secured and this can end up with resection and whatever the condition of the baby is so what's the future of fetal therapy and this is what it is there has been studies which are going on for gene therapy in the baby and this is uh, especially for hematopoietic stem cell transplant and gene therapy for lethal conditions and this is more promising because the baby needs a very little dose their immune system has not formed so there is very it can be immune evasive and you have an accessible target cell thank you for the patient listening thank you dr preeti coming to the last topic for the cme facing the challenge current concepts in pph management by dr liji david Good evening, everybody. Uh, I, I, I find myself privileged to be standing here on this special day of ma'am. And at the outset, I would like to, uh, I would really like to thank ma'am and tell her, ma'am, uh, your compassionate care was not just to the patients, but you had compassionate care to your postgraduates, under uh, junior doctors, junior consultants, and I think that has impacted many of us. Thank you, ma'am. Um, my talk today is on facing the challenge, current concepts in PPH management. Uh, 
Um, I'm sure everybody here will agree with me if I say uh, unexpected PPH managed well is like an escape from the crocodile's mouth. So even after, despite lot of uh, guidelines which are in place, PPH is still the leading cause of maternal mortality and it is on a rise, especially in the low middle income countries. Why is it so? And what are the challenges that we have to overcome? One is a lack of awareness of the multiple guidelines and recommendations that are there. Now let's say we are aware of them, then the problem comes in unification of this enormous information. And let's say we are cognizant about all the information, then the problem comes in the lack of resources for early identification and for adopting the multiple strategies of management. So then what is new? How do we integrate this information? We all know that any new information by itself is not useful until and unless it's integrated into the tried old knowledge. So I'll be just briefly mentioning about the old, uh, about what we already know about PPH and, and putting in the newer concepts. So starting with the definition, the conventional definition we are all aware of, blood loss more than 500 ml in normal delivery and more than 1000 ml in a cesarean section within 24 hours of delivery. But the problem with this definition is that it does not focus on the clinical signs and symptoms, which is very important for our early diagnosis. So um, ACOG's current, di current definition states that it's a blood loss more than 1000 ml or a blood loss which is accompanied by signs and symptoms of hypovolemia within 24 hours of delivery regardless of the mode of delivery. Prevention is always better than cure. And to prevent PPH, early identification of the blood loss is very important. Not only identification, early stopping or early management of the blood loss till before we reach to coagulopathy. So how can we identify few of the methods that we knew, uh, know are the visual estimate, gravimetric measurements, direct blood collection. However, the problem with these methods are that there is a high potential of underestimation and not just that, the clinical, co the correlation of the actual blood loss, it, 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 it really does not correlate well, especially when there is substantial amount of bleeding. So that's the requirement of other parameters, other, other methods to uh, evaluate the clinical parameters, one of which is a obstetric early warning sign score. Another is a shock index. And shock, as we are all aware of, is reduction of tissue perfusion, which then leads to lactic acidosis, uh, disorientation, you know, unresponsiveness, etc. And the key to um, and early identification of this hemodynamic unstab instability is the key to the prevention of this. However, the drawbacks that we face in pregnancy, which prevent the early diagnosis, is the physiological compensatory mechanism. That is the increase in the blood volume, which masks the early changes in the vitals till there is a substantial blood loss, like around more than 1000 ml. And when the substantial blood loss occurs, that is more than 1000 ml, that means PPH is already set in. And we have no window for prevention of PPH. So now what do we do when our, when our traditional methods have abandoned us? So then a simple combination of a conventional blood pressure and a, a pulse rate and blood pressure has proven to be an accurate indicator for identifying hypovolemia early. And that is the shock index. Shock index which is heart rate, which is a ratio of heart rate over systolic blood pressure. And this has been uh, found to be a very simple but clinically efficient vital sign. It is a better predict, it has a better predictive capability. It can identify blood loss early and is a reliable indicator for adverse maternal outcomes and inversely related to the left ventricular stroke volume. Uh, uh, a value of more than or equal to 0 0.9 is considered to be associated with maternal morbidity and mortality. So few drugs, now let's say we identified it earlier, so the drugs that can be used for prevention, the conventional drugs I'm sure you all know. The newer drugs that has been added into the list is carbitocin, which is given as a single shot uh, of, thousand, of 100 micrograms IM or IV over a minute, has been uh, accepted by many guidelines. 
uh, and the other is a tranexamic acid. Now let's say prevention does not work and we reach treatment. Treating PPH has to be specific to the cause of PPH and we are all aware of the causes, the four T's, um, the tone trauma, thrombin tissue, and tissue is retained placenta and I mean even the placenta accreta spectrum also gets included into the tissue. And what is the aim that we have when we are managing PPH? It is to stop the bleeding before we reach coagulopathy. So that means the conservative approaches have to be started, has to be tried first and we have to rapidly proceed to the invasive methods if there is no response. So how to manage atonic PPH? Medical management is what the what we start with and the conventional medical management we are all aware of again and I'm not going to talk about it. The Again, the additions, addition that we have is uh, uh, tranexamic acid which is one gram, which can be given one gram IV over 10 minutes in the first three hours of birth and repeated after 30 minutes if there, if there is still bleeding persisting or it can be repeated within 24 hours. And again, the next drug is carbitocin if it is not used for prevention. Few guidelines even suggest recombinant factor 7 for massive PPH. Now let's say it is in a, in a place where the resources are lacking. We don't have these drugs, no skilled attendants. So then there has to be some temporary measure such that we can transfer the patient to a, um, to a tertiary setup and the few uh, um, few methods that we have is a bimanual, we can use tranexamic acid or we can do a bimanual uterine compression, external aortic um, compression or non-pneumatic anti-shock garments. And if all this fails, we proceed to the conservative methods like massage, ut uh, uterine balloon tamponades, pelvic vascular embolizations, and further next step being the surgical, which is compression su uterine compression sutures, pelvic vascular ligations, and nothing helps hysterectomy. Management of trauma and thrombin, again, I'm not going to talk much about it. We know the management, it's to identify and repair if it's a trauma. Thrombin is mostly blood and blood products. Coming to tissue, I'm going to talk retained placenta, we know how to manage. I'm going to talk a little bit over about the placenta accreta spectrum, not about the management. Management is, is a topic in itself and um, I can't be covering that. What I will be talking about is a little bit about approaches to decrease the bleeding, the blood loss. And few of the recommendations, few of the recommended techniques are uh, bilateral internal iliac artery ligation, definitely the anterior branch. Um, intra-arterial balloon catheters, which, which are placed pre-op, inflated and used to occlude the common iliac artery or the aorta post-op, uh, intra-op after the baby is delivered or arterial embolizations. However, this is not the end. As obstetricians, we face lot of ongoing challenges when we manage PPH. One of it being its unexpected occurrence. Next, its urgency of situation. And we all know that all the techniques that I mentioned earlier requires either a specialized equipment or a professional expertise. And let's say we encounter PPH in an untimely hour of the uh, day and we will have none of these to come for our rescue, even in a tertiary setup. The other problems that, other challenge that we face is in the low middle income countries where there is less resources. That means these, uh, these uh, um, equipments, these expensive resources are not available or we don't have skilled birth attendants. So then what do we do? That is where the window of innovations open. So again, our aim is to stop the bleeding before we reach coagulopathy. So that means we need to find out certain measures, certain temporary measures such that we can stop the bleeding by some time for the action of the various medical and surgical methods. And few of these methods which have been innovated are the novel Pile, Pile's aortic clamp and the novel transvaginal uterine artery clamp by Dr. Pile, of course, and the SR cannula by Dr. Samartha Ram. So talking about the, Pile, the novel Pile's aortic clamp, this is a clamp which is used to clamp the aorta just above its bifurcation, the lower part of the aorta above its bifurcation. The, it works by the principle of the same, same principle as the external aortic compression or the aortic balloon occlusion where the, where the blood supply to the lower, lower part of the body or the 
genital organs are reduced or obstructed in other words. Uh, so it contains, it, it consists of a blade, blades, uh, two blades with uh, smooth inner surfaces and blunt tips. Thus saying that the blade is quite, atro the, the instrument is very atraumatic. The blunt tips overlap each other which prevents the slippage and even at full closure there is a gap of 2 millimeter and it has a long ratchet. So these two regulate the compression of the uh, instrument on the iota. How do we apply, uh, apply it? The uterus is exteriorized after the delivery of the baby. Bowels are pushed laterally. The lower end of the iota just above the bifurcation is identified. Um, it's gently lifted up by using the Babcock forceps and the uh, iota is approached with an open aortic clamp till we reach the spines. The Once you feel the spines, the iota is clamped such that the entire wall of the iota is within the blades. Once it is clamped, we should make sure that the pulsations of the common iliac artery is, is stopped. So we should be feeling for the pulsations. The advantage of this is that it does not require any peritoneal dissection or the skeletonization of the vessels since it is a blunt uh, clamp and the application and can be applied for around 45 to 50 minutes. This is just to show that the, the clamp is uh, uh, applied at an infrarenal, the relationship between the iota and the uh, kidneys and to say that it is an infrarenal application and it does not cause any harm to the vital organs of the body. The anticipated complications that one would have is uh, a vaginal injury or aortic wall rupture, uh, lower limb thromboembolic phenomenon, reperfusion injury or a abdominal, abdominal pelvic organ ischemic injury. However, literature has shown that for these injuries to occur, the occlusion of a vessel should be at least should be at least more than one and a half to two hours, and we are only occluding it for 45 to 50 minutes. So, unlikely for any of these complications to occur. And 150 odd patients on which Dr. Piley has applied this clamp on in his uh, papers, he has mentioned that he has noted none of these above mentioned complications in his immediate and long term follow up. Even few patients on whom he had done an MRI iotogram has also shown no pseudo aneurysms at six weeks. So these are the few papers, a few journals in which his papers, his work is published in where he has mentioned the above findings and that he is planning to consider it to be, uh, considered to incorporate it into the PAS bundle. The advantage of this is that it decreases the massive transfusion and it decreases the requirement of blood and blood products and helps us to achieve the goal of stopping the bleeding, incorporating our medical and surgical methods of PPH management and thus not proceeding to coagulopathy. In other words, conservative approaches become more successful and invasive procedures are not required. Uh, we in our hospital, in our uh, department also used, also have used this uh, aortic clamp for one of our patients with placenta accreta. We applied it after the delivery of the baby and then proceeded with hysterectomy. The best part was that the blood loss uh, in this patient was so minimal that we did not require any transfusion at all. Um, so I suppose it's, it's really advantageous. I have a short video again from Dr. Piley's uh, application which I can show at the end of my presentation. Um, the other, other methods are the transvaginal uterine artery clamp. Um, which as the name suggests is, uh, is a clamp applied on the uterine artery vaginally for vaginal deliveries. Here the vagina is, here the cervix is pulled down by the uh, sponge holders and we reach to the angles of the cervix at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock position. Apply the clamp as high as possible with one blade inside the cervix and the other blade in the vaginal, uh, in the lateral phonics, keeping it for 10 to 15 minutes. Again, this is giving us a time period where the where we have a bloodless field where we can sort out the trauma or the uterotonics can improve the tone of the uterus. Um, principle as we just said is, is to hold the uterine arteries at the level of the isthmus and the, the shape of the clamp enables it to. Again, the gap of it, while it closes, there is a gap of 6 millimeters which does not so so one of the worry that we will have is when we blindly hold vagina uh, hold the uterine artery uh, vaginally will be uh, will be injure the ureters 
but then this gap does not injure the ureters it just blocks the ureters and it is being kept only for a short period of time so it it does not uh, harm the ureters the last thing is the srpph cannula which is a metal cannula with uh, angulations and multiple perforations in the uterine as well as in the cervical end not in the vaginal end of course and uh, the perforations are around 4 to 8 millimeters in size so therefore the blood clots don't go and uh, obstruct these uh, perforations it works by the principle of negative pressure so when the pressure is increased the soft tissues of the cervix get sucked into the perforations and the negative pressure is created inside the uterine cavity and by and it basically assists the natural physiological process of contraction and retraction of the uterus thus helping in decreasing the bleeding application of it is again similarly hold the cervix the uterine end of the cannula is placed all the way up to the fundus vaginal length is connected to the suction apparatus through through a tubing through a non collapsible tubing the left arm is used to support the fundus right fingers grasp the can cannula and supports the cannula and a negative pressure is created this is kept for around 10 minutes and it can be repeated if it is required every hour for 3 hours generally that is not required and once we need to uh, and once uh, once the bleeding has settled we can remove while removing the cannula one has to be very gentle because it can cause some temporary adhesions into the pores because of the negative pressure again this has been used uh, in multiple patients in the obstetric department of achitur campus and uh, they have had successful outcomes in all their patients such that uh, their referral referrals for uh, massive pph to our uh, our uh, labor room has dramatically come down um, the advantages as i said it's a simple uh, procedure it's, it's a simple procedure it, uh, it avoids catastrophic bleeding and decreases the necessities of complex procedures so finally the take home message uh, what i would say is the same less, same things what i have said earlier that we need to identify pph earlier and prevent the pph we need to stop the bleeding before coagulopathy is reached and we have to empower our obstetricians and the skilled birth atten uh, attendants to be self-sufficient to encounter the unexpected catastrophic bleeding. So I end with this note that every challenge con contains within it seeds of opportunity and growth, be that growth. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Dr. Lich. If I can have one minute, I can show the video by uh, Dr. Piley in which how he has applied the clamp. Next one. The Cochlear Cartridge, the Iota Cartridge, which we call Iota. How do you use this deliver outside? As you can see, uh, the Cochlear Cartridge over there, keep the bubbles packed off. What, what is important is that we back up the small bubbles towards the right, right side and the single towards the left, the left side, and, and that will help us to see the bifurcation over here. You can see this iota. Hold it up, up and, and pull it up with the back cock. No, no dissection, no separation of the pivotal limb or anything. Hold up the, the full thickness of the iota with the back cock, as you saw now, and, and then bring the open common area country or iota clamp in the open position. Go push, push it on, on to the vertebral column, column in the open position, just, just go over above the babcock and, and then clamp, clamp it. You can, you can clamp it all the way and, and then remove that. that. And immediately palpate if the cochlear cartridge pulsation is over. If the pulsation is over, that, that means that uh, we have opened the blood supply to the pelvis and the lower limbs, and, and then you can proceed with the rest of the surgery. So, so this is what we would suggest to you uh, in, in these cases to apply the clamp before you dissect the bladder. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, ma'am, and Vinota, ma'am for giving me this opportunity to be a chairperson along with Dr. Abraham, sir. And a small note of thanks to uh, Rachel, ma'am, 
uh, Rachel Ma'am was my consultant when I was a registrar, and uh, uh, during that time I had a very difficult time, and uh, I always carried that guilt of uh, not being so good, and uh, I thought I could have done better, and I always carried that guilt. But uh, the later encounter with Ma'am, I she made me forget what all has happened. She always greets cheerfully, and she will inquire about me and my family, and uh, I really appreciate it, Ma'am. And I, I appreciate it, and I thank you for your love, kindness, and your forget, forgetfulness of the mistakes. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, sir and Annie, for chairing the last session. And we want to take this opportunity. I mean, the vote of thanks officially will be given by Vinodha, but I have just two announcements to make. Uh, if you remember, uh, starting of this session, I allowed a working tea. So there are a lot of tea cups inside the hall. I'll get a firing note from the prince, the curriculum office on Monday. So I request to please, as you leave, uh, just leave your cups outside in the dustbin. Uh, second, there is a small informal dinner organized at Big Bungalow, and we request, uh, as many of you, I know it's a long, tiring day, but just to come for a small time of fellowship. Uh, please let us know if uh, you don't know how to travel or you need transport. But I think most of us can make it. I haven't arranged any formal transport, but anybody needs, kindly let us know. And it will start at uh, 7.15. So take some rest, freshen up, and we'll meet up there. Hand it over to Vinoda. Uh, we have a small uh, token of appreciation from all of us here, uh, which we want to pass on to ma'am. Ma'am, two minutes. <laughs> I'll precisely take two minutes for that, provided the people from the back come faster. Roja, can you please? So this uh, gift is from all of us here, ma'am, from the entire obstetrics and gynae department and the um, department of gynae onco together. She is being ably assisted by her team of surgeons and they are doing best what we do in theatres, ripping apart, like Santosh was saying. Huh? And so there is a collage. We have all written a, a note on ma'am, with ma'am we have had some pictures. So this is a keepsake for you ma'am. And uh, the next small token of our appreciation is something Hopefully, you would appreciate and love. I'd like you to have a peep at it and see if you like it. Uh, the, uh, we'd like to thank Dr. Anita who thought of this and time the survivor meet and the CME around this time and allowed us to carry it through, give shape to it. And through the all the whirlwind of activities which surrounded arranging this, I'd like to thank uh, Mrs. Roja, Mr. Jamal, Mrs. Juliana, Mrs. Linda, and all the other office staff who uh, kept listening to our whims and fancies. We thank Mrs. Violet, who supplied us with endless cups of coffee and kept motivating us to go through and through. We thank Mrs. Kumari, who in, accepted our invitation and came along. We thank the project staff who helped us. We thank Dr. George Shandy, who timed his visit to Velour with the survivor meet and joined us with all the other planning. We thank Gina for supplying all the pictures. Under, uh, though ma'am kept asking why the albums went missing, and we thank you all for staying till the very end. Thank you so much. 
thank you to Vinoda and her team for excellently putting this session together. Keeping time, though we all had so much to say, we bundaks into your sessions, but thanks for adjusting. Bye.